Hey guys, welcome back. So now we are getting into the Immortal Hulk Big Spill. Toward this time, we revisit our talks on the Immortal Hulk, which had started back in like March of 2018, and has taken us through so many different talks and discussions ever since. So let's get into it. But first, if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to catch the spills every week. And don't forget to hit that bell up top so we can squat up in the comments for the first hour. Alright, so initially starting this off, we're going to go all the way back to March of 2018, when at the time we talked about the February issue of Avengers No Surrender, which is where the Immortal Hulk had technically first appeared within Avengers issue 682. Because at this time, Al Ewing had co-written and begun this narrative introducing the Immortal Hulk, which from here began this whole story that picks up from the events of Civil War 2 and Secret Empire. And with diving in, first we'll go back to Avengers No Surrender, and then after we get into the Immortal Hulk series, after we reach about issue 36 or so, then we'll get into our talks about issue 0. And mainly because if I start talking about issue 0, it's just not gonna make sense. But with that said, let's take a trip back in time, and from here, I'm gonna hand it off to the three year younger version of me. What's happening guys? So let's talk about the Immortal Hulk which is the return of the OG Bruce Banner Hulk. So Cho and Weapon H need to watch out before this dude roll out asking for a group hug. And you know what's crazy? I was just thinking the other day when we were talking about Weapon H and we was going back and forth in the comments section just talking about how he would stack up to the original Bruce Banner Hulk. And going into that Weapon H series, I feel like an argument could be made for him to contest Hulk, mainly going off the basis of Banner Hulk versus Wolverine. But then when I go into No Surrender and read about how this Hulk came back this time, I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Because it's one thing, like just talking about Banner Hulk, it's one thing to be talking about the Incredible Hulk and talking about the Immortal Hulk. Because your Immortal Hulk takes a combination of the continuity and gives us something much worse than a monster. And I'll make more sense of that in just a little bit. But mainly one of the things that No Surrender is doing in Marvel Legacy is giving us the latest resurrection of the Hulk, which will later springboard into his own solo series. And I can't wait to tell you guys my thoughts on that. But to make sense of the Hulk's return, this really stems from a contest between the Grand Master and a fellow elder of the universe named the Challenger. And the Grand Master, most of you guys are already familiar with because he holds the contest of champions and then, you know, Thor Ragnarok came out, which was kind of the Grand Master. But the Challenger, this guy's new. And what's crazy is he was originally the Grand Master. And this is a retcon to the original history. But I like it, because when most retcons are done right, they will build a new narrative off of existing history. And a lot of what history is, depending on who you're getting the story from, is usually a tale that's being told by the winner. Because when no one has access to where you're from, or the beginning of the universe in this case, all they would really have to go off of is what you tell them. And in this instance, we find out that the Grand Master was doing exactly that. And the best way to really explain the functions of the different elders, because they live for so long, each one will gravitate towards a certain thing kind of to occupy their time. And that's how you would have the collector, the runner, the promoter, like they would do exactly what their name would say. And aside from their title, most would have their actual name as well. And these two would often compete in really any type of challenge that they can put their hands to. But when the time began where many of these guys were taking on titles that they would be known for throughout the universe, and possibly to the end of time, these two were kind of like your last two. And it was a problem because they did the same thing. And so when one of them came up with the name The Grand Master, the other one, Endui, he was like, nah, I want that name. And he banished the original Grand Master outside of time and existence. And he's been there ever since, in endless darkness, alone waiting for the universe which was young at the time to die and eventually it did and so when we had the incursion event and secret wars took place and reed richards fixed everything because the universe had ended he was able to find a way back and hunt down Endui, who we know as the grand master and as you would guess he wasn't too happy but from this point forward he would be known as the challenger but instead of just coming back and killing the grand master he placed a wager to compete with him more or less for the price of the Grandmaster's head. So like if he loses, he'll twist his head off. If he cheats, he'll twist his head off. And if he wins, either at that point he's earned the name Grandmaster or he'll challenge him again and keep challenging him until he wins so he can twist his head off. 
But during the time that the challenger's been gone, he's been setting some plans in place because he knew when he met the Grandmaster again, they were gonna compete, and much like before, the stakes would get higher and higher. So instead of last time where the loser would get erased from existence, this time, the wager's for death. And the way this contest would go, each one would have their choice of contenders who would collect and retrieve these pyramids, and best three out of five would win. And to undergo this contest, which is placed on Earth, for one, the Earth was moved from where it was originally at in our solar system, and this was done with a very similar style to the incursion that I mentioned earlier, but when the Grand Master and the Challenger did this, it was with the purpose of using the Earth as a playground for their contenders. And all of Earth's Mightiest Heroes who were on Earth at that time, they would be used as obstacles that the contenders had to go through to retrieve the pyramids. And this is where we start to see how the Challenger has set his preparation. Because the Challenger intentionally chose a team of six, being the Black Order, to go against the Grand Master's team, the Lethal Legion, which is a team of seven. And I'm not gonna front, when I first seen the Lethal Legion, I was like, uh, okay, what are these guys gonna do? But when both of them just appeared in front of each other, like Hunger Games style, and instantly went for each other's throats, I was like, okay, a few of these guys is a real problem. Especially with Maul or Maulin, not really sure how to pronounce his name, but when he took Thor's hammer and started beating everybody else up with it, I was like, oh, come on, man, that's just disrespectful. <laughs> and you can tell, as soon as Thor let go of it, she knew it was a bad decision. Like in a broader scope, if she knew this was all a game, she'd be like, hey man, let me get a redo. <laughs> like run that back. <laughs> but like I said, the point of the game is to capture the most pyramids. And each one has like an elemental power that'll use to either protect itself or cause whatever catastrophe according to that power through the course of the game. In the way that the game is set up, when a member of either team grabs this pyramid, they're transferred back to the Grandmaster's game room and trapped in an ISO crystal. And so at this point, like I said, it's best out of five, and the challenger is up two because Black Dwarf had retrieved one and the Human Torch had grabbed the other. And the way the game goes, if an obstacle grabs one of the pyramids, that counts against you. And that's what put the challenger up too. But now at this point, going up against the Grand Master, the challenger is now too short. <laughs> too short. What's my favorite word? Okay, don't say that out loud. <laughs> but what I mean by him being too short is he started out six against seven, and now with one man off the board, he's five against seven. And with the Grandmaster feeling like he has the advantage here, the challenger tells him, oh no, no, this is where I pull my ace in the hole. Because he intentionally went one man short, so he can call on his seventh contender, who has been buried under some rubble in Arizona ever since Secret Empire. And the reason that Banner didn't stay alive too long in that story arc is only because Artem Zola's solution to resurrect him was only temporary. So after a short run, when it wore off, he was dead again indefinitely. And so when the challenger who had did his research came to the mound and made his bargain with the Hulk, he didn't only choose him because he would be the most powerful player on the board, but he also made a selection with understanding of the Hulk's rage. And for the challenger, he felt like he could relate to the Hulk because of his relationship with the Grandmaster. And because of this, the way that the challenger sees it, the Hulk was betrayed just like he was, in the exact same way that the Grandmaster made a decision to put him away, to erase him from existence to decide for him that he would no longer be a part of reality, figuratively speaking. And to the challenger, Bruce Banner was the Grandmaster. And when Bruce made that deal with Hawkeye in Civil War II, for him to take him down if he looked like he was gonna Hulk out, that was no different than the Grandmaster denying the challenger of his name and his existence. And that's what made his choice of the Hulk not only strategic, but personal. But when the challenger calls in the Hulk, things get a little dicey because now there's a wild card. Because when the Earth got displaced at the beginning of Avengers No Surrender, remember, it was very similar to the incursion. And because this was a similar anomaly, it appears to have similar effects. Just like how the challenger had returned, we also got the return of Voyager, who as it turns out, she appears to be one of the original members of the Avengers. And as it appears, she was disintegrated and erased from time in some memory. And a few of them did remember her. I wanna say like Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch. There were a few that still remembered who she was. But with this new incursion that displaced the Earth, she was able to find her way back and reunite with the Avengers. And I know a few of you guys may have mixed feelings about characters being introduced like this, with modifying the past, changing memories, much like with the Challenger, here with Voyager, and even like we've gotten in the past with the Sentry. But I'm going to be as bold as to say it now. Like, do not be surprised if Avengers 4 does not have time travel. 
and we find out Infinity War wasn't the first catastrophic event that changed the universe, hence the destruction of Titan, but I'm gonna say that for another video. <laughs> but my point being, this isn't the first time that Marvel's brought in characters who have supposedly been around and then this huge event comes along that makes us realize that we've been in an alternate reality this whole time. And I actually did that video like a year ago. I'll see if I can find that link and like put it in the description or something. But it's probably time to update it too because there's some new stuff out that makes it look even more like it's gonna happen. But as far as Voyager here, the reason I jumped to her is because she's been keeping a secret and it's one that she's never told the Avengers. And her secret is the Grand Master is really her father. And she's actually playing the role as his ace in the hole by moving the next pyramid so the Hulk can't get to it. But at the time that it's revealed that she's actually the Grandmaster's daughter, this is where we get her true origin, or her true retcon origin, again. Because this is where we find out that she's been helping the Grandmaster play dirty for ages. In this case, planting false memories into the Avengers by leading them to believe she was really an original member, but nonetheless playing the field to the advantage of the Grandmaster. Yeah, it's real trippy. Trippy, but clever. But this has been her role the whole time. And so now Hulk, who has to go through all his extra stuff to get the winning pyramid, he is not letting anything stop him. And this Hulk, who is shrouded in much mystery because he's really not saying anything and he's being extra brutal. And he's so brutal that after he turns Captain Glory's spine into toothpaste, and that was Captain Glory from the Lethal Legion, but after he turns his bone structure into caramel cashew brittle, he then grabs Mentacle, who's also from the Lethal Legion, and what he does to him is so ungodly that the panel doesn't even show it. It's so gruesome that the Grand Master can't even watch. And all you see is like the Grand Master and the Challenger's faces, and from the screen is like just screaming. And I'm sure Mentacle was saying more than no. He, he was probably I'll be like mother of god why in the name of everything that's holy <laughs> that doesn't bend that way oh <laughs> like there's no telling where he ripped those tentacles off and made them go man and when the avengers and everyone else saw this on the screen their reaction was pretty much like dustin from stranger things 2 <laughs> when the demigorgon got out and they knew they had to do something about it but at the same time it's like this ain't gonna go well because he just turned the first dude's bones into talcum powder and the second dude he just went straight origami with him like i think he's a swan now but from here going forward, I'm trying not to clap while I'm talking, <laughs> but from here going forward, it is a marathon of failure. Enigma gets peeled and tossed like a candy wrapper. Cannonball gets slapped so hard. <laughs> he gets slapped so hard that he turns into a swastika, like his leg going this way, the other arm that way. And what I don't get is like, crazy impacts have been known to shut down his protective shield or his blast fields when he propels like a cannonball. But this is also the way that he found out that he was immortal. So I'm thinking like, did Quicksilver really have to go over and catch him? Or did he just do that to look busy so he wouldn't have to engage the Hulk? <laughs> go to sleep, go to sleep, go to sleep. But they even send in General Robert Maverick, who's the Red Hulk. And before he goes in, Dr. Tony is like, look, okay, the Red Hulk doesn't stand a chance against the Green Hulk. You need armor. And he catches Faye like he in the barber chair, like sit down how you want it. And I ain't gonna front on him, he got a couple hits in, but Hulk is out here looking like Mike Tyson in the 90s. Like if you get 10 or 11 seconds with this guy, you did a good job. But the finisher for Red Hulk, like straight up Mortal Kombat style, <laughs> like he took his soul. <laughs> nah, not literally, but he absorbs all the gamma radiation from Red Hulk leaving him drained and his armor powerless which it just falls off at that point point. and so next when the scarlet witch uses her hex magic to release vision initially he doesn't engage only to get maverick in the clear so after he phases through the hulk which pisses him off even more because you, you just don't phase through a brother man that ain't cool like say excuse me or something but when he does this and it gets the hulk's attention quicksilver swoops through gets maverick like hey look at me staying busy got other things to do such a busy guy but Vision, who usually fights the same way when he fights, or completely intangible. And from a point of observation, the challenger calls it, because that's his play, and he pulls that card in every fight. But while he's doing this, he's trying to talk reason to the Hulk, believing that he's getting through the banner. But when Vision realizes that he can't, he does the predictable reach through and scramble the brain. But when he does this, Hulk times it halfway through him solidifying and smashes the solar jewel on his forehead, which is literally lights out for this guy. Like he's done. And unfortunately, the Vision did not see that coming. I'm sorry. Like he beat this dude back to binary. Like he just sitting there like zero, one, zero, one. <laughs> like they gonna have to refurbish this dude, he's done. 
but we get a turn of events when Wonder Man tries to reason with him. Because at this point, Hulk has made it all the way to the door where Voyager's on the other side, hiding with the last pyramid. But it's at this point, since Hulk's current resurrection, telling Wonder Man that we're not friends, I don't like you for this specific reason, and he's telling him when the Challenger woke him up to use him to get these pyramids, that instead the Hulk is fully aware of what he's doing, and that when this game ends, the world ends with it. And finally, Hulk will be left alone. And immediately Thor and Hercules jump in like, oh hell no. Nah. Because from here forward, it is confirmed the Hulk is fully coherent. He's fully in control and he's making these decisions with intelligence, which we know can be a very bad combination. But when Rogue absorbs his gamma energy, his part of his memories and his rage, we get a glimpse of Banner again. Well, last time it wasn't a glimpse, we just heard his voice, but he's saying the same thing and he's warning everyone to run because they cannot kill the Hulk. He cannot die. And it doesn't matter what you do. Shoot him in the eye, shoot him in the heart with vibranium arrows. Thor's even broke his neck one time. Matter of fact, he's had his neck broken on a few occasions. But Banner knows better than anyone else. Second closest to probably knowing this is probably Dr. Voodoo. But Banner knows no matter how he's died, the Hulk keeps coming back. Like there is no getting rid of this guy. And he's not like one of your kind of immortals where they live forever in their heart to kill. Nah, he's going to keep coming back. Whether he's decapitated or wasted down to the bone or even drained of his gamma radiation. And it's almost like over the years he's gotten worse. But this is what it's come to. And when he enters the vault to retrieve the last pyramid, the challenger who's communicating with him, of course, directs him in. And when the Hulk enters the vault and he grabs the last pyramid, before it can activate its element or send him back to the Grandmaster's game room, he smashes it. <laughs> oh man, y'all don't understand. <laughs> the challenger right now, he been waiting eons to have a rematch with the Grandmaster. And when the Hulk does this, he is crushed. And I'm sure the next time he sees the Hulk, he'll express these feelings to him. And when he does, Hulk will be like, I can tell. And he'll be like, how? And Hulk will be like, cause we're connected. <laughs> I'm telling you like the Hulk superpower. I've told you before, the Hulk superpower is not giving a damn. I know I've made that clear at some point. <laughs> like we was probably talking about it like on Twitter not too long ago. <laughs> like Hulk literally came back from the grave just to crawl back out, get in your face and say, I still don't give a damn. <laughs> But as far as giving you guys an understanding of the mind state of the Immortal Hulk, he's probably the closest thing we've seen in recent years. Because with the Immortal Hulk, we're still being teased with the idea of, is this guy still a hero? Is he a villain? And Al Ewing, who's writing the Immortal Hulk series and co-wrote for Avengers No Surrender, He's intentionally leaving us in the dark without a definitive answer going either way. But with those things in mind, Immortal Hulk issue number one starts off with a guy named Thomas Edward Hill. And Thomas is really this guy who's down on his luck. He owes a ton of money to loan sharks. He doesn't really know how he's gonna pay it back. So he decides to try and rob a gas station and he has absolutely no experience doing this. So he's like sweating bullets. But the interesting Easter egg about this is that this gas station isn't just any gas station. It's a Roxxon company gas station. And at the moment, it doesn't seem like anything significant. And we've seen the Roxxon Corporation mentioned in a number of issues in the past having to do with the Hulk. But it hasn't been till recently where the more significant mentions have appeared in the Weapon H series. Because as of right now, the Roxxon Corporation, which is really a two-sided coin, but this corporation's main focus has been tracking down Weapon H. And the CEO of Roxxon Corp, Dario Agar, he's a completely different beast in his own right. And as CEO of this corporation, he's very connected to everything that happens. And I say that because if anything unusual were to happen at this gas station, there is no doubt that the information would make its way back to him. Mainly because he has a number of drones and spies at his disposal in order to guarantee that he's as informed as possible. And trust me, as crazy as it gets, there's always like one spy left or one thing that gets information back to him, whether it's a camera, one person crawling out from under the wreckage, it gets back to him. And so as far as Thomas E. Hill, when he makes his attempt to rob this gas station, and like I said, he is super nervous and he doesn't know how to handle a firearm. So he's resting his finger on the trigger, he's shaking, and out of a state of panic, he ends up shooting four people in this robbery, one of which happened to be Bruce Banner. 
And so as of this point, we really don't know the time gap between when we last seen him in Avengers No Surrender and when we see him here, possibly just passing through, laying low. But just before he's shot, we get a look at a magazine that he was looking at on the shelf that had mentioned recent sightings of the Hulk, but also mentioning do the Avengers know. And this tells us a couple things. One, it gives us a bit of the timeline, letting us know this is after No Surrender and the Earth has been returned to its original place. And two, it also tells us that Banner has made no attempt to get back to the Avengers since we see the Challenger knock him through that portal, which as it turns out seems to have brought him right back to Earth, like he just went through one and just came out the other one on the other side. But through the course of No Surrender, we do know that he made his way back to Earth because after the Challenger was defeated, he had a brief sit down with Hawkeye, who Banner had asked to meet him once again away from the other Avengers. And even though this meeting was very brief, mainly because Banner started to get frustrated because his plan for Hawkeye to shoot the Hulk and kill him didn't work. And that's the main reason why their sit down was cut short. But the three reasons why this conversation was important for us to see back in No Surrender was one, to show us that Banner had made it back to Earth. Two, remind us of Hawkeye's vision of the future where he saw the Hulk had pretty much taken out everybody that he cared for. But third, and really what will be the ongoing theme for the Immortal Hulk series is the last thing that Clint said before Banner walked out. And that was when Clint told Banner that he had changed everything. And when Clint said that, he was referring to Banner's connection with Tony's armor, Banner's connection with the evil Captain America and Secret Empire, and because of Banner coming back, a number of things from Clint's vision had changed. And because of those things changing from the vision, Clint was trying to tell Banner like, you are the difference. This vision that I had, it doesn't have to come true. Like you are a good man down inside and don't ever forget that. And that's really the running theme of the Immortal Hulk. And much like how the issue starts off with a quote from Carl Gustav Jung, who's also the Swiss psychologist who founded analytical psychology, we start off from a quote from him. It says, man is on the whole less good than he imagines himself or wants to be. And that's something you've got to keep in mind throughout this series. Because when Banner's body's in the morgue, it's pretty much a John Doe at this point. They don't know that it's Banner. And they don't really figure that out till after he hulks out and chases down the guy who did this. And as it turns out, he first follows him back to like this biker gang. Like they're the ones, they're the loan sharks who loaned him money. They loaned Thomas the money that he couldn't pay back, knowing good and well that he wouldn't be able to pay it back. And they really just suckered him into this loop of paying them back over and over again in a cycle where his debt would never be paid in full. But what's crazy is the way that the Hulk found him. And he did that by tracking down his scent of lying. And this points out another thing because we've known the Hulk to have senses that were just insane. But for him to tactically use them, especially a sense of smell, like that's usually a Logan thing. But with him doing that, it shows us even more how much this guy is in control. And it's pretty creepy. But that's the difference we're gonna be getting with the Immortal Hulk. That's not quite like your Doc Samson or even like your Maestro. Because with the Immortal Hulk, Al Ewing is going for more of a horror tone. And I'm gonna tell you right now, like if turning around and seeing this, like he didn't even hear him lead the rest of that gang and come to him. Like he just turned around and this monster was there. And I gotta tell you, man, Joe Bennett, the way he draws the Hulk's eyes in this series, they express so much, but they're menacing at the same time. But a crucial thing to notice at this point is when the Hulk catches up with Thomas, he's not just here to eat him because he shot him. And I'm pretty sure that's what Thomas is thinking. But since given the title Immortal Hulk, like it hasn't been up until now that we've seen this Hulk really care about anything. But it's here that we find out from the four people that Thomas shot at that gas station, one was a 12 year old girl and the Hulk came all this way to tell Thomas her name. And he didn't have to do that. Like he could have just ran through, killed all these guys and just kept it moving. But as it turns out, the Hulk, he didn't kill anybody from that gang. And as far as Thomas, he understood that Thomas felt like he had a sense of power going into that gas station with that gun, causing three people, three out of four to lose their lives. So the Hulk pretty much just gave him example of what real power is without the use of a gun without anybody getting killed too and with that said the hulk really let him off pretty easy by breaking nearly every bone in his body and if i'm not mistaken it's like 206 i think he left him like two <laughs> but because he had the gun on him that he used at the gas station the police tied him to the robbery and they also had one less problem with that gang the dogs of hell because up until this point they couldn't get enough evidence to move on the gang but at this point the police are saying that they have the fear of god in them and every last one of them is just talking and i'm pretty sure that in conjunction with the detectives who know that this was the work of the hulk but i'm pretty sure because this entire incident started at a rock 
Exxon gas station that it'll eventually make its way to Dario Agar. But I'm curious to know what you guys think as far as the Hulk. Do you think he's a hero? Do you think he's becoming a villain? And I will say in No Surrender, he did see more of the villain type because he was pretty much smashing all the Avengers and the villains. Nobody was safe, at least until he got punched out the atmosphere. Alright, so future Dez checking in here for just a moment because back when we originally started the Immortal Hulk journey, we more or less kind of just skipped over both Del Fry and Hotshot. So I kind of just put it in the back of my mind like whenever we do the big spill, I gotta go back and talk about this. And so here we are. But back at this time with Bruce, who's still kind of floating around with no permanent place of residence and also majority of the world still thinking he's dead. But it's also around this time when he finds himself being pulled to a location and he's not sure why and he's not sure what it is. But instead for him it's more like this thing of where he can't sit still until he makes his way to whatever this is that's pulling him to this location which at this point is just an unnamed small town that he made his way to from taking a hunch to get on a bus to where then he only knew what stop to get off on because that tug or that itch just wouldn't let him sit in his seat but also around this time as he makes his way around this town he eventually learns the name of it from seeing different newspaper headlines but also it's here where he gets the first impression of Jackie McGee who's written a story about the return of the Hulk which made the front page of the Arizona Herald but the thing that catches his attention here is a headline from the local newspaper that mentions the mayor's comments about mysterious deaths and when Bruce sees this he feels that pull once again to look into it and where this eventually leads him is to like this local pub in order to ask around about these mysterious deaths and when he does the bartender she initially just kind of brushes it off like it's just one of those things that just kind of happens in a small town but then this other guy at the pub named Roy who actually looks a lot like Morgan Freeman <laughs> but he interjects himself into the conversation and he lets Bruce know that these deaths are connected to grief because out of the like four people who had died they had lost someone they then bury that friend or loved one and then not long after they would then fall into grief get sick and mysteriously die but Roy also lets him know that this had all started with that fry boy because when he died then it started getting weird but of course then with hearing this Bruce had then asked who's this kid and it's here where the bartender shows him a picture from her phone and she lets him know Dell was prom king star quarterback star player for the college team and the whole town loved him but he was never self-absorbed about it like he never let it go to his head but as far as everyone knows when he died he had just killed over but then it's here as they're telling Bruce more about Dell where they then let him know that Dell's father was rich because he had either invented or made something better to where then there's kind of like this snap finger moment when they're trying to think of what it was again and as it turns out it was radiation treatment and this is the next thing that kind of gives Bruce that tug again which then causes him to make his way to Green Park Cemetery to visit the grave of Del Fry but it's not long after he gets there where he then notices that Del's grave is leaking gamma radiation and as soon as he notices this he pieces everything together with the people who've lost their loved ones who had then came to the cemetery to visit those who they lost but with them coming here they were constantly exposed to gamma radiation which had eventually taken its toll to where these small doses of gamma radiation would kill off their white blood cells shut down their immune system and make them sick leading to their death but with Bruce calling the EPA to send people out here and check it out he didn't of course want to give them his name but with making this call and not saying who he was they didn't take him serious so then eventually he did give his name so that they then would actually send someone out there and resolve this issue but then after this he then leaves to go towards the main location which has pulled him to this town but then also just to be a bit clearer on that the thing that's pulling him towards this location which he now discovers is like this cave on top of the mountain is actually the Hulk who wants him to go here and find something and when Bruce makes his way to the top and inside the cave he first sees a ton of bodies that have OD on gamma exposure and then right after he's then met by Dell's father Dr. Fry who at this point had just been hiding up in this cave and killing any and everyone who finds him and so when Bruce gets here he then tries that on Bruce but as we know that ain't work out well because as soon as he put the paws on him Bruce hulks out and right away Dr. Fry he realizes that he picked the wrong person to play the gamma version of Big Bang Takes Little Bang but then it's here where the Hulk asks Dr. Fry about his son Dale. Like this all started with him, didn't it? And right away, a terrified Dr. Fry with him seeing the Hulk, right away he's just like, oh my God, you're Dr. Banner. And right away from there, Dr. Fry just tells the story, which all started with him being a man who was just afraid of death. Because for him, after he lost his wife, him and his son were then just in a very dark place. But for Dr. Fry, he had then found hope in Dr. Banner's work with gamma radiation because he had seen Banner as a man who death could not claim. 
which for Dr. Fry at this point, it's more of a reference to the previous deaths of Bruce Banner with the exception of Civil War 2 because it isn't up until now to where Dr. Fry is learning about Dr. Banner coming back from that. But with Dr. Fry finding inspiration in Bruce's research, he had taken that and mixed it with conventional cancer treatments but even with doing that he had developed a more risky and potent version which he had then started to use on himself. And right away with doing this he felt 10 years younger, he had more strength, more energy and a gamma healing factor. But then when he tried to use the same serum on his son, the effect was immediately tragic. His eyes started bleeding green and right away Dell started yelling that he sees a green door. And on top of that there's someone looking through the door back at him. And with his last words he just yells it's below us, it's below everything. And for Dr. Fry with his son's death he just immediately burned the serum, all of his notes and his research and he didn't tell anyone about how this had happened because he just didn't have the courage to admit what he had done. But then it's here where the Hulk puts everything together. And even going as far back to what Roy said back in the pub with this all being a chain of grief, with that grief starting with Dr. Fry who had killed his son and then hid out here in the middle of nowhere inside this cave to where he then killed every person one after another who found him. And so like for the Hulk in order to close this chain or end it, he pretty much sees it ending with Dr. Fry who the Hulk says Dr. Fry loved his son so he put him in a grave and that's exactly what the Hulk does to Dr. Fry by burying him alive in this cave to where now instead of Dr. Fry fearing death but now he practically finds himself begging for it rather than being buried alive under a ton of rocks with just inches of room to move. But then it's after this where we then go back to Green Peak Cemetery where we find the radiological emergency response team has made their way there only to find that Dale Fry has awoken from the dead. And so now from here we then get into the story of Hot Shot to where in his case it comes by way of Jackie McGee with her going around to different locations within South Dakota and getting her story from four different sources on the most recent Hulk sighting to where in this case she talks to a priest, no lady, a bartender and a cop. And with how this is done, even though it's all these different accounts gelling into one story, but it's pretty interesting on how the art style changes depending on who exactly is telling their part of the story. But pretty much what had happened here, as far as how the cop would tell it, this green kid just ran up to this church on Mercer Avenue, to where in this case the kid's wearing an outfit that pretty much looks like something a scroll would wear back in the 80s. But when this kid shows up, he's shooting gamma rays out of his fingers, he assaults the priest, and he shoots this heroic handsome cop in the hand. But then from here jumping to the bartender, he accounts meeting a guy who the bartender says he looks like a serial killer, but we know this guy to be Bruce Banner. But as the bartender recalls, he just remembers this weirdo stepping into the bar to where then the two of them got in a bit of an argument. But then when the stranger, who we knew to be Bruce, saw this breaking news on the television about a gamma incident at a church, he had then grabbed a knife and just ran out the door. And it's like, with hearing this story from the bartender, I'm, I'm pretty sure the last part about grabbing a knife, that that didn't happen at all. But with the bartender already thinking that Bruce was a serial killer, he just kind of convinced himself that that had happened. But then from here we go to an old lady who was inside the church and as she would tell it Hotshot was just this handsome young man who looked like James Dean that had made his way into the church asking the priest to help his girlfriend. And as this old lady would tell it like Hotshot is just dancing and crying because she remembers seeing him for the first time and it just being colorful. But then when we go over to the priest and the way that he remembers the story it is way more darker. And I'd even say in this instance it's way more accurate to what had actually happened even though we do continue to jump back and forth a little bit. But as the priest would tell it, this kid had just run into the church and he's telling the priest about how the devil is in his girlfriend or at least something like the devil, something underneath, something below everything. And from the moment that this kid ran in, he just begging the priest to come with him and do an exorcism. And with saying this, he tells the priest about how he had dreams about this green door. But then in the middle of them talking, the cops show up to where one tries to negotiate and the other one's calling for backup. And I'm pretty sure the one calling for backup, he's the one who claimed he had his hands zapped. But interestingly enough, that's in no one else's story but either way with the cops showing up this kid starts to freak out because he just wants the priest to come and help but then at this point when the Hulk then arrives by smashing through the stained glass window and it's here with the story then jumps back to the old lady because at this point the priest he just started praying but as she would describe it like when the Hulk showed up this kid just started begging the Hulk for help and when the kid lifted his hands the Hulk then broke his hand like with a pinch 
which is something the cop would describe as the Hulk just disarming a felon. But as it turned out with this kid, like the matter he got, the more powerful his gamma blasts would get, which is pretty interesting because we don't often see that with gamma mutates. And I don't remember if that was necessarily a thing when Hotshot first got his powers from the leader, but in this case, the cop said that's what he saw, so must be true. But after this, when the priest opened his eyes, the next thing he saw is that this kid had blown a hole straight through the Hulk. But instead of the Hulk dying, this hole then just started to close up. And when this happened, Hotshot, he had said what the priest had been thinking. Because Hotshot had just looked at the Hulk and said, it's you. You're the shadow. The one below all. The devil himself. And with him calling the Hulk all of this and the devil himself, and the Hulk responded saying you damn right, and he just knocked out Hotshot and Hotshot went to jail. But then not long after this, as the priest would describe, him and the police then went over to go check out Hotshot's girlfriend, who we know as Jailbait, who at one point she had also got her powers from the leader, to where she then got the ability to create force fields, but when the priest and the police arrived at their place, like, she was already dead. And with this happening this way, they kinda just figured that Hotshot had killed her as well. But he swore up and down that when he left her there, he had just tied her to the chair and she was still alive. But then one of the last things we see is like with the old lady, she then goes on to say that at times she would then visit Hotshot in prison. But that didn't last for too long because eventually he had just lost hope with nobody believing his story and he eventually hung himself in his cell. And so now the way that we're introduced to this throughout the Immortal Hulk series is by way of a reporter from the Arizona Herald by the name of Jacqueline McGee. And ever since the most recent resurrection of the Hulk in Avengers No Surrender, she has been chasing down different Hulk sightings, desperately trying to get face to face with Bruce Banner. And at this point, for the most part, there's just been sightings and most people still believe that Banner is dead as a result of what took place in Civil War II when he was killed by Hawkeye. But because of her obsession with the Hulk, that really started with an encounter that she had with the Hulk as a child. We find that she has been obsessing to pursue the opportunity to ask Banner the question she has burning within. And for the most part throughout the series, we always catch her being one step behind and usually appearing where Banner's been up until now. And her luck turns around when she gets a call from Walter Langowski, who is Sasquatch from Alpha Flight. And I gotta say, Walter Langowski is the perfect character to introduce the concept that not only will give us the return of Brian Banner, but also stir up more lingering truths about the Incredible Hulk that are based upon the existing history of the Incredible Hulk. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But first, the reason why he's calling is because he notices that Jacqueline isn't just trying to get a quick story, but instead, through reading her articles, he notices that she's the only person actively pursuing Bruce Banner. And this urges him to call her because recently Carol Danvers, who has recently become the leader of the Alpha Flight space program, she's had to bench Walter because his recent over-aggressive change in behavior. And because of his history, which we'll get to in a little bit, but because of his history and his origin, which are all on file, Carol Danvers makes the evaluation and decides that it's best for him to take a leave before history repeats itself. And I like that she acknowledges that Walter has been a part of Alpha Flight long before the space program, and she understands that that alone can make it tough for a new leader to come in and make this kind of call. But with Carol knowing the history of Sasquatch and the danger that comes along with knowing that he was originally the vessel that had traded places with Tanarak, the conqueror of beasts and who by way of Walter entered this world and initially just carried on as Sasquatch as if it was Walter inside. And for that reason, a lot of this behavior seems too familiar. But on top of that, Carol Danvers has also noticed that the entire time that she has been working with him on the low orbit space station, that he has spent more time as Sasquatch than he has as Walter. Which is very true if you go back and read those issues of Captain Marvel, which I believe is like volume 9 at that point. But at the time that she benches him, her mentioning that was just an observation. And at that point, she had only assumed that him spending more time as Sasquatch was the reason for this change in behavior. And little did she know that she was right, and there's so much more. Because if we go back to the original origin of Sasquatch, and how his creation was an intentional attempt to duplicate the transformation of the Incredible Hulk, which was also backed and supported by James Hudson, aka Guardian from Alpha Flight, who took over funding after Walter had spent all of his money from playing professional football for the Green Bay Packers. And Walter's desire to become the Hulk, it stems from his history with Bruce Banner 
because before Walter met Bruce at Pennsylvania State, he had originally studied at the University of Calgary where his focus was on physics, but it wasn't until he met Banner at Penn State to when that focus changed to gamma radiation, which he studied alongside with Bruce Banner. But his desire to want to become the Hulk, that was ignited back when General Ross broke the news to the world that Bruce Banner and the Hulk were the same person. And Walter at this time, he had known that some time ago Banner had took a private project that was super top secret for the government dealing with gamma radiation and Walter knew that was the incident that transformed Banner into the Hulk. And because at this time Walter had made a few million from playing professional football, he then used over a million from that, which after all the houses, cars, and taxes, well not in that order, was probably all the money he had left. But after taking an insane amount of money out of his own pocket and also using research gathered from other incidents involving gamma radiation, he then took upon himself to create a controlled environment where he could reproduce Banner's incident. And his similar way of thinking just goes back to his days in college at Penn State with Banner to where they both were two students out of a minority group who weren't just going to school to get their name put on a piece of paper, but instead their motivation was to learn something and apply that knowledge into something useful. And I gotta say, Marvel Legacy going back and revisiting this and adding dialogue to what the canon had only showed us as images, ever so carefully sprinkling a little retcon in there, like that is how it's supposed to be done. And when they do this, what we find out in Immortal Hulk is that when Walter switched majors to Gamma Theory, it's almost like Banner just called him out. Because what we know from the history of them doing this to better the world and make the most out of their education, Banner recognized that Walter was just doing this for people to like him. And sure, from Walter's perspective, he's looking at it like, okay, Banner's like, okay, you throw the football and gamma radiation, that's mine. But I would beg to argue because there's three sides to every story. But fast forward to the transformation and the importance of the location that it takes place. Three years after finding out the true identity of the Incredible Hulk being Bruce Banner, Walter carries out this experiment at the Arctic Circle in an Alpha Flight facility once again provided by James Hudson. And when he does this, he actually opens a portal to the realm of beasts linking himself with Tanarak, the conqueror of beasts. And this also is nothing new because we discovered this back in early issues of Alpha Flight when we finally got the origin of Sasquatch and Narya aka Snowbird got the revelation through a dream that his transformation was truly a transposition and that anytime Walter would transform into Sasquatch that it was truly Tanarak. And because of that here early on, it was established that this specific gamma radiation transformation that is very similar to that of Bruce Banner, that it holds a connection and has opened a doorway to the realm of beasts. And when Marvel Legacy refers back to this by way of the Immortal Hulk, it's done seamlessly. And what we find out in the Immortal Hulk with Sasquatch specifically is that when he did this here at the Arctic Circle, because of its location and its history, the gamma process that he duplicated opened this doorway to the realm of monsters that would now be known as the Green Door. And so now this Green Door, which has always existed from the origins of Sasquatch, it is very important because this door, it allows a passageway to the realm of the Great Beasts, which we now know share a connection to gamma radiation. And this is how Sasquatch ended up making his connection to Tanarak here at the Arctic Circle. And located within the Arctic Circle, you also have the Eye of the World. And this location is where the separation between Earth and the realm of beasts is at its weakest. And so now with this green door being created, it allows free passage for any beast to enter into this realm. And as long as Walter is in the form of Sasquatch, he's holding that door open that breaches the mystical barrier that contains these beasts. And so now the way that this connects to Brian Banner, the father of Bruce Banner, who is also known as the Devil Hulk, who was once exposed to gamma radiation during an accident at his job working on a process to create nuclear energy, he had been exposed to gamma radiation in that accident. And even though he had never literally hulked out from the time of that incident all the way up to his actual time of death, Banner as a child could always see that beast or monster within him. And his father is always predicted because of his abusive childhood and because of the monster that he believed Bruce's grandfather to be, this caused Brian to swear that he would never have a child in fear of passing that monster gene on. But when he went to school, he fell in love with Rebecca. They had a child, Bruce Banner, who inherited those genes passed down from his grandfather, but in addition, the radiation from his father, Brian Banner. And as a result, this is what gave Bruce
Bruce Banner the unique outcome of becoming the Incredible Hulk, which for Banner runs deeper than any other and cannot be duplicated precisely because he has gamma radiation in his DNA. And for his father Brian Banner, during Chaos War when he was resurrected by the Chaos King, it's here where we first truly get the transformation of Brian Banner into the Devil Hulk, which was one part of a result to his exposure to gamma radiation and that becoming a part of him. And we also know that back when this happened, he was able to Hulk out because the dead gained strength on how the living perceived them, which also made him insanely huge and gave him the appearance that we had seen previously with your Devil Hulk and Guilt Hulk put together, which we had seen prior to this only manifested in Banner's subconscious. But with Brian Banner, even before his death, already having the adequate ingredients to be considered a Hulk, I believe that the reason why he didn't Hulk out before he died is best described in your original run of the Incredible Hulk, where we find out that there are three parts, Guardian, Glow, and Goblin, who explain that by way of the gamma explosion, Bruce Banner was able to physically become the monster that was hidden deep within and was physically molded into that monster through the process of that gamma explosion. And we've also seen in previous issues that for Bruce in his subconscious, these three represented the gamma explosion, his mother and his father. And in his mind, that's how he would perceive them. But with the Guardian mentioning that she had failed Bruce during the time of the gamma bomb explosion, and the Guardian's responsibility being preservation, her failure in combination to the incident and what was already within Bruce collectively allowed his transformation to take place. And just to be clear, these three are not figments of Bruce's imagination, but they are actually the personification of his rage, self-preservation, and reason which we saw when Doctor Strange sent Banner to the crossroads when Nightmare tried to use the Hulk to attack Strange, which was his fellow teammate on the Defenders. But I also believe that much like Bruce Banner, Brian Banner also possesses his own incarnation of these three, but the reason why Brian Banner didn't change in his incident was because his guardian did not fail. At least not yet, not in the incident, but his guardian did fail at the time of his death, which is what allowed the resurrected Brian Banner to Hulk out in the Chaos War event where he was resurrected by the Chaos King. And in that storyline, Brian Banner had mentioned that he was in hell prior to his resurrection. But after Bruce Banner turned the tables, faced his fears, which weakened the Devil Hulk, at the time of his second death, the beast had crumbled away. And what we come to find out now, by way of the Immortal Hulk, is that this green door that Sasquatch has opened, and he continues to hold open the longer that Walter stays in his Sasquatch form, we find out that this door is what allowed the Devil Hulk to return. But this return comes with a catch because the first time we see him, he is taken control of and later on killed Jailbait whose powers she got from the leader, but they originate from gamma radiation. And this led her boyfriend, Lewis, also known as Hotshot, to seek help from a priest claiming that his girlfriend had been possessed by the devil himself. And he went on rambling uncontrollably about a green door, but this didn't go on for long because the Hulk eventually crashed in, stopped him, and like broke both of his hands so he couldn't blast nobody. And shortly after, Hotshot was arrested, leaving many to believe that he actually killed her. But because this wasn't true and nobody would believe him, on top of the mysterious death of his girlfriend, we later find out that while he was in prison, he ended up taking his own life. And at this point, Jacqueline McGee, she's the one putting all this information together. She interviewed the Reverend, different witnesses at the church, some of which who visited Hotshot while he was in prison, and now she's finally been able to meet up with and have a talk with Walter Legowski. But when they meet up to have this talk, a couple of guys who are usually quiet at this spot get into this strange argument which escalates quickly and one of them stabs Walter in the back, almost like they were influenced by something to kill Walter. But Jacqueline rushes Walter to the emergency room, and it's there while she's waiting that she's met by Bruce Banner. And it's here in this quick conversation which catches Jacqueline by surprise. Like she's so surprised that he's here that she doesn't even get to ask her a question. But when Bruce mentions that he was led here because the Hulk can pick up radiation signatures, which all humans let off, but he knows Walter's because it's very similar to his own. And that's all due to the process which created Sasquatch. And it's also how Bruce knew after the doctors thought Walter was dead, when Walter's body transformed into Sasquatch, Bruce could sense it by way of the Hulk, giving Jacqueline and the nearby security the heads up to evacuate the hospital. But when Bruce went to go see Walter to kind of talk him down and de-escalate the situation, Sasquatch responded, I'm not Walter. And this is because Brian Banner, who had previously taken control of Jailbait, 
had also made his way into Walter's body and when Walter and Jacqueline had met for their interview, he had used his gamma radiation influence to influence two regular guys because all humans emit radiation but he had used these guys to kill Walter so he could take over his body. And when Banner walks in, he immediately kills him in order to bring out the immortal Hulk. And through the clues that Brian Banner had left, Bruce had figured out that the other possessions were only to get his attention but it wasn't till now when he actually met face to face with this monster that he realized that it was his father, Brian Banner. But it's also here that we're given the hint that two others, three killers total are in the body of Sasquatch and that they made their way through the green door because of Walter staying in that form over the course of months. And we're not told exactly what this means, whether it means he has a guardian and a demon with no light or if it's other beasts that are crossed through with him, we just don't know at this point. But in order to stop him, the Hulk absorbs his gamma radiation, much like we've seen him do with Robert Maverick back in Avengers No Surrender, and this returns the beast back into the regular form of Walter, giving Jacqueline the opportunity to ask the Hulk the question she's been waiting to ask him all this time. Because ever since she was a little girl and the Hulk had rampaged through and destroyed her home, and she was like 15 at the time, but when the Hulk had destroyed her home and pretty much her whole neighborhood, and from then she had always been told not not to look him in the eye. And in this fight, even though his dad gouged his eyes out, she kind of waits for them to grow back. And after they grow back, she tells the Hulk she has questions and the Hulk is like, okay, one question. And her one question is how do I become what you are? Because that is what she is obsessed with ever since she was 15. And the Hulk really doesn't acknowledge this. He just walks away. He just tells her to go home and he walks away. And this reminds me a lot of that same instance when Banner was sent to the crossroads by Doctor Strange. And this is another reason why I say Sasquatch is just perfect for this whole thing. Because when that happened, Alpha Flight reached in with this like fishing rod thing with like a red beam that was like the line to wheel back in Banner. And in there when Banner had separated from the Hulk, he told Walter, you can have him. Because for a while after Walter's resurrection, all he really had was like this silver and red kind of robot thing that he was in. But the offer to sacrifice his own life so that Walter would have a body, this just encouraged Walter to be the hero that Bruce inspired him to be. And after using this connection as a way to speak through the Hulk to Banner, Walter gives up possession of the Hulk, causing the Hulk to merge back with Bruce and they just wheel him in. And Bruce was just like, dang it Walter, I told you you can have the Hulk and you just gonna give him right back to me. But it's like the latter part of that story really told us how badly Bruce Banner did not want to be trapped in this body with the Hulk. And it just speaks volumes to his response to Jacqueline, who's literally begging to live this nightmare. But after the Hulk walked away and Walter wakes up, Walter tells her that he's gone, that Sasquatch is gone, and how usually he can sense Sasquatch in his human form, that all of that is gone and he senses none of it anymore. And that's because the Hulk absorbed everything. Brian Banner, what I'm guessing to be Sasquatch, and who knows what else the third is. All right, so previously on this playlist, we've gone into much detail about the Green Door. I've covered a bit of its history in relation to Sasquatch and his origin. And on top of that, we've even gone as far to talk about the Dark Gods who have used this door to pass through because of its ability to unlock a passageway into different dark dimensions, which previously is something we've only seen in relation to the Great Beasts, at least up until we got the return of Brian Banner, who used the tethered connection between Sasquatch and the door to kind of slip through the cracks and possess his body. And with doing this, he actually tricked Banner to use his ability to absorb gamma radiation, which in turn put Brian Banner, Bruce Banner, and the Hulk all in the same body. And I'm gonna tell you right now, that is one crazy party you can leave me out of. Because two is company, three is a crowd, and when you get to four, you just don't want anymore. But what's interesting is when we follow up with Banner after this event had taken place, his memories are pretty hazy from the time that he was a Hulk, which of course is nothing new. But since the events of No Surrender, he is aware that the Hulk is different, that the Hulk is smarter, and he can connect to much of those thoughts from the Hulk through the old fashioned way of just hunches and intuition. And when he notices the Hulk's mind going towards things like magic, along with Banner's vague memories of absorbing Sasquatch from Walter Langowski, he like the combination of the two puts Banner in this mindset of, you know what, I'm just not gonna Hulk 
out again. Because once again for Banner, only through the form of a hunch does he get this feeling that when he absorbed Sasquatch, that something else came along for the ride. And it's like you know Banner's theory sounds good, like the idea sounds good of not hulking out, but it never really works that way. But something that we've seen frequently in Immortal Hulk that we also find happening here is at nighttime, that voice of him communicating with the Hulk or to the beast within, at this point it gets much clearer. Like there's something about the darkness which couldn't be any more dangerous at this point because it also strengthens the connection between him and any other Hulk or beast that he has just roaming around inside there, who at this time during the night is very subtly guiding him to the green door. But while he's on his way, he's approached by Captain Marvel who had used technology that Alpha Flight would usually use to track Sasquatch, but in this case to find the Hulk, but with Sasquatch out of commission, she had to bring a squad with a bit more power than Alpha Flight at this time, or at any time for that matter. <laughs> And I gotta say, semi-sincere apologies to the die-hard Alpha Flight fans out there. I know the both of y'all is big mad right now, but the Avengers even being here is really just for backup because Carol Danvers has been charged with the options of either bringing in Walter Langowski, who will likely be given lethal injection because of the crimes charged when he was Sasquatch and being controlled by the Devil Hulk, or to bring in Banner, who, if he hulks out again, they're ordered to kill and bring in. And I'm gonna tell you right now, just from Jump, it didn't go well. And part of that reason is because his influence Banner kind of pushed the button with She-Hulk, stirring up her frustrations, which go all the way back to Civil War II, because she is clearly still mad at Banner for guilting Hawkeye into killing the Hulk and not even even thinking for a moment what that would do to her, his own family. But when it really jumps off, it reminds me a lot of the first Avengers film when uh, Banner told Captain America his secret about always being angry. Because here when Captain Marvel tells Banner the ultimatum and pretty much the Hulk out again is to be sentenced to death, he's just like, well that's my secret Captain, I'm already dead. And from there he just completely wrecks the Avengers. And all the while, keep in mind this is a Hulk that is being guided by Brian Banner. And when this happens, we get a bit of foreshadowing from Thor, who we've seen with one eye, who we've seen with one arm, and now we see with 31 teeth who mentions that this creature of science that this world has made is near the equivalent of a god or perhaps even a devil. And Brian Banner pretty much just tells him, Devil Hulk. But what Thor says about the god or devil level status, that's just foreshadowing something we'll talk about later on in this video. But at this point where we pretty much have the immortal Devil Hulk wrecking the Avengers, Tony's Hulkbuster armor gets critically busted and forces him to use the I'm not about that life protocol. Nah, but he ejects to his low orbiting cannon in order to activate the one shot Helios laser which is pretty much a UV radiation beam that points like the power of the sun levels of energy in one direction. And after pretty much UV nuking Banner, <laughs> Captain America felt pretty bad about it. And he's like, um, yeah, we, we just killed this guy. And I like the interaction between these three because Tony knows that and, and he's kind of like, duh. But T'Challa on the other hand, who has the intelligence and the compassion, he breaks it down for Cap and assures him that this is just a temporary measure. And following the protocol, they sent him to Secretary Ross, who was in charge of Hulk operations. And as a result, Secretary Ross sends the Hulk to Shadow Base, which surprisingly and contrary to what you might think, isn't as fun as it sounds. And I know it doesn't sound fun at all, and it's because it's not. And that's because it's here that they have the Hulk separated in jars. And on the inside of each one of these jars, he is still alive. Every limb, every organ, every intestine still working perfectly as if it were still within one organism. And that's the reason why he's here. Like the whole purpose of him even being contained here and being experimented on by Dr. Clive, who I promise you looks just like Krieger. And they just may be the same person from different realities. Who knows? But with this entire intention and goal being to discover the secrets and figure out the rules of how the immortal hulk does this how does he stay alive why isn't he regenerating and how are the other pieces independently operating while showing no signs of failure or decay because that's truly why the government wants him it's not about safety it's not about banner being punished for crimes but they want the hulk's immortality they want his regeneration they want his strength and dr clive discovers in the most terrifying way that the hulk allowed all of this to happen in order to really just test his limits and see what he could do. But when he brings himself together, which he could have done at any point in time, Dr. Clive, who is standing in the middle, gets engulfed by the Hulk's body. And <laughs> like, I don't know what's worse, this or getting eaten alive. And I think the vote between those two is kind of neck and neck. No pun intended, because that's neck and neck, not neck inside a neck. 
but anyway but straight up dude got engulfed like somebody's in there Ooh, that just gave me chills but anyway <laughs> after this happens even though the hulk is in control he's still experiencing a level of influence from brian banner who is continuing to lead them to the test site where the hulk was born and so it's very close to this time where the narrative crosses over with weapon h because about a month prior to the hulk reaching this test site which is the same site with the initial gamma bomb went off that made him the hulk and also the first time that bruce banner actually died absorbing man had been arrested after pridefully pursuing a jewelry heist that he wanted to do on his own rather than accept a job from roxon that was offered to both him and his wife titania but he turned it down because he wanted to do this on his own and because of that iron man beat him up and he went to jail but the job that the two of them were offered was the same one that we had talked about on the weapon h playlist when dario agar had solicited a few others to accompany weapon h and enter the interdimensional portal which is totally separate from the green door or at least at this point but it was in the weapon h series where we had seen titania try to make a call and reach out to krill who of course didn't answer because he's tied up doing stuff in the immortal hulk series but during the time that krill is locked up when he gets a visit from his attorney his attorney informs him of an opportunity that was recently given to bushwhacker on some top secret government work that's pretty much a get out of jail free card and he lets krill know that he could work out something similar for him all he has to do is just say the word and krill hops on it but what he didn't know is that they wanted him to take a gene enhancement so he can take on the hulk without getting buzzed down like a chocolate chip cookie and although he was initially hesitant he underwent the procedure which gave him a modified version of the red hulk's absorbing power so with the combination of his absorption he could drain the hulk virtually powerless which sounded like a good idea and so when they send krill after banner who's now at the test site it doesn't take long for the hulk to realize you know aside from the fact that absorbing man is red now but it doesn't take long for him to realize that something is different and in a major way because as soon as he touches him he feels a drastic power draw and man like what happens here i really don't think people understand the gravity of it because when carl krill takes absorption after absorption after absorption from the hulk a number of things happen here at the same time because one he takes everything that the hulk had took from walter langowski including brian banner because at this point the hulk can see his own reflection again but when he does this it literally places him in a state between life and death but on top of that with them being this close to the actual site the specific site where banner had died and became the hulk much like we had talked about before these locations are where the green door is at its strongest and for Walter Lingowski, when he imitated the Hulk's incident in a different location, the history of this location, which we talked about previously on the playlist, opened the door to the Great Beast, which is why he became Sasquatch and not an actual Hulk. But because Banner's Hulk was created here in New Mexico, with them being this close to an area where the door is weak, and specifically at nighttime, and I mean more so the barrier is weak so the door is stronger. But when this happens, a figure peeps through, telling Carl that you are here below all. And I'm telling you guys, maybe because we know the one below all is set to make his appearance in the immortal hulk i don't take this confrontation lightly because the one below all is going to turn like the entire power scale in marvel like on his head because just off the name alone this means that the one below all is like your equal opposite to the one above all which would also mean with the one above all who's the creator of all life in the marvel universe that would pretty much make the one below all the destroyer of all life and we're talking about omniversal marvel universe Universe, hate and destruction and prior to this point the one above all has been unmatched and unequal but let me find out he has an equal and opposite that exists outside of space and time in an unlisted realm like it's crazy to even think about but during this time where krill is in between life and death hulk goes for the mortal kombat finisher pulling his spine and skull out and using them as a ball and chain very much like absorbing man would use in a traditional sense and so this entire time bushwhacker has been watching from a scope because with absorbing man in the field he's been reassigned to just follow loosely and take the shot when given the order and talk about bad timing because it's also at this moment that walter langowski puck and miss mcgee pull up having traced the energy signal and it's at this moment when bushwhacker decides to pull the trigger and the hulk thinks it was them like i could just imagine two drops of pee is coming out of everybody on this ship but it's not long after this happens and they realize that absorbing man is still alive and on the run towards the spot of the original gamma explosion this is when it dawns on the hulk exactly what he's doing 
because while everyone is busy trying to stop the Hulk, they don't realize that Carl Krill is actually heading for the bomb site so that he can absorb all the gamma radiation and absorb the radiation that's still in the dirt and still left around from the explosion because something is using him in order to do this to open the door all the way. And when Carl gets there, he soaks all of it up and this door opens wide. And like no exaggeration, in New Mexico, this door was literally wide as all outside. But what's funny to me is like, and it probably shouldn't be, but what's funny to me is the reaction of everybody who is flipping out. And like Lingowski gets a look on his face like not again, because he had a similar experience in the Alpha Flight days. And Bushwhacker is disconnected from the general. And like they're all like, where are we? And the Hulk's like, isn't it obvious? We in hell, shawty. <laughs> but it's crazy seeing this because in connection with Marvel Legacy, I'm not sure if they're still following the event that we talked about a long time ago when the Hulk actually went to hell before and lo and behold when he got there, there was Peter Parker. But when he arrived there, this displaced the Hulk from Earth 11638, who was sent to hell by the Bruce Banner of that Earth once he became Sorcerer Supreme. But with Hulk arriving in that hell, it released this one onto Earth 11638. So I'm pretty curious to see if they'll mix any of that in here because the Peter Parker of that Earth, who was the Amazing Spider, his soul was only there because he was in a coma. So could he wake up? Maybe so, who knows? But getting back to the Immortal Hulk, at this point when they're in hell and they should all be worried about how to get back quick as possible, Miss McGee once again is back at the opportunity to try to ask the Hulk how she can be what he is. And <laughs> she really needs to let that go. But not too long into their conversation, they're approached by Rick Jones. And when they see him, his eyes are like hollowed out like he's just a shell. But it's trippy that they see him here and he still has that harmonica. Oh man, I was so triggered one time when I seen this and I forget which video it was, but I was truly triggered off the fact that he's playing a harmonica in the test bomb site. Like who does that? But also while they're there, Miss McGee sees her father and it's very emotional because he had died just stressing himself out trying to work and put the lives of his family back together. But also while they're here, Carl Krill, the absorbing man, feels extremely guilty because he understands that the reason all of them are here is his fault. But Puck assures him that you're the one that opened this door and you're the one who's gonna close it. And for Carl initially, it's pretty frustrating because he's like, why are you so confident about this? Like, what experience do you have here? And in his defense, Puck has plenty, and some of which we talked about earlier on this playlist that took place back in his days with Alpha Flight, but he assures Carl that he is the way out. But over with the Hulk and Miss McGee, they run into Thunderbolt Ross, who's supposed to still be alive. But it's weird seeing him here because I believe he's gonna die in Captain America pretty soon. And it's not that I'm hoping that, just word on the street. But when this version of Ross flips out and turns into some Red Hulk, like hell version of the Red Hulk, they both engage and it's not too long before the Hulk gets the best of him, rips him in half, and immediately after, he begins transforming. And now, even though we don't know for sure that this incarnation of Thunderbolt Ross, if it was actually Banner's father, but we do know when this begins happening and the Hulk turns fiercer and crueler. And it also seems like he's beginning to separate but we do know this is exactly what his father wanted because here in Thamio, which translates to twins of God, while this transformation takes place, his father tells him, he tells his son Banner that he's better off without the monster. And what's crazy that seeing this really reminds me of the video where we talked about the Hulk and Banner both merging and separating due to the events that took place in the microverse and in that video we talked about the different portions of the Hulk and a lot of the entities existing within his subconscious and I'm just wondering if Immortal Hulk is going to go there again. Alright, so recently we've been getting a lot of things coming full circle with the Immortal Hulk, with things like the reintroduction to the Green Door, which is something we previously seen had taken place with Walter Langowski when he initially became Sasquatch, and in doing so this door opened to another dimension and connected him with Tanarak. And previously on this Immortal Hulk playlist, I explained why that door went to another place, and that more so dealt with his incident happening in a certain location. But with the Gamma Explosion connecting them to the Green Door, this had also allowed access for Brian Banner to slip through this door that connects so many worlds and make his way into Sasquatch and doing so with the primary intention of making his way to his son Bruce Banner and leading him back to the green door in order to separate his son from the monster. And finding a way to do so more effectively with the Hulk being able to absorb gamma radiation to which Brian Banner eventually realized that he would absorb himself. And from there depending on the Hulk's anger and more effectively at night he was able to lure the Hulk back to the bomb site where Banner had opened the green door and he used this as 
a method to separate Banner and the Hulk, being that this location in Nevada pulled them all straight to hell. And one of the first things that we're being shown thoroughly is that this has been Brian Banner's plan the whole time. And it's pretty brilliant the way that this new narrative ties in with the classic origins, because originally Brian Banner was just this abusive father who fell in love with his college classmate Rebecca, but even still in doing so he did not want to have children. And at the time this was for a number of reasons, which initially connected to his father Bruce Banner, which is something I can never understand back in the day like why do you name your son after your abusive father who you say has no love in him. <laughs> but either way, this was a combination from him not wanting to pass down the gene from his father, the monster gene, as well as him being aware of his exposure to gamma radiation, which he also feared would cause his wife Rebecca to give birth to a monster. And at the time of Bruce's actual birth, these are the things that terrified him. And so now getting into Immortal Hulk, we revisit a lot of these memories from Brian Banner, who was still a drunk, which is something that only fed into his anger and frustration that he often took out on young Bruce, who for one, he was extremely jealous of because he felt like much of the love and adoration that came from Rebecca was then focused on Bruce after he was born. But in addition to this, we also find out that during Brian's time when he was working for the government, to which I believe was previously supposed to be working on a solution to find clean energy, but even in the process of doing so and often suggesting that his colleagues explore the possibilities and potential of gamma radiation, this also led him to discover that with trying to control gamma radiation, that there was a third element below all that would occasionally react unpredictably. And theoretically, this unknown variable is something that we could later speculate to be the primary cause of a number of gamma related incidents. And with Brian Banner discovering this, little did he know at the time that he had actually found the connection to an actual being, an actual ancient being who was one with this gamma radiation on a subatomic level. And he wouldn't necessarily come to realize this until he was working late, late into the nighttime hours to where he dozed off. And when he dozed off, he seen this abyss. And when he had seen the abyss in this dream or in this vision during these late night hours, hours, he had seen something or someone staring back at him. And though this thing didn't have a particular form, he could sense his grotesque presence. And it was then that he recognized that what he was staring into was something dark that existed under the floorboards of reality as we know it. And initially he did share this with his colleagues, but since they kind of thought it was crazy, he then tried to retract his statements just to save face and not look crazy to everyone. But even still, when him trying to take back what he said to his colleagues, there was no doubt in his mind that he knew what he saw. And from then forward, this has been one of the things that Brian Banner has been keeping to himself, which is why we haven't really heard him talk about it. But even still with that, Immortal Hulk isn't really the first place that's ever touched on the connection to the Hulk himself with the subatomic world. And I got a link down in the description where we talked more about Guardian, Glow, and Goblin back when the Hulk and Banner had separated before. And these three gave the explanation to how the gamma radiation explosion physically molded Banner into this Hulk and how this is exactly what Brian Banner had feared. And albeit though at the time Brian Banner didn't know exactly how this would come about, that night when he felt the creature staring back at him, the creature without a form that he knew was looking for himself, Brian Banner, to create a way for him to come through, this is what fueled his fears even the more with him not wanting to have a child that he knew someday somehow would become this monster. And all because of his knowledge of gamma radiation and that night when Brian Banner stared into the cellar world and experienced the one below all staring right back at him. And so now me while in hell and picking up to where we had talked about with Brian Banner leading the Hulk here and mainly doing so with the point and purpose of separating the Hulk from Bruce Banner and with the intention of separating his son from the monster and successfully doing so where we've seen the Hulk smashing what appeared to be General Ross at the time when this is happening in front of Jackie McGee her father and Rick Jones this gives us another callback to something we had also seen in the older issues of the Hulk but when we revisit it with a more modern interpretation we see this drunk abusive Brian Banner disgustingly lashing out at his son out of fear and weakness because he sees his son constructing a gamma radiation toy set that should be complicated for a child twice his age and I can imagine it probably complicated for anyone probably three or four times his age but the fact that Bruce put it together without the instructions terrified him of the idea of how Bruce would have so much of this knowledge even at an early age and out of frustration Bruce would tear down a set noticeably destroying the third part in the middle of this gamma construct which we know at this point represents the one below all and when we're shown this it yet again confirms the breakdown we were given by the trinity guardian glow and goblin who were really the first to show us the connection to the creation of the hulk and how part of that was a manifestation of his pain and anger and when this had happened 
been Jackie McGee's father who they had seen there in hell had told her to look into his eyes which is something as a child he had told her never to do because if you guys remember when the Hulk had destroyed their home when this happened when she was a little girl and they were nearby her father always told her don't look him in the eye like whatever you do do not make eye contact and at the time him telling her this was more so to protect her as a little girl and also mainly telling her to do this in hopes that they don't draw his attention and hopefully he'll go away but at this point in time when they're in hell and the Hulk lashes out he tells her to actually look him in the eye and when she does she gets a completely different result than what her father had initially expected because even here her father had realized that the Hulk's rage was being fueled by pain and with Jackie doing so and asking the Hulk to speak to the Devil Hulk who had been within him before it was shortly after that they realized that neither the Devil Hulk or Bruce Banner were present which she realized with him being able to calm down but also with Bruce Banner not surfacing and it being the daytime which is kind of funny because when she realizes this she's like okay well how long has it been just you which is crazy but also confirms that on the top of that hill that is truly an isolated Bruce Banner who has been separated from the Hulk but also is trapped in this gamma energy between the Hulk, Brian Banner and the one below all. And this is a super crazy reveal because Brian Banner who refers to Bruce as his immortal son, he tells him that the one below all that he can only influence, he needs a host personality in order to speak and act through. Which is what the one below all had initially sought Brian Banner for and used him for and would sacrifice sacrificing his son and giving him to the one below all this would set him free and for Brian Banner who has always hated his son we find out that this has been his objective the whole time to bring Bruce to the one below all and sacrifice his immortal son whose very existence also ties into gamma radiation with him being born of it rather than just being exposed in addition to the gamma explosion which made him the keeper of the green door and all of this makes him the perfect avatar for the one below all to whom throughout the centuries who has been referred to as the breaker of worlds amongst many other names to whom's power is virtually virtually limitless and when he appears and goes for Banner on top of this mountain which is like an altar of sorts she's just looking up like how do we fight something like that and the Hulk just turns around and looks at her like I am that because that's who I am the breaker of worlds the unmatched the unlimited and it's like you want to call this guy the end of the world he's not the end of the world I am but it's crazy because what this does is it set the stage for the Hulk and the one below all to go head to head for the immortal Bruce Banner but in addition to that it also hints that this anomaly being the Hulk whose strength is unlimited could possibly be a close equivalent to the one below all and even almost like a son or perhaps even grandson because as far as Bruce's grandfather the original Brian Banner there is very little to be known about him aside from the descriptions of him being very dark and very abusive to Bruce's father Brian Banner and with Brian Banner explaining to us how the one below all has been using him all these years and not even as an excuse for his actions because Brian Banner also goes on to explain that evil is a choice which is something that's been proven since the dawn of man and also a path that he has chosen a number of times including the time when he murdered his wife in front of Bruce when she tried to escape with the young Bruce and get away from Brian Banner and this is one of those things that separate the Hulk from both Brian Banner and the one below all because aside from his differences with Bruce Banner we've seen a number of times throughout the Immortal Hulk series where the Hulk has mentioned when anyone tries to hurt Banner he takes it personal which is even the more reason why the Hulk needs to win this fight. Alright so picking up from the previous video where I did a breakdown on what exactly the whole sacrificial offering of Bruce Banner was all about and I gotta say much of what we learned around that time especially with all the information that was shared from his father Brian Banner which is something we gotta take in addition to much of the information we've collected throughout this series but with what we've learned so far about Bruce Banner to whom his father refers to as his immortal son but what it does it begins to shed a light on this mystery of what is so important about Bruce Banner and from the time of his transformation to this day there has been no other Hulk like the Hulk who was created in the Gamma incident where Bruce initially hulked out but that's the thing because at this moment with Bruce being brought down there by Brian Banner in order to become a host for the one below all everything that the one below all needs Banner for so does the Hulk which literally created a race to get Banner situation between the one below all and the Hulk himself with both of them being extremely powerful but yet limited without a host and because of the 
perfect storm that Banner is with the radiation incident plus being born with it in his blood through his father and his identity disorder, which I believe is something that comes from his grandfather, but we'll get back to that. But in this phrase to get to Banner, the one below all just starts spewing out like this army of infinite hulks and sending them towards the immortal hulk to hold them off so he can take Banner's body. And I have to say, man, like the way that Joe Bennett illustrates this with all these creatures coming out the one below's mouth and even like a few thousand like to the side kind of drooling off on the edge it is ridiculous like in this shot alone there's probably 14 million 605 of them that the hulk has to fight presumably by himself and when this happens of course rick jones is there and miss mcgee her father is trying to get her away from all this but on the contrary rick jones is like i'm not running and he decides to stay and help the hulk to whom he explains is the only person who's really ever helped him ever and like when rick jones hulks out here you can even see through mid transformation that he is turning out very different than the a-bomb that we're used to and when he fully takes his form there are some similarities mainly the color but even still after that his form is more of like a demonic version of a-bomb to whom nonetheless is still on the side of the hulk and helping him by doing everything he can to get him to banner and like when i seen this i thought it was pretty crazy because it's almost like we got a new version of a-bomb like a new hulk to add to the list and come to think of it, we probably do need to do a 30 plus Hulks 2.0. <laughs> Let me know what y'all think about that down in the comments. But with Rick Jones stepping into the fight and literally risking it all, it's really a nice callback to his past and really how from the day that he met Banner moving forward, whether at the Gamma Test site or even later on as the Hulk, he was the only person who had ever really stepped in or helped him in anything. But the problem is like in this battle, Rick Jones can't really hold up because for many of the reasons that we talked about in the previous video, both about Bruce Banner and the Hulk, Rick Jones just isn't either. So in this huge battle, he really isn't able to hold up. But at the same time that this is happening, along the side of that cliff, you have Puck and the Absorbing Man who have made their way to the top of that cliff or mountain. And mainly because, much like I explained before, Puck has told Absorbing Man how he's really the key and the answer to all this, being that his absorbing abilities got them into it and they can also get them out. And when they're up there, like Carl Krill, he just gets up and just walks away from Puck. Like he just goes in. And you can just see Puck's little head peeping over like, hey man what you doing man oh you trying to get in there like now now because he would much rather for Carl to have a method of attack before just walking in there. And Puck is thinking this because he knows if Carl were to go straight up against Brian Banner, he would just be making his way to be defeated on a level of embarrassment this world has never seen before. Or perhaps it has seen, but you get what I'm saying. But instead what he does is when he gets to the top, he approaches Brian Banner with the seeming intention of fighting him just to get close enough to Bruce Banner and absorb the gamma radiation just to take it back to the Hulk, which gives him all of his gains back and kids don't try this at home but when he does this and he brings the gamma radiation back to the hulk whom he had previously drained before they had entered through the door this turns the tables a full 180 because from there he's able to jump from the river of hulks if you will to which he was fighting through just to stay afloat and make his way back to the top to meet with the one above all brian banner and bruce banner and when he gets there there's no going back and forth he hits his dad and the one below all with the classic thunderclap and pushing them back like a vape trick it's like the first thing that came to mind <laughs> but what this did it didn't kill the one below all it didn't kill brian banner but instead what it did for everyone there is just bought them some time and at this moment with nothing else being more important than creating distance between the one below all and bruce banner this just created a brief moment for the hulk to get banner and everyone can go home but in that moment just before they go back and it kind of reminds me what we had talked about in the last video when i talked about the different intentions from the one below all or between the one below all brian banner and the hulk himself like this moment moment right here just really solidifies some of my theories about the Hulk which were mainly based on a lot of his comments throughout the Immortal Hulk to where we would see time to time when someone threatened Banner or attempted to hurt Banner the Hulk would come to his aid and literally express that he takes that personal and at this moment after pushing back the one below all pushing back Brian Banner and buying them some time Hulk tells Banner since Krill has given him the gamma back which previously was mostly with Banner at the top of the mountain but he lets him know if they're not together they probably won't make it through the door but in this brief moment i really like that hulk just takes the time to tell banner that he gets it he knows that he's scared him for so many years but when it's all said and done he will protect banner at any cost and the reason before that is because he loves them they're like family and no one knows the two of them like they know each other and in the case of the hulk who was literally molded and shaped and formed from the essence of who bruce banner is and from there mixed with the science that's borderline magic as far as when we get into gamma radiation he's connected and he understands bruce to 
his core. And when he tells him this, it really brings a lot of things full circle because at the end of the day, they need each other. They will always be a part of each other. And when Bruce accepts to merge back with him, it's a lot like Bruce accepting a part of himself to which in the past he would either try to get rid of or lock away. But also on top of this, when we get to the others who also got back, and when this happened, everybody else who was around, like Jackie McGee's father and whatever was left of Rick Jones, it's almost like they had been dusted, being essentially that they were just spirits without a body. But also when they get back, Carl Creel is invited by Puck to join Gamma Flight, which is an idea and invitation he just came up with off the fly. And when Walter Lingowski is like, wait a minute, we can't officially just, Puck just cuts right back in, it's like, no, we're doing this, it's a thing. But in the case of Jackie McGee, who mentions that she just wants time alone to process all of this, like she's not even gonna put it on the books. Like she had just seen her father again, and on top of that, he just got Gamma dusted. So for her, it's a traumatic experience seeing him and losing him all over again. But in addition to that, it's like, why bring this to anyone at this moment? Because one, it's a crazy story, who will believe it? And two, at this current moment, none of these guys know where Banner is, which is something that we see Bushwhacker off in the distance is taking a note of, as we see him in the distance using his scope, which is literally a part of his arm, to view in and mouth read the conversation, because he hasn't even given up on his mission, not even after all that, <laughs> but he hasn't given up his mission on trying to find Bruce Banner, to whom at this current time has made his way from Nevada to California, and I guess in search of a phone booth, which just makes me think, like, I haven't been to Cali in a while, but I can't tell you the last time I seen a phone booth in North America, and if one of you guys happens to know where one is, like, take a selfie with it, send it to me on Twitter, I'll definitely retweet it. But as far as Banner who makes his way to California, and it's possible that he may have cried the whole way there, we don't know. But what we find out, when he gets to this phone, he makes a call to Betty, to whom the last we had seen, I believe, is around the funeral of Bruce Banner around Civil War II. But prior to that, the last time her and Bruce had spoke, or actually when she had spoken to Bruce and the Hulk, well actually the Hulk, then Bruce, I believe it was prior to that around the time of Secret Wars. Because back at this time, when the Hulk was going through the whole Doc Green persona, which was your intelligent Hulk, but not quite like the one we have in Immortal Hulk, or even your Professor Hulk, but that just feeds back into the whole identity disorder, which for one was mainly caused by extremists, which then manifested this specific persona, but I also gotta say I hope that Immortal Hulk goes forward and uses like Jackie McGee, who is at this time obsessed with understanding the Hulk and further explores some of the other personalities that we really haven't gotten that much of an explanation for. But as far as Betty Ross, to whom back at this time was depowered by Doc Green, because at the time Doc Green was pretty much depowering every Hulk except for himself, which initially started with Rick Jones, who was the first to be depowered, and later it made his way to Betty, who he had slipped the cure in her food, and after doing this, knowing later that when they fought, she would exhaust out her power, and this quote, cure would eventually kick in. And sometime after that, Betty had made her peace both between the Hulk, or Doc Green, I should say, he doesn't like being called Hulk, but I will give him his props, at least he got a cell phone. <laughs> but Betty had made her peace both between him and Banner, with Doc Green apologizing for depowering her, and then also right after, turning back to Bruce, at her request to see Bruce again. Which is just a little catch up as far as where they left off prior to his death in Civil War 2 and possibly where they'll be picking back up again or not who knows because you know calling a girl crying ain't exactly the most romantic gesture that a man could do what are you doing? I'm, I'm sorry Alex but I love you I love you what you, just what did I do wrong just tell me what I did wrong dude you're doing it right now <laughs> and just in time for Valentine's Day. <laughs> but that'll do it for this one, guys. The Hulk is back. The one below all is gone for now. And this quick little round trip to hell that gave us all this information really came at the perfect time because the Hulk is back just in time for the party. But oh, that reminds me because I did want to circle back to this because in that moment before the Hulk just clapped away Brian Banner and the one below all, Brian Banner tells the Hulk that he was never his son. And although it's not a lot to say, it this makes the whole sacrifice and everything just make a lot more sense with Bruce Banner being the actual son of Brian Banner and the Hulk being the son of the one below all. And if you think about it, this really brings everything home because with Brian Banner who had been working on gamma radiation so much and being heavily exposed to it slowly in small doses over a amount of time, when he genetically passed this on to Bruce who had shown early signs of communication with the one below all. Oh, and I just remember Brian Banner did have an accident at his job, but it wasn't nearly the size of the Bama bomb. But with this long exposure to gamma radiation and him passing that down to Bruce and then 
Bruce later experiencing the gamma radiation explosion, because remember, when it comes to gamma radiation, the one below all is a part of it on a subatomic level, and his being is the third factor of all gamma radiation, which from birth is a part of Bruce's DNA, but also your key ingredient to the manifestation of the Hulk himself. And this is mainly what Brian Banner was trying to explain to the Hulk before he got clapped off the hill. And I'm pretty sure much like Brian Banner had explained before, the one below all had been planning this, the same way that he had been using Brian Banner, and I would even go as far to say been using his father, Bruce's grandfather, to steer him in this direction so that eventually a child would be born with gamma radiation in his blood all the way down to his DNA to which the one below all could use as a host. Alright, so kicking this one off and starting really from our whole conversation of the Hulk's all-inclusive round trip to hell, to where throughout that narrative we found out a lot. We got a reveal about the one below all and his connections throughout the history of the Hulk, which is a bit of a soft retcon because it doesn't necessarily change a lot of the history of the Hulk that we revisited on this playlist and much of what I covered in other Hulk videos, but with Ewing using the method of the addition of this character becoming the motive or the explanation or the reason for prior events, in addition to the explanation for the new changes that we're seeing in the series, with the Hulk only coming out at night, we're getting a number of examples of his insane immortality and regeneration, and a clearer understanding of who the Hulk is and his motives, in addition to the chaos that is explaining his powers and how those have affected the people around him. And so now one of the last things that we talked about, like after the whole trip to hell and him coming back, and then not long after him coming back, him reaching out to Betty Ross for help. And so jumping over to Betty, we pick up with her at the funeral of her father, General Thunderbolt Ross, to whom I want to say is like his third time being buried here <laughs> comic books i tell you <laughs> but i like that they at least acknowledge it within the series but as far as the death of general ross this is one of those things that we had seen back when the hulk was in hell with jackie mcgee and she had seen her father and while they were down there they'd even seen rick jones who's the kid that banner originally had attempted to save at this test site where the hulk was born and rick has been through some changes since becoming the hulk known as a bomb to where later on he was depowered which is something that's actually pretty notable in connection to his death and as far as his death i feel like i need to get into a a bit about how he died or Betty at the connecting pieces to why he was killed and this is something that had taken place early on within the event of Secret Empire because not long after Rick Jones was depowered one of the side effects of him being depowered actually had given him the ability of an advanced learning curve to which he used to become a talented hacker going under the alias of Whisperer to where at one point Steve Rogers tricked Rick Jones to leak information from S.H.I.E.L.D. which was like your wake-up call for Rick Jones to know that okay this ain't your regular Captain America so then sometime after that he leaked information about Steve Steve Rogers not being truly Steve Rogers, or I believe better yet at the time he believed Steve Rogers was brainwashed. But with Rick sending out these leaks and then not telling Steve who he sent them to, Steve Rogers then made an example out of him by having him publicly executed. So where at the time Rick's last words were Avengers Assemble, and it's kind of messed up man because he never got to see Avengers Endgame. <laughs> but no, for real, it was an honorable death. And as far as in Immortal Hulk, just as a quick reminder, when the Hulk was in hell and the Hulk had seen Rick Jones and he had also seen General Ross, though in that form they were hollow shells of themselves, Ross had made his attempt to tell the Hulk a message about Rick Jones that didn't quite make it through, while attempting to tell the Hulk powerful forces in association with A-Bomb, but his words were broken up and the message never quite made it across. But so now getting back to Betty at her father's funeral, at which Tony Stark is given the eulogy and he's like side eyeing the coffin like something finished jump out and rightfully so because like i said this is like the third time and i like that how this is done like people know that but also at general ross's funeral we have the arrival of general fortin who's pretty much taken general ross's place as general after his death again <laughs> but i'm saying like this dude he has shown before that he can hold his own against a hulk in general ross the red hulk for example because back at the time in like 2011 hulk volume 2 and around like issue 30 or something like that we were given the introduction of reginald 14 and the way that his narrative surfaced like prior to this point he had only been assigned to working with general ross to track down bruce banner and throughout that time reginald was general ross's number one guy and so now if you guys remember going back to like your 2011 hulk volume 2 issues there was this big mystery of who is the red hulk and when i tell you it was huge like everybody was trying to figure out who is this hulk because one of the biggest misleads at the time was the life model decoy of general ross who was running around at the same time just rossing it up and so when the red hulk had killed this life model decoy of general ross reginald was soon after promoted to general and he swore his revenge on the red hulk because prior to the red hulk stepping on the scene general ross was like a mentor to 14 but throughout the course 
most of those issues, we got to see some nice matchups where he didn't die. But fast forward to today, General 14 is now head of US Hulk operations, of which we've had glimpses of prior to this point, with this organization working closely with Shadow Base, who not too long ago cut the Hulk up and put him in different little jars. And from our last talk about that, of course it didn't work out too well, but the information that they did collect during that time, it had actually worked in their favor to serve as like a Rosetta Stone for them to use in reference for either manufacturing new hulks or augmenting existing ones. And so as of right now, he's been pulling some big strings in the background throughout the course of the Immortal Hulk series. And so now towards the end of the funeral, Betty has a conversation with Tony Stark to where more or less he tries to assure her that the incident that had taken place in Iowa when the Hulk wrecked the Avengers, that he feels that it didn't necessarily have to go down that way. Because at the end of the day, the Avengers are his friends. And speaking of the Avengers, let's talk about Cap for a second because I'm pretty sure that guy's a war criminal. And the reason I say why is because at this moment, in your current running series of Captain America, Steve Rogers is dealing with some crazy repercussions which has spilled over from Secret Empire and to go even further at this moment as far as public record, it's believed that he's responsible for the murder of General Thunderbolt Ross, of which he was obviously framed for, but with how it was set up, everything points to him. And so for that reason, he didn't quite make it to the funeral. But from here, following Betty after the funeral and her turning on a ride from Tony Stark, and she does so so she can leave low key and head out to her cabin and meet with Bruce Banner. And even with doing so, she's well aware that, you know, she's Betty Ross. So for that reason, everyone who's looking for Banner, they're definitely gonna follow her to get to him. So she's taking precautions. Oh, and I gotta say that when she sees him and she kisses him, it's very much a nod to the last time that I believe they'd seen each other back when your Doc Green Hulk allowed Betty to talk with Banner, much like we had talked about not long ago on the Immortal Hulk playlist. But surely enough, when Betty arrives here at her cabin, her and Banner are being watched by Agent Burbank, who has them in his sights with the heat vision scope in his forearm. Because remember, he makes guns with his hands and stuff. Pew pew. And while he's there staking them out, he's of course taking his orders from General 14. And Burbank, who wants to take the shot and requests permission to shoot through Betty, to which 14 is like negative, because with Ross really being dead this time, the last thing 14 wants to do is be responsible for sending Ross's daughter to go meet him. And so now, as far as the precautions that Betty's made in order to have a place where her and Banner can speak without 14 and eavesdropping, she has relics around that block psychic remote viewers, and so that's what she uses to keep out the eyes and ears of Agent 14, who uses psychic remote viewers like hardwired to his monitors, it's crazy. But even with that precaution being taken, you still have the threat of thermal vision, which makes choosing the right target a 50-50 gamble, which is a gamble that 14 does not want to take. But Burbank, on the other hand, he's like, I'll roll the dice on this one. And he chooses wrong and shoots Betty right in front of Banner, to where as I'm sure you can guess, didn't sit well with Banner. And Burbank, who's a bit delusional at this point in time, and not even so much delusional, but just making bad choices this night, like I'm sure he's made many a nights in his past. But with it being nighttime, 14 had advised him to fall back because the night is when the Hulk comes out, and the immortal Hulk at that, which is like page one of briefing. And, and Burbank, who's delusional once again, he's like, no, no, I'm good, I can take him. And I don't know about you, but for me, the first thing I'm thinking is like, dude, don't you remember when you went to hell with this guy? And while in hell, this dude punched the sky like he pretty much beat up all of hell and then came back so with that said like what in the world makes you think he gonna let this fly on earth and so with the hulk tearing through the cabin and getting half of his head blown off but yet and still coming after burbank at the last second burbank is saved by Doc Sampson. And I use the term saved loosely, because when I say saved, I mean like thrown into a tree. But with all things considered, it is better than possibly being eaten by the Immortal Hulk. But with Doc Sampson arriving here, the issue is the Hulk has a huge chunk of his head missing. And it isn't until that portion of his brain grows back that he mindlessly beats the mess out of Doc Sampson. And it isn't until enough of his mind regenerates back to where he's like, okay, maybe I shouldn't beat the mess out of this guy. But for the Hulk, it isn't until he gains enough of his senses back to where he's able to talk to Doc Sampson and they realized going back to the cabin that Betty who was shot minutes ago had just gotten up and left. And so now from here, I want to jump over to Jackie McGee, to whom at this point in time is kind of thumbing through the autobiography of Rick Jones, and in doing so, she's still following the Hulk, but doing so at a distance, and like not as close up as before. And this is an issue with her editor Murray, because he wants a breaking story, and he wants the old Jackie back. Like literally, you're Jackie who would follow the Hulk to hell and back. But that experience was the reason why she had fell back, because it was traumatizing, especially with seeing her father. But with Murray informing Jackie about the incident that had taken place at Betty's cabin, her curiosity 
curiosity got the best of her and she had to go check it out. And when she arrives there, the detectives are pretty candid with just giving her information, of which the detective on the scene only really does because he's having trouble piecing together what exactly happened there too. And as far as Hulk experts go, talking to Jackie McGee is his best chance of piecing this together. And it's here that he informs Jackie that someone was shot in this cabin before it was smashed to pieces, but they had also found these red feathers that were left behind just before something else had made an exit from the other end of this cabin. And during the time that they're having this conversation, they're being watched over by a shadowy figure that only true Hulk veterans will recognize. Alright, so picking up where I left off about the untimely death of Betty when she had been sniped by Agent Burbank, who was actually aiming for Banner, and regardless of being ordered to stand down, Burbank still took the risk and took the shot, which of course led him to shooting the wrong heat signature and killing Betty, which then brought Burbank a whole lot of trouble that he ain't trying to see right now. And aside from shooting a hole in the Hulk's head and then mentioning he's gonna go toe to toe with the Hulk to where at this point Burbank is talking like a piece of his brain missing cause I can name 30 plus Hulks that you couldn't hang with on a worse day. But it was at this moment that Burbank got like that answered prayer of every person who can't fight. <laughs> like when they stand in the face of destruction they just hoping that somebody will intervene. And for Burbank this is exactly what happened when we got the arrival of Doc Samson. And so now as far as Doc Samson who has died in the past before as well because if we go back to Incredible Hulks 610 and back at the time we got a few similarities that kind of are lingering around here because one Betty died after being killed by Scar the son of the Hulk but also around this time you got your heroic ending from Doc Samson to whom back around this time during World War Hulks he was a bit of a questionable character he had been placed under mind control by MODOK which gave him this duality to where you have your evil side which was Samson then your side that was good that was just known as Leonard but at this point in time with Betty's death Samson had kind of saved her by saying all you have to do is make her angry which I would more so say at the time barred her back from the brink of death more so than like an official resurrection because when it comes to Hulk you gotta earn those we ain't just giving them out around here but also at the time she had lashed out on Samson mostly at her frustration at his involvement of her initial transformation but fast forward to a point in time later within World War Hulks when it came down to the point of Bruce Banner needing to absorb all the energy from the Hulk out heroes because essentially he was the only one who could do it and not be killed while this procedure was going underway, the time was cutting close so Doc Samson had stepped in because the machinery was going to fail before the procedure was complete. But with him stepping in and absorbing what he could, it ended up killing him. But as it turned out, with his death here, it was the last of any influence that MODOK had had on him. But back at this time with him helping Banner out, Doc Samson was able to absorb some of the energy and help the machine hold out, long enough to restore all the heroes back to normal, which had also gave Banner the opportunity to absorb the rest of the energy, finally turning him back into the Hulk who hadn't shown up in some time and back then wasn't nobody happier about this than Scar who just wanted to fight him and kill him. <laughs> Kids these days. And so after this Doc Samson who was brought back briefly during the time of Chaos War. And during Chaos War, a lot of people had came back. Banner's parents, both Brian and Rebecca Banner. And like, that's how we had got our original face off with the Devil Hulk. And overall around this time, there were a lot of people who were brought back from the dead, like throughout the whole entire Marvel Universe. And mainly because of the Chaos King's assault on the realms of the dead, which freed a lot of people during this time, but it was only temporary. So then at the conclusion of Chaos War, a lot of those people went back to the respective realms. And at the time, that was very much the same case for Doc Samson. So now fast forward to like Civil War 2, like not too long before the Hulk was killed by Hawkeye. It was towards the beginning of Civil War 2 where we had got the return of Doc Samson to where at the time we didn't get much of an explanation how he came back and at that time when he returned he really didn't go into much detail about it because Captain Marvel was like I heard you died and he was like yeah I did but I'm better now and I'm telling you I couldn't have been at the Triskelion like typing at the computer I would have looked over my shoulder like well y'all ain't gonna ask him no more questions? Like how you just gonna die and come back like that? Like who you think you is? Duncan McClellan? out of the clam cloud and for those of you that didn't catch that that's an old highlander thing you know you know highlander there can be only one i mean like if you ain't get it, it's okay it's okay i'm a little angry on the inside but it's all right but more or less at this time, Doc Samson had only described where he's at as being in between balancing his life as a superhero and as a psychoanalyst. And that's really all we have been given up until this point. And that's one of the things I mean when I talk about how I appreciate Al Ewing bringing in either new concepts or ideas or returning characters, but doing so with tying them to pre-existing events. But so with Doc Samson returning now and speaking to the Hulk, he explains to him that process filling in all the gaps from his return to the land of the living, 
all the way up to this point. And essentially he mentions that he was in darkness and then he saw a green door which he just walked through and just like that he was back. And so keep in mind at this point in time for Doc Samson he doesn't have all the answers that we've seen throughout the course of Immortal Hulk. So initially at the time of his resurrection he went to see S.H.I.E.L.D. and they had tested and cleared him. He had no more influence from MODOK or the leader but even still they didn't have all the answers to how exactly he came back. But with him going to S.H.I.E.L.D. initially to try and get these answers this is how Carol Danvers discovered he was back when she made her request to see him back at the beginning of Civil War 2. But aside from his appearance at the time meeting up with her at the Triskelion, he had laid low for the most part but he was still aware of things that were happening and going on. Like Amadeus Cho curing Banner and becoming the new Hulk to which at the time Doc Samson admits that he believed that Banner had some unexpressed feelings about that taking place. But with him going back and forth at the idea of actually confronting Banner and asking him about it, news broke that the Hulk had been killed and Doc Samson had felt like he had missed his opportunity to get these answers and make this evaluation with his good friend. But it wasn't really till later to the death of Rick Jones when Doc Samson had ran across Betty who immediately thought he was still under MODOK's control. <laughs> but after bumping into her at Rick Jones gravesite, it was really from there that they began to keep in touch and after some time after having communication with Betty, this is how Doc Samson began to hear about the Hulk sightings and this is where he initially became aware that Banner had returned from the dead. And so now initially explaining all of this to the Hulk was pretty rough because the Hulk had a piece of his brain missing and through most of the conversation Doc Samson was getting the mess beat out of him. So because of that the Doc had to take some hits while waiting for the Hulk to be able to respond properly. And when he does the first thing that he mentions to Doc Samson is Betty. And when they go back to check on her they see that she's gone and much like in World War Hulks when Doc Samson had mentioned that Betty's not dead he mentions the same thing here. But in addition to her body being missing, they also notice a hole in the other side of the house which is where she likely made her exit during all the other commotion. But it's also at this time that Hulk tells Doc that he knew that Banner seeing Betty at this time was a bad idea. And it's here where Doc Samson pries a bit further about the Hulk's communication with Banner and the Hulk elaborates telling Doc about the Hulk that got out during Secret Empire and telling Doc how that Hulk who was helping Hydra was completely unhinged but then telling Doc that he doesn't have to worry about it because that thing is in peace pieces locked away where this Hulk used to be. And this whole mention of locking a Hulk away and sending another one free, it intrigues Doc Samson because recently he's been asking around and he's spoken to Tony Stark and more specifically about the incident that we talked about earlier on the playlist when the Hulk had wrecked the Avengers to where at the time that Hulk had specifically responded to Devil Hulk. And when he had heard this from Tony, this reminded Doc Samson of a time where Bruce had told Doc that there was a Hulk that he had specifically locked away in his mind that Bruce had also referred to as a devil Hulk. And he remembers Bruce mentioning that he needed to lock him away because if he had ever let him out that he would destroy the world. And so for Doc Samson just really trying to get to the bottom of this, he tells the Hulk, hey, look me in my lumped up eye and tell me are you that devil Hulk and the Hulk's almost like well it took you a while to figure that out <laughs> but he also goes on to explain to him as they leave because the Hulk tells him that there's somewhere they gotta be but from here I like how Doc Samson asked a question without asking a question because he can tell at this point that the immortal Hulk is sick and tired of answering these questions and <laughs> so Doc Samson just mentions well gee I'm glad that you ain't trying to destroy the world then he just waits to kind of see what he's gonna say <laughs> you know just waiting for that answer <laughs> but then he kind of gets the same answer that he feared but not exactly in the way that he expected because the immortal Hulk then tells him that oh yeah the human race it gotta go but from his new perspective it's more so towards the reasoning of the human race is already taking themselves out and they're doing a great job at it and on top of that he also believes that the humans are too weak and too puny to even admit that they're destroying themselves but on the contrary if the immortal Hulk were to take care of it then in the end when it's all said and done there will actually be more survivors and so now I'd have to say the crazy thing about this whole explanation is that it actually lines up with what the Hulk said back in Avengers No Surrender because it was back at that time where this most recent incarnation of the Hulk, the immortal Hulk, really took his strides and moved in this direction. And so now Doc Samson just kind of got his blank stare like oh word? Yo that's crazy. <laughs> and it's funny because with the Hulk telling him this like what he gonna do? Like the best chance that he has is to talk the Hulk down and have him do the least amount of damage as possible. And Samson is aware of that because he knows just a few minutes ago he got lumped up before. He don't want to get lumped up again. So he knows that he got to take a more psychological approach. But so when they arrive at the cemetery and when they get there Samson knows immediately where they're at. And much to a surprise because initially Samson thought they was going to go after Betty. But Hulk's like no you don't have to worry about Betty. She took a bullet to the head and ran through a wall. She's fine. In the same way that you died 
died, came back, and you're fine. The same with Banner. And now, as the same it is with Rick Jones. Because apparently, everyone who has been a Hulk, in some way or form, is capable of coming back from the dead. And this they see as they look over Rick Jones' empty grave. But as it turns out, Rick Jones didn't just get up and walk out of here. But actually, he was taken by Shadow Base, or better yet, taken to Shadow Base Site B under the orders of General 14. And they've been making their attempts to revive him by using the gamma saturated remains of Emil Blonsky to revive and then weaponize Rick Jones. And it's crazy because throughout the course of this process, it's almost as if the two of them can sense each other while this is happening. With Rick sensing something or someone who doesn't want to be human, and it's someone or something very angry. And that is crazy. Alright, so just jumping right back in where we left off, with Doc Samson having caught up with the Hulk shortly after Bushwhacker has shot Betty Ross, to where immediately after in their search for Rick Jones, it's here that they discover that his body's missing. And so now prior to this point, we've talked about Shadow Base taking his body and what exactly their plans were for him, with them placing like an exoskeleton of the Abomination on top of the body of Rick Jones. But when this happened, I remember you guys asking like what happened to the Abomination? Like how'd he die? How'd he come back? So I want to clear that up a bit as well. And so to do this properly, I got to start with S.H.I.E.L.D. Volume 1 back in 2010, because it really feels like Marvel is taking these new things and tying them into a lot of issues which people just looked over. But back in 2010, Volume 1 of S.H.I.E.L.D it gave us this narrative of S.H.I.E.L.D. being around for thousands of years. So what at the time, if I remember correctly, it was called like the Brotherhood of S.H.I.E.L.D. and it was pieced together whether it was powerful people or brilliant minds who would team up to stop world ending threats and things of that nature. And at one point, Apocalypse was even a part of the Brotherhood of S.H.I.E.L.D. or at least he fought with them at one point. And I gotta say, I kind of feel like Jonathan Hickman is gonna tie that into what he's shown us already in House of X with us also seeing Apocalypse saving the world from these invasions in Krakoa, which is one thing I'm definitely looking forward to seeing more about. But when this began back in early 2600 BC, this resistance was led by a great warrior named Imhotep to whom in his honor the Brotherhood of S.H.I.E.L.D. was named after. And in this battle where they defeated the Brood who had killed the Pharaoh at that time, Imhotep's victory in killing the Queen is really what set the stage and began the whole movement for this Brotherhood to begin. And naming the Brotherhood S.H.I.E.L.D. after his S.H.I.E.L.D. rather than the acronym abbreviation we know it for today, but even with doing this and the bird which is on his S.H.I.E.L.D. which at the time were actually in reference to Khonshu and S.H.I.E.L.D. was just rocking it for years like whatever but the way that this all comes back to the abomination who has seen a fair amount of deaths himself but after being killed by the red hulk general ross who had did this in retaliation for the abomination playing his part in the death of betty ross but after dying he came back during the course of chaos war which is a pretty substantial event because i feel like it keeps coming back with immortal hulk you have your john proud star references with mr sinister and powers of 10 and house of x like it really feels like the chaos king is gonna make a return at some point but we'll save those thoughts for later on in this video but at this time in Chaos War when Abomination came back and a lot of people were raised from the dead within Chaos War. But this run for the Abomination was shortly ended when he was killed by Marlo Chandler, the ex-wife of Rick Jones, who at one point in time was possessed by Lady Death, which is what gave her the power to be able to do so. And so now going from Incredible Hulks to Hulk Volume 3, the Brotherhood of S.H.I.E.L.D. put the Abomination back together and revived him by using Bruce Banner's blood. But even with doing so, the Abomination wasn't completely himself. But the reason why the Brotherhood had brought him back, it was mainly just to use him in order to retrieve the Hulk. But when this had happened, the Avengers stepped in and Tony Stark had used some technology from the Brotherhood, which he had used against the Abomination, which teleported the Abomination to where Tony said he would get was somewhere around Jupiter and for some time that's pretty much where much of his remains were just kind of floating and that's where Shadow Base had retrieved the remains of the Abomination which they had taken back to Shadow Base B to study an experiment bonded with Rick Jones and so at this point in time with the Hulk and Doc Samson who had just discovered that Rick Jones body was missing which brings them both to Shadow Base A which is where the Hulk believes that Rick Jones is located because this is where the Hulk was taken when they chopped him up into pieces with the adamantium scalpel which as a result didn't end well for anybody at Shadow Base A, which is why the place is already completely wrecked. And upon their arrival, they had to face off with all kind of Hulk experiments, which had turned out to really just be a tool to let General 14 know that the Hulk was on to the whereabouts of Rick Jones. And so at this point, you have Jackie McGee, who's at the house where Betty was shot, speaking to investigators, trying to figure out what's going on. And it's here that Betty Ross reveals herself to Jackie in this new Harpy slash Red Hulk form. 
And so now as for Hulk and Doc Sanson, who at this point get separated, because with them coming to Shadow Base A, it was more or less a trap, with Rick Jones actually being located at Shadow Base B. And this was something that General 14 was counting on, one, to distract the Hulk, but also to bring him here so they can weaken him with sunlight so that Agent Burbank, aka Bushwhacker, could kill him, chop him up in little pieces, and just bring him to Shadow Base B. But with doing this, this gives us something pretty crazy for the first time, which we will see repeatedly throughout Mortal Hulk and even in Absolute Carnage, because at this time, this gives us Joe Fixit the opportunity to make his way to the surface, but in the form of Bruce Banner. And he makes his way out of there by shading on a notepad where somebody had written the username and password on which is really like one of your oldest tricks in the book but he uses this to hack into the system and switch the lighting from ultraviolet wavelengths into gamma which essentially bring back the stronger hulk and at one point what seemed to be more than one hulk like rising to the surface but with joe fix it doing this he literally fixed the situation and created the opportunity for the stronger hulk to get them out of there and so now jumping forward eight days later after this banner's consciousness rises back to the surface to where he finds himself in the back of a cab wearing an outfit that joe fix it would wear but just in a size that would fit banner but at this point in time joe fix it pretty much sent banner on a path with a couple clues leaving banner to figure out the rest but all the while during this time general 14 has already bonded rick jones with the abomination and sent him after the hulk but during this time where bruce is figuring things out we find that he's made a list of the different hulks that have been surfacing lately and the ones that are missing with it showing us that both himself and joe fixit both appear in the form of bruce banner while in hulk form you also have your devil hulk and your savage slash childlike hulk which has shown up but on your missing slash dormant you're still missing professor hulk and also your green scar hulk who's also known as your world breaker hulk and as we know, there are plenty more Hulks who need to go on this list, like there's Clough from Axis. There's also your Doc Green Extremist Hulk, and I'm sure Banner was getting to the point of adding those to the list, but at this point in time we're being shown that not only are different Hulks appearing more frequently, but also that some are appearing in different manifestations, most notably with Joe Fixit recently making two appearances in the form of Bruce Banner. But in the middle of Banner having this conversation with the Immortal Hulk, they're met by Rick Jones within the Abomination Exoskeleton, which mind you, the portion which is partially the Abomination who was given a sample of Banner's blood, and even back at the time of his origin, back in Tales to Astonish, he received a high level of gamma radiation during one of Banner's experiments, which at the time, in the late 60s, it made him stronger than Hulk in his initial transformation. And I mean, fast forward to now, Hulk is still the strongest one there is, but I believe a lot of this history, it gives us some interesting terms to the outcome of this fight. Because in addition to this, you also have Rick Jones, who's trying to fight this other part of him that's the abomination, but this very combination is very much like science has perverted nature with the way that these two are being forced to act as one. And so when he hits the Hulk with his digestive secretions, which is pretty much stomach acid, which for regular people is hydrochloric acid surrounded by a mucous membrane, but for Hulks, who knows? But when it makes contact with the Hulk, it breaks him down and he does not heal. And with doing so, it really doesn't kill him either, but rather it kind of just leaves him in this in-between state. And so at this point when Betty Ross and Jackie McGee arrive, Betty just rips out his heart and she eats it. Which is on one hand, exactly what General 14 had wanted, but in the case of Betty, this was actually her helping the Hulk, who at this point in time was stuck in the point where he couldn't die, but at the same time he couldn't heal. And I gotta say that it's likely that this was possible in the first place because of the history of the Hulk's DNA being a part of the abomination up to this point because of what had taken place with the Brotherhood of S.H.I.E.L.D. who for the record is very separate from General 14 and his resources at Shadow Base. And so now when this happens we see Banner in the below place face to face with Brian Banner and it's here that we find out through Brian Banner that this is where Bruce or any other Hulk comes every time that they die. And this is something as the reader we already knew but with Brian explaining this to Bruce it more so just solidifies what we've seen already in Mortal Hulk. But at this point in time with Bruce arriving here after his latest death he's curious to know like if he really ever left here and Brian explains to him that ever since the initial gamma explosion Bruce has never truly left this place because that initial gamma explosion was his first death which unlocked the connection which was already in his blood and as you guys know because we talked about previously on this playlist like the history with Brian Banner discovering the one below all to where he later learned that here is where all gamma radiation comes from and even all the crazy ways that the one below all is connected and is literally a part of gamma radiation on a molecular level like Brian Banner takes all of this and tries to give it to Bruce at one time and it's a lot for him to take in especially with brian banner telling him that he is himself and he's also the one below all but even still as brian banner he's stuck here in this place yearning to return and bring the one below all with them and so with bruce who feels like okay you stuck here and you deserve to be stuck here alone 
but the thing is he's not alone and just like that for a brief moment Bruce sees a glimpse of his mother but then he's instantly snatched back to the land of the living once the Hulk reawakens and much to the thanks of Betty killing him so that he could fully go through the resurrection process but after returning back and taking down the abomination with the help of Betty and also fighting off General 14's men the Hulk is then able to separate Rick Jones from the abomination by literally just ripping him out which is something he had time to do because of General 14 pulling back his men at the arrival of Gamma Flight who at this point in time collected the remains of the abomination and took them to the Alpha Flight space station and I gotta tell you man like the remains of the abomination like they have been a place or two like they get around and so now from here getting back to General 14 who had to pull back and leave essentially because he didn't want to expose Shadow Base with them having an altercation with Gamma Flight and even though members of Gamma Flight already know of Shadow Base if he were to go toe to toe with them then they're gonna call in Alpha Flight and then from Alpha Flight Carol Danvers is gonna call the Avengers and that's just gonna bring way more problems than he has the means and resources to deal with but speaking of means and resources we see general 14 with his own hulk buster like suit gearing up to do a quick snatch and grab into the alpha flight space station which isn't heavily populated but he's doing so in order to retrieve the remains of the abomination because he believes he can pilot it much better than rick jones and then essentially use it to take down the hulk and so now with this technology which is what I believe that they used to retrieve the remains of the abomination back when Tony Stark sent the abomination to Jupiter in a very violent dismantling way but I believe it's the same technology that Shadow Base is using to send General 14 to the Alpha Flight space station much like how they retrieved the remains of the abomination from Jupiter but in this case with it being a much more confined space the risk is much higher but he's willing to take it in order to win and when he arrives he just pops up on Titania and Absorbing Man rendering them unconscious which tranquilizers that had a titanium needle delivery system in order to put them down and give them enough time to get what he came for but when he came across Walter Langowski he just tells him about a specific Sasquatch incident in Minnesota which left Ford dead and because of this General 14 he hits Walter Langowski with a lethal round and when General 14 does this it's like he doesn't feel anything like to him he doesn't even consider Langowski human and he just calls in for Shadow Base to pick him up he tells him there's no human casualties and it's like Shadow Base they know this guy and so like when they respond they're like what do you mean no human casualties oh what did you do and it's like i can imagine somebody with a headset just leaned over covered the mic and like oh he done shot somebody with powers dog because they know this guy's track record and they know that he's one that's willing to do whatever it takes and not like captain america's speech whatever it takes but i mean like blind leap after blind leap I'm like why did you kick the door down it was unlocked type of guy you know what i'm saying but it's even got to the point to where one of his lead technicians dr mcgowan who advised him to not to do the jump because it was too dangerous and who had also advised him not to merge with the abomination but 14 doesn't care and he knows she's going to report him to the pentagon but aside from the pentagon he doesn't have to answer to anyone and he knows because of the arrangement he has with the pentagon that they'll green light pretty much any decision that he makes as long as he keeps it contained and there's no fingers pointing back to who's funding this organization so when he's told that she's going to report him he really doesn't care because he's still going to do what he believes needs to be done and at this point he's pretty much like hey alexa play little uzi vert because now i do what i want <laughs> and from here he merges merges with the abomination which he successfully does but it's like the riskiest dumbest thing he's ever done but with doing so he immediately appears to have more control than rick jones and mainly with him not fighting against the abomination but at this point definitely treading in an unknown territory but even with doing this he would swear to dr mcgowan that he was absolutely in control and that there was no need to run any extra tests but rather he was ready to get out there and use this thing as a weapon even though the snot blood dripping from his nose said otherwise but back with the remaining members of gamma flight who are still dealing with the recent death of walter langowski aka Sasquatch and at this point in time it's like a week later from when he passed and with him not waking up as of yet they decide to put him in suspended animation but this doesn't happen without much finger pointing at Doc Samson and much of it is coming from Titania even though Puck is actually closer to Lingowski he's actually holding on to hope that Lingowski will pull through but with Titania she's mad about getting shot with the needles that probably have morphine in them and her husband absorbing man is like nah 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 I've been clean for a while but that 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 was definitely morphine <laughs> that joke wasn't no joke and <laughs> like he's clearly related a little bit too much information and so now from here we go over to jackie betty rick and bruce to where at this point they're just moving and laying low in the motel and all the while just kind of watching rick jones body hoping that he'll come back with betty keeping a close eye on him and bruce right outside the door and jackie somewhere in the living room just bugging out but at this point where bruce comes to the door to speak to betty and she appears to him in her harpy form and he asks her if she's able to turn back and she tells him that he can but even though she can she tells him that she doesn't want to and mainly because much like she expressed a number of times 
but to Jackie prior to this point, she believes that this is the true her. But almost in the blink of an eye, Joe Fixit takes over Bruce and he tells her that he likes to look and he admits that he wishes he had some claws and feathers himself. But this really just feeds into that drastic difference between like your immortal Hulk and Bruce and Joe Fixit. Because your green Hulk who we've seen of late, he has much more in common and way better communication with Bruce than Joe Fixit. And we see a bit more of that when Joe Fixit goes to talk to Jackie McGee because when he goes to speak to her, she actually asks him like, where do I stand with you? And meaning Joe Fixit, but mainly asking because she wants to know where she stands with all three of them or at least the three that she's met to this point and as this conversation leads outside i do gotta mention like joe fixit is showing an improvement in his tolerance to uv rays and of course part of that is with him coming out in banner form but even still it's almost like he's adapting with using banner's body in this unorthodox way but as far as what he tells jackie as far as banner himself and the green guy it's first that banner doesn't like her and it's probably because she wants to be a hulk so bad but with banner not liking her that scores points with joe who's really just getting to know her and as far as the green guy he likes her mainly because though she's afraid of all of them she's still able to confront them and speak her mind but in the middle of this conversation rick jones bucket naked just jumps out the bathtub glowing and he's like look i know where they're at <laughs> And by them, of course, he's referring to General 14 because for Rick Jones, at this point, he remembers everything. And as a result of this, he's able to help Gamma Flight by giving them the exact location of the other shadow base where General 14 is at at this current moment. And because of that, they're like, okay, cool. So we just gonna drop in on him. He ain't gonna know what's coming. And it's gonna be a cakewalk because they have the element of surprise. And the only way he would know is unless he's psychic. And when they arrive, he's waiting because he literally has psychic surveillance around shadow base. And him and his team just standing there like, surprise, Gamma suckers, because he was alerted about their arrival and so he knew the time and the location but when this happens and he's looking at doc samson like one of those snotty nosed kids who's always asking if you got games on your phone it isn't much longer before this boom comes hitting on the wall which at this point in time is none other than the hulk betty jackie mcgee and rick jones which at this point in time have increased their odds tremendously and pretty much prevented them from either getting detained or executed and so now for dr mcgowan and her team who are just watching this on every screen like it's a dope spill video or something they're soon met by the arrival of Rick Jones and the others. And I gotta tell you, when I seen this, I thought Rick Jones was just gonna pull something from Stephen King's Sleepwalkers or Thinner or something and like pull her soul out through her face or something. But he didn't. And instead, it just came to the point when they realized that much the way that Shadow Base was being operated was under the orders of General 14. And when he brought in Dr. McGowan and many of the others like the strike team and the other scientists, he had pulled them all out of a lot of bad situations and he really had just used all of them to give them all some type of employment. And I'm gonna tell you, like, I couldn't have been Rick Jones because I'd have been like, man, this the only job you could have found? And like, I'm gonna look y'all up on Glassdoor and see what's really going on. But while they're having this conversation and Dr. McGowan even expresses that General 14 is a lost cause because he's just gone too far. And I don't think anybody from either side would argue with that. But with doing so, when he throws the stomach booger sauce on the Hulk, his face and his chest just slide off his body. And what's left of it, he just starts throwing around at everybody. And I gotta tell you, it's one of those things that's gruesome, but it looks so good. Like if only this was one of the moves that the Hulk would pull on a regular and like just call it FaceTime or something. Because if he did this on a regular, I'm sure there's plenty of people who just wouldn't mess with him. Because if he did that, they'd just be like, well, you know, we really don't gotta fight. Like this dude giving him the mean side eye and heading in the other direction. Like, look, I know I was in a bad situation before, but the Hulk acting like he want everybody to unlock his phone out here and I don't want that passcode. And it's like that dude, he made a good choice, but he followed it with a very bad one. Because when 14 goes again to throwing up hypnotic and hand on everybody, at this point, that same dude, he's clearly out of the way, which was a smart choice, but his fellow guards got hit with the sauce and they were just instantly deteriorated like Judgment Day. And 14, who really just saw it as like a casualty of war, which is a war that's raging in his own mind, but with doing so, the Hulk takes him down, even though he hits the Hulk with it again. But it's really just reminds me of like those matches in a game where your opponent keeps doing the same move and likely because they're new to the game, or in this case with 14 being new to the suit and he just doesn't have as many tricks up his sleeve but with going up against the hulk who proves he can improvise on top of improvise he just finds himself outmatched which wins him a first class ticket to the below place and brian banner tell us what our wonderful contestant has won <laughs> okay let me stop but when he gets there it's a huge eye opener because he's like man like i didn't know y'all was getting down like this and in a literal sense like nobody's getting down lower than this like this is below all but it's when he wakes up here it's like we know okay now he's one of the hulks and he's either going to be stuck here like brian Brian Banner or he's gonna have some crazy resurrection where he's reborn in a new body of some type of Hulk form 
and that we'll have to wait to see but personally i don't mind if like he was stuck there and there was a way that brian banner had used that as a loophole to get out but the below place is still very new and it'll be some time before we really know if that's one of the rules but as for your boy the one who was given the side eye and going the other way he comes back to check on general 14 and because he came back the hulk just backhanded him and do like instantly turned into a cinnamon roll but after this happens and general 14 is taken down for the foreseeable future the hulk then sits in general 14's hulk buster seat in a very maestro type of way but with doing so the hulk then takes over shadow base putting to use general 14's former resources to himself including dr mcgowan and their scientists to whom many of which just have a guilty conscience for everything they did to rick and all the others they experimented on which reminds me quite a bit of what we talked about on both the weapon h playlist and also the hulk Varines playlist with the leader working from shadow base in order to go after weapon h but also the new ordeal with weapon h who has his own base which i'm pretty sure he's moved the location of at this point but it really feels like these hulks are upgrading big time and speaking of hulks upgrading big time like skipping into the future like getting to the future talk now but at this point at the end of time we see the body of bruce banner standing over mr immortal who's not looking so immortal at the moment but at this point in time when this happens he's met by the sentience of the cosmos and so now just to put this all in perspective because it's easy to forget with everything that's going on right now that a thousand years in the future that we're still likely to see something similar to the ascension or even year 100 of powers of 10 because of the conflict between mutants and humans which could never be destroyed before at this point is likely only getting pushed back so let's just say for argument's sake that that comes back around in more of its 10th lifetime following the conclusion of house of x but of course playing out differently than what we had seen in powers of 10 and so now from there going 2000 years into the future don't forget we still have black panther and the intergalactic empire of wakanda which we definitely need to get back into because it also has its connections with shiar space which was something that was very critical to the x-men within powers of 10 but as far as black panther this is 2000 years in the future it is after the ascension which we'd seen in powers of 10 and this future we're talking about with the hulk takes place after that and so now after this we have everything that we talked about with the war of realms with old king thor wolverine eventually getting the phoenix force and him fighting with old king thor which going in order is after the ascension it's after black panther after all of that and it's within this future or betty at this point in time in the future when loki finally takes the necro sword from ego which is an amazing story the way that it came to that point and i'll have the different playlists down in the description if you need to catch up on any of it but after that at least to my knowledge it's supposed to be franklin richards and galactus who are the last ones here at the end of time and at this point in the immortal hulk this is the end end of time and as it appears the two of them are already dead and so now from here just considering what we've talked about thus far within silver surfer black and also the events unfolding within absolute carnage we really don't know how and when null will reappear towards the end of time or with the whole event of the silver surfer going back in time if that has affected the present day or even the near futures that we've seen making this present reality technically an alternate one that we never knew was alternate this entire time but if i had to make my guesses on no returning at any point in time i would have to say that it will be most likely around the time that loki returns with the necro sword and no will just reappear in order to take it back but at this point in time in the future where we see the sentience of the cosmos it's very much like what we had seen with galactus which we also got a refresher on through silver surfer black when his previous universe died and the sentience of the cosmos called him into the next one and with us revisiting this within immortal hulk we're given the comparison even with bruce banner and the gamma incident turning him into the hulk and it could be just me but it's like the explosion is representing the end of the universe banner from before is representing gallon in his previous universe and the end product being the hulk is pretty similar to what we have now as galactus with gallon being merged before the end of his universe very similarly banner was merged with more gamma radiation which was already in his blood from birth but the deeper exposure gave him a much deeper connection to the one below all and so at this point coming to the end of this universe where it appears that all of this must be done again we come to find out that the person standing here is not bruce banner but rather this person who took out mr immortal who took out franklin Richard and galactus and with them two billion years prior to this moment and with doing so rather than merging with the sentience of the cosmos he consumes it and i gotta tell you like if this is how it truly ends like man that is dark but even with the ending like this i have my questions of course for like where does no fall within it where the cosmic entities fall like how significant were the great beasts of the north like when it really came down to it because like the one below all all is a lot of people and even with that considered what is to be said about the one above all 
Alright, so in our recent talks about the Immortal Hulk, we had got a glimpse into the future to where at the end of time we seen the Hulk literally consume the essence of the universe and pretty much outliving everything that we've seen in Marvel Legacy, which gave us this dark and horrifying ending which had led us to the notion that not only the one below all had taken over the body of Bruce Banner, but he had also crossed over into the ninth cosmos. And so now, as far as the universe being reborn, that's something we've seen plenty of times in comics, but there's just something about this one here that just feels super different and I guess because most of the time that we see it it's following some type of cataclysmic event like the eighth cosmos for example which was created after the events of secret wars when Reed Richards fixed everything back to normal but in this case with what we're given from Al Ewing this is anything but normal because when we look into how it begins and even though at this point we're not sure how long it's been but it still very much has the look and feel of a relatively young universe but when we see how it begins we have these two creatures that appear to represent your male and female with the blue one whose name is like like par percent one I'm gonna just call them par and then like your reddish pink one which is called fairies to whom the two we just kind of see existing here in this quote maimed slash broken universe and I gotta say like the two kind of remind me of like Captain Universe and your and your M Cron crystal and it's not really a whole lot going off of that aside from the colors the shapes and the description that these two have shared some sort of history but because they're addressed with neither his or hers but H I R which is gender neutral it really just leaves it open for these two to be anybody Body. And so now as far as the location which is in this new universe to which at this time is just comprised of broken worlds, their home if you will is within these glittering sunstones which pretty much just look like these long gold crystals docked onto a birth ship and that's birth B-E-R-T-H. But when we see the two of them here we also see that they have a unique form of communication which is much like a bonding process which is something that was introduced to them by someone or something named D% N-E-L because in the ninth cosmos the percent sign is just a vowel now and you know what I think that's why the Hulk is just so angry here but we'll get to that and so now this D character or entity or what have you who had made it possible for communication and who was also described as a space where this communication would take place but it's also stated that this character or this entity was also broken by the breaker apart to whom we know to be the one below all and so what these two have been doing between fairies and par is pretty much searching all of space just to see if anything's left among the wreckage to where at this point all they can find is broken worlds and as far as they can search they find no planets no stars really just everything that's broken and really just the remnants of things that once were and so during this communication fairies introduces par to this egg which holds the next form of communication which is known as your tiding flies which are able to travel across space and time but more basically they can travel long distances and then arrive back at the same time that they left and initially Parr sees this as an abomination which almost feels like a hint towards something later but with Parr seeing this as an abomination Fairies then makes a correction that no this was created as a precaution a warning so that this tiding fly could gather what information that need be and travel as far and as long as it would need to and then make its way back with plenty of time for warning which is something that once again Parr sees as an abomination mainly for the reason and I, I want to say he because he blew but Parr mainly makes the argument that these titan flies can send information faster than thought and if words are sent quicker than thought or even quicker than knowledge then this could wipe time away or even break it which is an interesting concept with gathering so much information that you don't move because you're spending all of your time processing the information rather than moving forward in any given direction but in a universe like this one it's much better to be safe than sorry but at this point where Par and Fairies have made their way to the last habitable planet which is named like 0% sign Los because once again that percent sign is used like a like a vowel out here but when they arrive here this planet is like plentiful with with the crystal superstructures which pulse in a different harmony with these colors that have different meanings but as they arrive here they're met with this green light of which has been known to many as the breaker of worlds and when we get a closer look it's pretty much a celestial hulk who is literally larger than life out here and he's just swimming through these moons like it's beach balls basketballs and wiffle balls man and i mainly go with the celestial description mainly because that's the closest like that his garb reminds me of like it's very celestial like and with a bit of galactus in there too which is what i would more so expect because in this in this ninth cosmos it's almost like you would imagine like with the hulk entering here that he would more or less serve the same purpose as galactus with either consuming or destroying worlds in order to keep balance 
which is partially true because he's been getting worlds out of here left and right. But in this case, nowhere near for the purpose of balance, but rather for the purpose of destruction so that the Hulk is completely alone. With no other life thriving, no other sun shining, just the Hulk in the whole universe, that's it. And when he gets there and just punches this planet, which at one point had nine billion lives on it. But when he arrives, he punches this planet and it's a wrap. And so when this happens at this point, Par one, who's like the only like sole survivor. When Par sees this, it has the curiosity that it has to know just why. And with Par needing to find this out, it then turns to one of your tiding flies to gather information as Par goes to investigate. Because at this point, the tiding fly is no longer seen as an abomination with there being absolutely no life left to be an abomination too. So really at this point, with there being a dire need to collect information and hopefully send it back to a point in time where something could change this, then that's the Hail Mary plan more or less. But along with this, Par wants answers because one, Par has never seen the Breaker of Worlds, who in this time is also referred to as the Breaker of Part. But even with pulling in closer and with doing so, dispatching the Tiling Fly in order to communicate so that Par could get the answer to this question why, like this face and even likeliness of the Hulk, it's completely alien to Par or anything he's ever seen, or it's ever seen. And mainly because the history of creatures within this cosmos, they've all had their super weird shapes, but nothing even remotely in the likeliness of what we would signify as like a humanoid form. And upon entering where there's said to be no sign of a soul, but instead just staring into this abyss, which is comprised of a number of faces that appear to be human-like, which for Par wouldn't really mean anything. But for us as the reader, this means everything. Because though Par doesn't recognize these faces to be of any human origin, it's likely our best guess is that these are people who have been consumed or absorbed from the previous universe collectively, along with any life here that has existed as well. And when Par asks the question why, there's a response then comes back from the one below all, who replies that he's the one who uses this mouth to howl, he uses these hands to break, and that he's devoured the cells from the time long past, who were pretty much all the faces that we had seen on the way down. And so now venturing through here, and like with the one below all expressing like his desires and the hatred, which ultimately all lead to the desire to be alone, it all really just points back to like your classic Incredible Hulk, to whom from the very beginning, like even going back to like your 1960s, and your entire reasoning to why the Hulk was always mad, it very much stemmed from the Hulk just wanting to be left alone. And of course, through the years, the transformations had their different triggers, but initially, your Savage Hulk, he always had the deepest desire to just be left alone. But even while this is happening, the Hulk grows to an even larger size, and he just crushes the star in his own two hands, which is just insane, like showing that there's no limit to how big this Hulk can get. But even throughout this chaos, the Tiding Fly makes it out, sending this information back to an earlier date, to where when we witness where it's it's arrived, I felt like a lot of W's just there. But when we see it again and it's being dissected and the sunstone is being extracted from it, we then see a creature would appears to be part percent one to when in this point in time, whenever the heck this is, the leader has now discovered this tiding fly and now all the information which remains and all the information is collected is at his disposal. And so now my reasoning for my mention of the possibility of the leader being like the watcher in the night cosmos, that that stems from the concept of the tiding fly because the tiding fly which can go across time and space it can't go back in time further back than the point of its origin, which in this case is no further back than when they were created by fairies. So with that said, one of two things is going on here, or perhaps even one of three, because either one, the tiding fly went back to the time it was supposed to and the leader got it, two, it was defective, went off course and the leader found it, or perhaps even three, the leader found a way to make it into the ninth universe, which is how he got his hands on this thing. But even in addition to that, dare I mention a fourth? Because when this par creature had mentioned that these tiding flies were an abomination because they could mess up time, it may even be possible that the Hulk destroying that sun created a black hole, which sent this tiding fly through time, which is how the leader then discovered this tiding fly. And if that's the case, then who knows at what point in time the leader actually got his hands on this. All right, so at this point, picking up where Banner and the others have taken over Shadow Base, we then continue with Bruce Banner, who sends out a message to the world, exposing what Shadow Base was, with them being a black budget organization, who was granted $1.2 billion to essentially capture the Hulk, cut him up, and weaponize him. And with them doing so, really just blowing the whistle on everything about Shadow Base, he doesn't give up the location, but he also brings up the valid point that this taxpayer money could have been used for education, medicine, and like a number of other things that would 
the benefit of the people. But most notably out of this broadcast, he informs the world that had this budget not been used to pursue the Hulk, then they really would have just spent it on either guns, bombs, or something destructive rather than constructive. And he lets the world know that these are the ways of the human world. And there are ways that won't change, so for this reason, he has to end it. And when he sends this message out, it ruffles a few feathers to say the least. But even still, this is something that we've known throughout this series for quite some time. And even predating this series, like even if we go back all the way to Avengers No Surrender, the Hulk had made this very clear. And even fast forward after that, when we get the conversation between Doc Samson and the Hulk, which is where, in my opinion, I think we got the most in-depth look of what Banner is talking about prior to this point. Because at the time, the Hulk had told Doc Samson that he wanted to destroy the world, but not only just to just destroy it, but really just in the sense of taking out the people who are taking out themselves. And in the process of taking out themselves, they're dragging a number of others down with them, which we also got a glimpse of in the Immortal Hulk Absolute Carnage tie-in, with the Devil Hulk refusing to bond with the Venom symbiote because he believed it was a detour from this precise plan. And so just to be clear, this has little to do with that glimpse into the future when we got a peek into the new birth of the next universe when the Hulk was bumping into different moons and punching planets. Like just to be clear, that is not what is meant throughout this message when Banner gives out this broadcast, but rather that was a peek into what this message could fully be. And also in that case, very much including the one below all, who we had seen at the core of that planet punching Hulk. But essentially everybody who had seen this broadcast like that's pretty much what they saw and like in their minds the Hulk just punching the world and in one blow just punching humanity's lights out but after giving such a message Banner heads down to the diner get some clam chowder of which he compliments the chef it's the best he ever had but not long after he's here he's confronted by Amadeus Cho who had seen the broadcast much like everybody else but he came here to confront Banner and ask him like is he out of his mind and it's kind of funny because Banner is very Omarion to the situation like he's very unbothered because these plans plans didn't just come up out of nowhere. Because in spite of everything that's been going on, this is something that the Hulk has been meaning to get around to since Avengers No Surrender. And Amadeus is really just trying to get him to see like the world is losing it. Because it's being broadcasted on every news station, all the different heroes are being interviewed, like what are they gonna do about it? And the Avengers is like, we looking into it. Even though we know good and well they knew since day one, and after that incident in the desert with Brian Banner, they more or less been staying out the Hulk's way. And it's really come to the point where as far as the heroes, they just don't know what to do with them. And if you look at the pandemonium with the media, you also see a result that Bruce Banner had said would happen also taking place as well. Because when he made the announcement, he also said that he knew that there would be people who would try to capitalize on the chaos that this would bring. And surely enough, this is exactly what happened. And of all people, nobody did this more than Roxxon. With one of their campaigns saying, if your baby's acting out of order, then perhaps your baby has Hulk syndrome. And I don't know, this one sound a little valid though, because some of these babies out here just be wildin'. <laughs> but during the time that Banner's having this conversation with Amadeus, back over at Shadow Base, Doc Samson's having this conversation with Dr. McGowan. And Samson does make the point that the whole Hulk syndrome thing is pretty much more of a fancy way of saying what Amadeus Cho already stated about the Hulk. Back when Amadeus first got his powers, and he mentioned that Banner had a disassociative identity disorder. And it's pretty much public knowledge at this point, but even still, and once again, if the media can make money off of it, they're gonna capitalize on that opportunity. But as far as where things are, like here at Shadow Base, and in relation to the other locations as well, we also come to find out that this one pretty much stands alone. And the only people who really had the clearance to know what was going on at this one in particular were the people who were actually here. And even though this base was given like $1.2 billion from the government, that went out the window with General 14. And any chance of that getting picked up by someone else went out the window with Banner's announcement. But the remaining scientific crew that worked here before, they're still here working with Banner. And for the most part, they're pretty much doing the same thing as far as researching the Hulk. But now, what they use the research for has changed because now they use the research to help people with gamma based abilities and as far as these scientists like how they're gonna eat and how the place is gonna function now as far as funding from here that's pretty much just coasting off the remaining 300 million that is left from the 1.2 billion from which general 14 had originally got but one thing this hasn't stopped is like people leaking information who either formerly worked at shadow base and walked away because eventually dr mcgowan's identity gets leaked to the public along with their criminal history which was one of those things that we knew 
that 14 looked for when recruiting people just so he could hold it over their head while they were working at Shadow Base, with many of these people still being wanted by the authorities. And as far as Jackie McGee who works with the Arizona Herald, to which the Arizona Herald has made a lot of money off of the Hulk, and they've really gone full circle from chastising her from chasing the Hulk to where in the beginning they were saying it was just a waste of her time, but now though they do want to continue to make money off of it, there's now the issue of Jackie's involvement which then puts the Herald on this weird place of dancing on the line of being a part of why all this is happening. And because they don't want to stop printing news about the Hulk, because for them the Hulk is as big to the Arizona Herald as Spider-Man is to the Daily Bugle. But with them knowing how closely Jackie is involved, as a result of this, in a meeting with the head of legal, they end up minimizing her involvement to protect the company. But so now, back to this conversation between Cho and Banner. Because Amadeus is really just getting caught up to a lot of this stuff that's been going on. Because like, for one, he asks what happened to General 14, and Banner says nothing, so Amadeus is kind of like, okay, well that answers that. But then when Amadeus asks if he were to die, would he come back? And Banner's more like, mm, I wouldn't take that chance. Because up to this point, Gamma people coming back from the dead has not been a 100% thing. Prime example, General Ross. But with Amadeus still trying to give Banner this view of optimism and hope for the world, and doing so by telling him that this is still a world full of heroes. But at this point, Banner doesn't believe in heroes anymore. And sure, there's brilliant minds like Tony Stark, Reed Richards, Adam Brashear, but Banner goes on to express that Iron Man, Mr. Fantastic, and Blue Marvel, they haven't found a solution yet, and as far as he's concerned, the closest to find a solution is either Wakanda or Krakoa. But as far as Banner's concerned, he is done. He's no longer trying to fix what needs to be fixed, so instead he's gonna break what needs to be broken. And he's gonna do so by picking one specific target to make an example out of, and preferably one of the targets who's been making the biggest profit out of this entire situation. And for Amadeus, like at this point, he realizes there's no swaying in Banner's decision. And it's like there's no convincing him that this isn't the way to go. So he really just leaves and tells him, like, look, just make sure you go about this the smart way because he'll be keeping an eye on him. And I'm not really sure what Amadeus would necessarily do, but it's really just like one of those situations, like, what can you do? Because if Banner makes a decision to go a certain route, you can't stop him, and really the least you can do is just hope that he hears you out at another time. But as soon as Amadeus leaves, this is where we find out that Banner is actually working with the chef. You know, this ain't just any chef, but this is Chef Namor, which is a crazy reveal because Namor, though he's done team ups before, but he's usually the guy that says no. Like, I truly believe that you can make like a 30 minute cut montage of like Namor just saying no, because this guy is seldomly the team player. But when Amadeus leaves, Banner does tell Namor that he appreciates Namor not revealing himself while Amadeus was there. And I mean, I'm pretty sure it's because they want to keep it low key, but also because Banner knew that Amadeus would have went into panic mode had he known that half of the original defenders were now working on doing the opposite of defending. But from here now, jumping over to Roxxon Corp, it's here where we find out that Dario Agar is shedding the dual identity between his regular self and the Minotaur. And at this point, he's only showing himself fully to the company executives, but he's also toying with the idea of going public, one as an attempt for redemption with everything that's happened with Weapon H and with Weird World and The Door and more recently The War of Realms. But for Dario Agar, in this climate where the Hulk has waged war against the world, he now sees this as an opportunity to not only capitalize but to also rise the power because he recognizes for the most part that people all over the world they just scrambling and it's moments like these where power and opportunity get shuffled and he sees himself to be the fit leader so he can use his power both physically and monetary so he can determine where the cards land and i gotta say like i could kind of see it like with the money side and the media uh, but aside from that there are a lot of people out there stronger than the minotaur and i mean i like the suit and everything but Come on bruh, like we all know you're not gonna put the hooves on the hole. Alright, so prior to this point with Bruce Banner making the announcement to the world that it is over for everybody, and really everybody except for the women and children. But really, the funny part about that whole announcement is like, it, had he been somebody weaker, man, he would have been beat up, locked up a long time ago. But in this case, since this is the Immortal Hulk, it's not so much that scenario. But that won't necessarily prevent people from making their attempts. And as we know, in the forefront of people attempting to stop this, we have Dario Agar, to whom for him, stopping the Hulk is only about the money. Because with Banner's announcement, he's used that to monetize the different media coverage, and he's even gone public as far as his identity being the Minotaur, but really only doing this as a public image to make himself appear as this powerful figure who will protect everyone, which again is just for show and for more publicity that he can monetize. 
But as far as Dario Agger, he's not only working on the marketing and the business side, and make no mistake, that is his main priority. And it's much like when we talked about his run-ins with Weapon H, because even back then, his main priority was stealing resources from other dimensions by way of making dealings with Malekith, to which some of those resources we do see returned here in the Immortal Hulk and we'll talk about shortly. But even still, back with Weapon H, he just saw Weapon H as a resource that he could use in relation to Weird World and everything going on there with Morgan Le Fay. But so now what we find out in addition to the business that Dario Agar is handling, that he's also assembled a special team called the Berserker Unit who he's preparing to dispatch the next time that the Hulk shows up. And from what we've heard Banner say before, like Roxxon is one of the first people he's coming for. And mainly because his quote, destroying the world mission, is more targeted towards those who are destroying the world themselves, in addition to those who are just making a profit off of that. And at this point, like Banner is wasting no time at getting to the business. Which brings us to Banner preparing with Dr. McGowan to translocate to one of the Roxxon server farms and pretty much take out the hardware which generates Roxxon's algorithms which thinks for them and tells them where to make the money. And of course heading here the Hulk expects to run into some sort of resistance to where at this point there are like four berserker guards who are guarding the place if that's what you want to call it because once they go berserk they're like fighting each other. Because essentially the formula of their transformation makes them more beast than human. And they do have a bit of intelligence left in berserker mode but apparently not enough because these guys think that they are on par with the Hulk, which is something I ain't even gotta get that deep into because these guys who probably would have been formidable to like your general military, but in this case that doesn't even matter because you're going up against the Hulk. And it's like you can tell that Dario Agar has gassed these guys because they even believe that they're just as strong as the Hulk. So because they don't know any better, like they heart pumping Kool-Aid right now. And that's all fine and dandy until you actually run into the Immortal Hulk and he starts going down the line just knocking out you and your buddies. But just to give you guys a bit of background about the berserker team these guys are juiced up with the same dragon's blood which dario agar had got from loki back in the war of realms and this isn't necessarily the first time that we've seen this because we also seen it put to use back in weapon h when he crossed over to weird world to where at the time we had saw earlier implementations of dario agar trying to use this dragon's blood to try to create his version of a super soldier and back then the results were much wilder than what we've seen it result to here with at this point him trying trying to make it more Hulk-like, but even with doing so, yet and still, it was just another failed attempt. But with the Hulk just running through these guys in a matter of minutes, and in the process pretty much multitasking and destroying the Roxxon servers, this then takes much of Roxxon's business offline, they lose a lot of money, and from here they're forced to find another way to adjust. But in addition to this, when Dr. McGowan calls for the Hulk to return back to Shadow Base, and urging him to do it quickly because it'll be sunrise soon, but even with hearing this, the Hulk doesn't rush back, because at this point, he expresses that Banner is helping him to resist the sunlight so he can stay out in the daytime. Which actually brings the idea to mind like with Banner helping the Hulk and giving him this additional edge, like this could be the beginning of eliminating weaknesses for the Hulk altogether. But I only see it working with Banner working together with the Hulk, which is exactly what's happening right now which makes him super dangerous. But so now with Dario Agar, like one of the things that really gets to him like it's not just the fact that the Hulk is hurting his business and that's still his number one priority because the business brings him money. But in addition to that, at this point, he's a bit jealous because your demographic between the age of 12 and 18, like these kids, they love the Hulk. And when it comes to picking sides between Dario Agar, the face of Roxxon Corp, and the Hulk who smashes everything, like the kids are picking the Hulk every time. So with Dario looking for solutions to this and relying on his team to come up with those ideas, they're not necessarily productive in doing this because they're terrified of the guy. And as a result, most of the time, they just end up saying yes to every little thing he says, which obviously pisses him off even more. And even to the point to where he just snaps on one of the guys like, hey, like it wouldn't kill you to correct me every now and then. <laughs> but fast forward way later, like it actually did kill him because he corrected Dario and he died. So it, it, it did kill him. So technically, Dario was wrong again. Um, but I'm not pointing the finger. I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud. But so now from here we jump over to a security guard who's working security for Roxxon Corp and as we follow him we see some of the effects in his life with his teenage daughter who's a huge Hulk fan and to him like when he looks at her he in his mind he thinks like the devil has gotten into her to whom we know is like your analogy to the devil Hulk but for this guy who runs into this issue at home and he's dealing with the whole idea of like he's lost his daughter she's a complete Hulk fan now she's dyed her hair green and it's like you take that and put it in the addition of him dealing with the trouble at his job because people are coming to Roxxon Corp 
and not even so much people but like these are kids and they fall into that 18 under demographic to where many of them land between your 12 to 18 age group and as a security officer it's his job to make sure that they don't cross a certain line and that he doesn't like catch them in the act of vandalism which in this case he doesn't but he does sort of freak out because at one point he does recognize one of the people in the crowd with her blue eyes her eyebrow piercing her dyed green hair but even with doing so like this dude is like freaking out mainly from being overwhelmed by the crowd which still is no excuse like this guy shouldn't have a firearm like he needs help but with him essentially freaking out he points the firearm at the little girl squeezes the trigger and the hulk lands there just in time to save that little girl's life and it's like for that guard with everything that was running through his mind Mind. like for one he was thinking like that isn't my child these are all the devil's children and they're all a threat but when the hulk shows up he realizes that this quote devil takes care of his own and the hulk lets him know like you the human world is over like you on planet hulk now but it's like with seeing this like in a nutshell this is like summarizing that faint questionable line that the hulk is crossing because when the hulk goes to grab this dude he's looking at his daughter like why won't you save me and she's just standing there looking like yo you almost shot me my guy and with him it's like he symbolizes what this world could be because prior to this he was essentially a good father and his daughter she loved him she named her first son after him but because of his fear he almost did the unthinkable and it's then that the hulk grabs him and he probably just threw him to asgard like i don't know but so now going back to dario agar this is where we get the twist because one we discover one of dario agar's few living advisors we actually find out that this guy's responsible for the hulk masks that everyone's wearing which were deliberately made cheap in order to maximize profit so everybody can get one and I think they cost like nine cents to make but they were selling them for like three dollars but when he showed this to Dario Agar this then gave him the idea of the solution to defeating his Hulk issue which then immediately causes Dario Agar to head over to Monster Island which I believe has been deserted since like venomized and I could be wrong there could have been more things that popped off since then I really don't keep up with Monsters Island. But essentially when Dario Agar arrives here and his assistance like is not safe and Dario lets him know that he's good, that this place is pretty much deserted. But it's here where we find out that Dario Agar has come here to find Zemnu, who as far as comic book publications go, this guy has been the Hulk longer than Bruce Banner. But this is why Dario Agar has come here to Monsters Island because he's searching for a Hulk to go against the Hulk and I ain't gonna front like I'm excited to see Zemnu get like a Marvel legacy upgrade if you will because I'm curious to know how exactly the history with Zemnu ties into everything new that we're getting with the Immortal Hulk because at the end of the day that could be a really crazy twist if done right because there's a lot of room in his backstory that they can play with and do this and just to let you guys know I did an in-depth video about Zemnu and I got a link to that down in the description so you can check it out and I think that video is like at half a million views now like it's crazy so definitely check that out if you want to know more about his backstory before we go forward and see exactly how he plays into the future issues of the Immortal Hulk. Alright, so hopping right back in to where at this point Bruce Banner has declared war on pretty much humanity and with doing so of course your governments feel threatened but the youth they were enamored and inspired which also led them to side with the Hulk and protest and probably put it all on TikTok. But if you guys remember recently when we talked about this happening to where at one of these protests a security guard for Dario Agar he had gotten super nervous shot into the crowd which would have been fatal for one of these kids and likely his daughter but just in the nick of time the Hulk jumped in and prevented that from happening. But as it turned out, in somebody's Instagram story, they had caught this event happening. And I don't know why I'm saying TikTok or Instagram, like it was just social media, nothing specific. But with this event being caught on tape, it was also brought to Dario Agar's attention that the Hulk was out in daytime when this occurred. And this is one of the new things I was referring to back when we talked about the Immortal Hulk Spider-Man one shot. Because recently, much like how Joe Fixit could come out in the daytime, but only in a banner-like form, now the Devil Hulk is also changing to where he can come out in daytime as well. And the source of this change, it all stems back to Banner, of which we'll talk about more in just a little bit. But with Dario Agar discovering this, and watching closely at the footage, he makes the critique that it wasn't like full sunlight that day. And at the time that the Hulk was seen, it was a bit overcast, and Dario just feels like, well, the Hulk could have been ducking in the shade that day. And at this point, he's still banking on the idea 
said that the Hulk cannot come out in daytime. And because of that, he's still trying to strategize on when he's going to use all his resources of which he commandeered from Monster Island. Because prior to this point, he was banking on using them in the daytime. And as of right now, he still feels like that's the best time. But also at this point in time, over at Shadow Base Site G, which is the Shadow Base which Bruce Banner had taken over, which at this point in time is pretty much his base of operations. And when we go here, we see that Doc Samson has pretty much figured it out. And with doing so, he's really just talking Betty's ear off. Because he's realized like the whole thing with Joe Fixit being able to walk in the sunlight, and also the Devil Hulk being able to go in the sunlight as well. And even though their access is limited, Doc Samson has figured out that this all points back to Banner. And the reasoning behind it is because before, when the Devil Hulk couldn't come out but at night, it was almost like a reflection of Banner's shame for the Devil Hulk. And also a very similar instance for Joe Fixit. But for Banner, like the closer he is with either of the Hulks, the greater their access becomes in the daytime. But even with realizing this, it still leaves Doc Samson with the question of who is being more like who? Like is Banner becoming more like the Devil Hulk and becoming more ruthless and filled with rage? Or is it the other way around to where the Devil Hulk is becoming more like Banner? And that's the part that Doc Samson can't quite just put his finger on just yet. But while Doc is having this conversation with Betty, Bruce just kind of strolls up and she immediately changes into her Hulk form. And one of the things I've noticed with this is like Betty, she's very crass with Bruce, at least in her red harpy form. But anytime she's around the Devil Hulk, it's the opposite. Like she's more endearing and more caring with the Devil Hulk, which is a whole different situation going on there. But jumping over to Jackie McGee, who's catching a hard time from her editor because lately she's been writing about the Hulk in a very relatable, logical, siding with the Hulk type of way. Which of course originates from her obsession with the Hulk and him destroying her home as a child, which likely stressed out her dad having to work so hard and recover financially, which eventually killed him. But at the same time, she's conflicted because recently the Hulk has saved her life so many times and both events give her good reason to either love or hate the Hulk, which give her a hard time on processing all those feelings. But it's also also here while Jackie's having this conversation with her editor, when Dario Agar hits the red button, which causes four different creatures from Monster Island to just appear in the middle of the city. And this really played into just part of the plan that Dario Agar had put together when we had seen him visit Monster Island a while back, looking for some type of solution to combat the Hulk. And these creatures specifically, they're not like the end all solution, like they're just part of it. Because for Dario Agar as part of his plan, he's only sending them here in the daytime to draw the Hulk out. And for Banner and the others at Shadow Base, like they they see this, like it's an obvious trap. But the thing is, when Banner hears about this, he doesn't want to go. And this detail right here, this is something that's like lightly brushed over. But I'd make the argument that this is a very important detail because at this time, when he's like, "Why not send the Avengers or the Fantastic Four or the X Men, to whom all of which are busy?" This is another one of those signs of Banner being more like the Devil Hulk or even the Savage Hulk from what we've seen back in Absolute Carnage. Because one of the things we would notice, and mainly with the Savage Hulk. But one of the things that we would notice with both of these hulks, it was that they both disliked only coming out and being used and dropped into a situation that would cause them pain. And even though Banner agrees to transform and go because he's the only one who could really do anything, like this does give us one of those brief moments, in addition to his declaration of war, of Banner and the Hulk harmonizing even closer. But even just before the Hulk is teleported out there from Shadow Base, we see a bit of what I was talking about with Harpy being concerned with the Hulk. Because before he goes, she asks if he's alright and really more so pertaining to him going out in daytime. And the way he describes it, it's like it's not all the way right. Like he said, it itches at times. But even with doing this, it shows us like that progression of how it's not perfect between him and Banner, but yet it's dangerously close. But after he makes his jump to downtown Arizona, through the doorway which he was dropped through from Shadow Base Site G, but with doing this, it's like he drops right into the mouth of one of the creatures. And it's kind of messed up, man, because like in most people, they think like, well, okay, he's a Hulk, he's okay. Cause that's not gonna kill him. And even if it did kill him, he'll come right back. And these things are true. Like we don't know how quick he'll come back, but we know he would. But at the same time, it's like, you gotta feel this guy's pain because the whole time he's in there, he's fighting these different bugs. And he's also fighting being digested in the process. But at the same time, it's like the only thing people care about is like, Hulk, did you smash it? Hey, okay, good, good, good. And that's really all people care about for the most part. And it's like when we get glimpses like this of seeing the Hulk fight his way through here and asking why is it the Hulk always hurts? Like this is the part of the Hulk we're beginning to see Banner identify with even more and more. But for the perspective of Dario Agar, who was watching this all go down comfortably from his office ordering lobster, like one of the things we also need to notice is that he's also doing all of this for the sake of publicity. Because since Banner's declared war and like a number of your teenage 
demographic has sided with the Hulk, Dario Agar has been losing a lot of money, which is one of the reasons why he went full time Minotaur, in order to give the appearance of someone strong who would protect the world from the Hulk. But even still with that, he's too scared to come outside. But essentially, even with that, he wants what the Hulk has. He wants that power, he wants that influence, but at this point, I highly doubt he really knows the depth of what really comes with it. But when we jump back over to Jackie, to whom her and her editor, they're just trying to stay alive. And at this time, it's nearly nightfall and the Hulk is still in the belly of that other beast. But fortunately enough, in the case of Jackie, the other members of Team Hulk, they chipped in to help out and her and her editor are saved by Rick Jones. And I gotta say, like with Rick Jones and his new abilities, I kinda like what Al Ewing has done because with him being able to charge gamma radiation or to hold the charge of gamma radiation and distribute that energy, he essentially could be used as a mobile battery pack for the Immortal Hulk. And that's definitely something that could come in handy at some point in time later on. But for right now, we get Harpy and Doc Samson who make their way in and they're also met with the arrival of Gamma Flight, which at this point in time is just Puck, Absorbing Man, and Titania, who really came into handy with the lava spewing monster, mainly because her body can handle extreme temperatures over thousands of degrees Celsius, which was also a huge relief for Doc Samson because he like, he ain't about that life. But with Doc and Harpy helping Titania take this thing down and also Harpy cutting it open, Doc Samson then discovers that these things are just shells, which are just filled with hives of parasites and being controlled by something else and it's also in that moment when doc realizes that that he's like wait a minute wasn't the hulk like eaten by one of these things and it's almost like they forgot about the hulk altogether but it's at this point where the hulk finally tears his way out to where we really get a sense of the spin that the media has been putting on the whole thing because essentially up to this point the media has been blaming all of this on the hulk and really just saying because he's here he's the reason why this is happening and it's like even though they don't have all the information like that's the story that they're running with which is exactly what dario Agar had wanted anyway and it's almost like he could have used his ties to push some of these spins and kind of circulate this idea out there but even with everything else he's been doing in the background like digging up dirt on Team Hulk and bringing up Titania's old charges but even still it's like this theory made its way public on its own but when a bright flash occurs over downtown Phoenix Arizona and appearing to be what the media would call a miracle but rather than being any type of miracle is the arrival of Zemnu who not only is controlling these parasites but he's also also making this arrival like the Hulk is the enemy and Zemnu's coming to save the day. And this is one of those things that has me thinking like if Dario Agar is truly aware of who he's called out here because it's very possible that Zemnu may have his own agenda that could conflict with the plans of Dario Agar. Okay, so now starting this off, let's begin with Dr. Charlene McGowan. Because during the time that Zemnu appeared in downtown Phoenix, Dr. McGowan had had a flashback to some of her previous work prior to working for General 14 at Shadow Base. And so now keep in mind, if you guys remember earlier on the Immortal Hulk playlist, we had talked about how General 14 had assembled the members of Shadow Base by bringing people in, whether it was mercenaries, doctors, or particular specialists. And with doing so with everybody that he brought in, he made sure that they had some type of dirt on them prior to. And for a brief moment, this is what we see Dr. McGowan reflecting on. Because years prior to her involvement with Shadow Base, she had secretly been working for the Kingpin in one of his drug labs, harvesting a mutant growth hormone for it to be used as a new type of drug. And as Dr. McGowan expresses, depending on how this hormone is used, it can either be an illegal party drug or just straight up poison. But with her specific instructions from the Kingpin, which were actually passed to her through Turk and not the Kingpin directly, and just mentioning Turk just kind of makes me miss Daredevil on Netflix all over again. <sighs> Those were the days. But when she's harvesting this hormone from a mutant by the name of Glowboy, to whom as it turns out, he was kicked out on the street at a young age, and after that taken in by the Morlocks, but somewhere along the way, he got into some trouble on the street to where Kingpin bailed him out, but because of that, every four days he would have to visit Dr. McGowan and give her samples of his blood. And of course, with that many frequent visits, she remembers him as always being tired, which was definitely one of those things that was a byproduct of all the blood loss. But from the looks of this flashback, this was likely the first of many others where Dr. McGowan did this shady work for the Kingpin of which he was very pleased with and as a result he of course asked her to work on future projects which she agreed to to only use that opportunity to try to justify a way to make this new drug like a form of therapy so that she could justify it all and make it feel like she was helping people. 
but also like real quick i can't just brush over the captain america mug that she has because it reminds me a lot of like the funko pop captain america mug that we'd seen back in the weapon h absolute carnage crossover to where that director had mentioned this crisis will pass but of course that director was a guy but even still, it almost appears like we're getting this nod to Dr. McGowan who mentions her other job, but she doesn't name specifically what it was. But with doing so, it's almost like we're indirectly being told that she used to work for Weapon X. Because prior to working for the Kingpin, she expresses she got fired from her previous job, mainly because it was super stressful, and eventually they had let her go. And at this point, we don't know specifically if Weapon X was her previous job, but I just thought that the similar mug was something worth pointing out, especially with her being super ambiguous with what her previous job used to be but fast forward back to her working with kingpin because it was around this time to where her laboratory got busted and when it did she also mentioned that she always wanted to meet a superhero and in a classic case of be careful what you wish for daredevil showed up and he shut down the whole operation but from here she jumps forward to the day that she met the hulk which was the same day as the death of general 14 when the hulk took over shadow base and he asked her if she was going to join him and while thinking back on all of this while watching the news footage of the hulk being confronted by zemnu she then mows over the the idea of why the Hulk isn't really considered a superhero, but instead she saw him as pure rage, to which she feels like everyone could see a piece of their self in, much like a mirror. But jumping back to downtown Phoenix to where Zemnu, he's pretty much doing his hypnosis thing and in a very passive yet aggressive way. Because even now while he's talking to the Hulk and asking the Hulk if he remembers him and also kind of rubbing in that he was the first Hulk before Hulk, which immediately gets the pause laid on him. But even with doing this, Zemnu is taking advantage of the media watching all of this and with doing so directly talking to the Hulk on one hand yet passively talking to the rest of the world on the other. But I'm gonna tell you guys like why this isn't a good look for the Hulk and it's because when he first arrived here to help and he dropped out of the sky he directly landed into the first monster's mouth and this wasn't something that everybody had necessarily seen but what they did see what was something that appeared to be the most the arrival of the Hulk which for the record around this time Savage Hulk had taken control and with doing so preventing the Devil Hulk to come back out but we'll get back to that in just a little bit but with the media choosing to show just the Hulk just busting out of one of these monsters and releasing parasites everywhere and then on top of that appearing to attack Zemnu who had made himself appear to be the hero just by appearing to have shown up at the right time and for the media this air quotes appearance it's everything because at this point Dario Agger's plan is working. Zemnu seems like this long forgotten hero, but rather than him coming in and trying to outsmash the Hulk, his focus is more so on brainwashing and influencing the people, which for starters is smart, because I'll admit, I wanted Zemnu to come back and have all these upgrades and just be going toe to toe with the Hulk, but that really wouldn't make so much sense because he's a cyborg and eventually the Hulk would just tear through him. But rather, what I think is interesting is like the way that Zemnu pulls this influence, because with the way he does it it's with a lot of nostalgia whether it's bringing up his old tv show like we talked about in the zemnu video a while back but when we see zemnu doing this here it's like he's calling for a return on this long time investment which he's left within the subconscious of people so long ago and we even see that come into play here with call krill the absorbing man who had absorbed part of the Gamma Flight ship with the intention of dropping down and helping the Hulk, but when he gets down there, he instead attacks the Hulk and defends Zemnu. And as soon as that happens, Dr. McGowan gets the Hulk out of there. And it's clearly not a case of the Hulk needing help or needing to be saved. But rather when she does this, there's a couple of things happening here. Because one, when she pulls the Hulk back into Shadow Base, and mainly to stop him from doing more harm than help, almost immediately we begin to see the Savage Hulk hand the will over to the Devil Hulk. And when this happens, it's more so because Savage Hulk, he knows that Zemnu is doing something to the people, to everybody. And though he can't exactly articulate what it is, when this happens, he just hands it back to the Devil Hulk and lets him take it from there. And when we see the Devil Hulk come forth, it's at this point where he kind of begins trying to piece things together. Because with everything that Savage Hulk was saying, it was Hulk this or Hulk that. And it's actually here where Dr. McGowan is suggesting that perhaps Doc Samson could help investigate. It's here where Devil Hulk is like, okay, no. And he's pretty much like, okay well doc samson he's not exactly the world's greatest detective and with hearing her say this the devil hulk calls her out on a lie and it's really one of those moments where it feels like that Dr. McGowan, she's trying to steer the Devil Hulk away from actually realizing what's going on. And this is the part where it begins to come around full circle. Because with us being able to peek within the subconscious of Dr. McGowan, and we had seen like the flashbacks and when she had first met the Hulk, like when the Hulk has this moment of clarity and he's like, okay, what exactly is a Hulk? For Dr. McGowan, when she hears the Hulk say this and she looks in his eyes, it's not like before where she had seen rage and this desire to destroy the world and make it better, but it's in this moment where instead 
said she actually sees fear. And yet again for her, it feels like she's looking in a mirror. Because when she sees the devil Hulk showing signs of being afraid, then all of a sudden, you know, she's afraid too. But underneath all this, what we begin to see more clearer in this moment, and really from like the past few issues, it's like this much, much deeper delivery of Zemnu's hypnosis and influence delivered here rather than like your classic squiggly lines around his head and a few words being given. And it's kind of creepy, which is something I'm glad they're taking Zemnu back to because he's kind of steered away from that, that thriller aspect that he used to have. And here in Immortal Hulk, he's gone right back to it. And the wild thing is like, not only with this panning out with the media and showing like the Hulk saves the day being the headline, but the Hulk meaning Zemnu, who in all actuality didn't make that up, like he's he's been the Hulk and literally longer than Banner. But also what we find out that Zemnu has begun to do here is that like with his return, he started to redirect what everyone sees the Hulk to be and point that towards himself. But in addition to that, he's also taken all the adoration, the, the admiration that everyone has had for superheroes and he's also pointed that towards himself as well. And with Dr. McGowan, we get an up close look at the depth of how deep Zemnu's influence is gone, which will be the same for many others but with Dr. McGowan it's like our up close example and in her case we see this example when she thinks back to the night when she was working in her lab for the kingpin and she always wanted to see a superhero and she finally did but now when she thinks back that superhero isn't Daredevil but rather it's Zemnu who she remembers as the Incredible Hulk and it's crazy because if you think about all the influence that the Hulk had pulled to this point with making his declaration which is influence that he didn't want he didn't ask for but it came anyway but with Dario Agar wanting this influence influence so bad and really just wanting Zemnu to bring down the Hulk rather than just step in his place and Zemnu take all that credit and even the title for himself it's pretty likely that this is something that Dario Agar is gonna have a problem with because I kind of doubt he wanted Zemnu to handle the problem this well Alright, so at this point in time when we had seen Zemnu arrive and in the eyes of the public take down these creatures from Monsters Island, who were also summoned by Dario Agar, it was clear to us as the reader that this was being done as a tool to sway the persuasion of the masses. Because on top of this with Zemnu using his radio telepathy to beam through all the news and media cameras as he was getting torn to pieces by the Hulk, it was very similar to the same method he had used years ago when he had the world believing that he had his own TV show and that he was some positive influence influence for children, but in modern day it seems like that influence has been amplified a hundred times over. And with doing so, it's not only like Zemnu wants to resume the positive influence of who he was, but in addition to that, he wants to be the world's definitive Hulk, as well as take the place of other heroes within the people's memory to almost make it seem as he had never left. But even with doing this, it's like he's subbing himself in with pre-existing memories, which is something that can be even a bit more tricky with today's technology. But as we've seen with the fight, and I can't even call it a fight, it was more like a tear down because the Hulk pretty much pulled a J-Rig everything with Zemnu. Like, let's tear down the cyborg and see how it ticks. But with this encounter being cut short, with Dr. McGowan pulling the Hulk out of there, mainly because she knew that the Hulk was doing more harm than help, and that tearing down Zemnu would only make things worse. But on the flip side, this is exactly what Dario Agar wanted. And even to take it a step further, it's more than what he had expected. And the effectiveness of this is the result of a few things that have been in play. Because one, Dario Agar, he controls the majority of the news media, and I wanna say even portions of social media, but with doing so, this allows him to give a majority of the world tunnel vision to what and where he wants everyone to look at. Which for Zemnu literally amplifies his power because it's not like he has to do the old fashioned reaching up to a satellite and transmit a signal back down to whoever might have a television, because now everyone has a television in their hand. Everybody young and old has a cell phone, they have an iPad, and even if they're not watching the news, they're on social media. So with doing that, they're all readily available for whatever influence to make it their way. But also during the process of explaining this to Dario Agar, Zenu also makes his attempt to place his influence over Dario Agar as well. And with doing so, he makes the suggestion of making Earth his new magic planet, but of course it doesn't work because the Minotaur's mind is shielded, and Dario Agar's pretty much like, you want the planet? Planet Hope? Nah, that's not gonna happen. But also at this time with Zemnu needing to complete his repairs, because practically he's a cyborg, and after his recent encounter with the Hulk, not only did he need physical repair as far as his machine parts, but he also needed sustenance for the portions of him that are still organic. And one of Dario's men was like, hey, I'll find somebody that ain't nobody gonna miss, we'll find somebody, and that, that ain't no problem, that ain't no problem. But no, Zemnu was pretty much like, I'm hungry now, I need to eat now. 
And in that moment, Zenu just contorted forward on all fours to where his back opened up like a blender. And it's like you can even see his haunting red eyes glowing off the reflection of the floor. Like straight up out of a horror film. Or like your Tales from the Crypt or even Tales from the Dark Side. And I'd even more so say Tales from the Dark Side because Tales from the Dark Side had your myth of the grither. But on top of this, like jumping back to Robert Bruce Banner. And I say his full name for a reason because the world pretty much goes back through its full history and it's here that we see as a result of Zemnu's influence everything about your Robert Bruce Banner Hulk it has all been flipped and skewed to be perceived in the worst way possible and this stretches all the way back to its origin with the Gamma incident all the way through the events of World War Hulk which is one of those things to where the Hulk ought to be like okay well I'll let, I'll let you have that one because really it, it, it ain't that hard to make World War Hulk sound like Hulk was the bad guy but on top of that and I'm sure it flipped through much more of his history but with it stretching throughout many of these moments and reaching up till now with Bruce Banner declaring war against the world it really just showed us that Zemnu had put into place the complete opposite for the Hulk with making Banner out to be the definitive bad guy but in the case of Banner as far as the general public like the general public they found it pretty easy to turn on Banner and the Hulk but with others who know the two of them like Amadeus Cho and Jackie McGee with them you could see a bit of conflict with reason because with Amadeus Cho, he has like that classic reasoning with, okay, the Hulk might be a little bit crazy, but at least Banner's trying to pull him back and guide the Hulk so he's not completely unhinged, which was pretty much how it was before all the way up to Avengers No Surrender. But I don't think Amadeus is aware of that because at the time, I believe he was on Sakaar. But in the case of Jackie McGee, she's now torn between this place of blaming Banner for the death of her father, but she still recalls the recent acts of the Hulk saving her life and her remembering meeting the Hulk and realizing he's different than what she expected. But after this, jumping back to Shadow Base Site G, to where at this time we know that something is not right with Banner. To where at this time he's looking in the mirror and he's constantly saying nothing is wrong and at this point in time the savage hulk who was in there he's still wilding out because if you guys remember back when dr mcgowan pulled him back to shadow base site g we had noticed at the time that the savage hulk was trying to tell them something and not long after they had gotten back to shadow base devil hulk had taken over for a little while and at the time he had proposed what is still kind of the lingering question what is a hulk which is something that i really feel like the series will double back to when zen Nu and banner go for round two but jumping back to where things are now rick jones comes in to check on banner and it's here where banner tells rick that they've been spending too much attention on roxanne corp and that they should move their focus towards smaller targets to shake up the humans and put them in fear and immediately rick recognizes that this does not sound like banner which it doesn't because this is not the plan of banner because like we talked about before his plan of destroying the world is actually his method of saving the world and even more so saving the people but the key thing to pay attention to in this moment is that bruce banner he corrects Rex Rick Jones here by telling him don't call me Bruce Banner but instead refer to me as Robert Bruce Banner which essentially means that Bruce Banner has been affected by the influence of Zemnu to where at this point not only does he believe the history which Zemnu has fed him of him being the bad guy but it's also in a way skewed his intentions to line up with the fabricated history which Zemnu has given to the world but also at this time you have Dr. McGowan who goes to speak to Doc Samson which she is doing after speaking to the Devil Hulk but with this she shows Samson a recording of her speaking to Rick Jones and Harpy about her history which we had talked about in the previous video with her running into daredevil while she was working for the kingpin and this is a bit of what i was talking about as far as the modern technology working for zemnu but also working against them because when you take factual history and moments from people's memory and you take that in place in their mind something completely different like it doesn't matter how real you want to make that thing appear because even with these screens that are available to everyone you also have cameras so alongside of these memories you also have recordings you have audio you have proof of what truly conspired during that time which is why like those memes that was going around with the deep fakes saying like i'm gonna tell my kids this was absolute carnage like as close as they look things like that just won't work in reality but back to this conversation between Dr. McGowan and Doc Sampson, to where after playing him the footage and confirming that what was said on the footage contradicted her memory, it was here that she realized what Zemnu was doing. Because essentially, it's the Mandela effect, but on a larger scale. Because essentially, the Mandela effect was this thing where a number of people who remembered Mandela's funeral taking place in the 80s, number of years before he died. And to this day, there are a number of articles about this on the internet, like in real life, where people believe like this is proof of alternate realities, so on and so forth. But it's also here where Dr. McGowan goes on to tell Doc Samson that she had figured out that it's the same case with Zemnu's TV show, The Magic Planet, which come to think of it is a contradiction within itself because back when Zemnu had did the whole TV show thing, it was actually called The Astro Nuts. 
<laughs> of which thank god that wasn't a real thing either but on top of dr mcgowan figuring this out like here's another thing because when she asked doc samson if he knows that she was transsexual and samson was like well yeah i knew i just you know didn't want to bring it up but when she mentions this it immediately takes me back to our talks in the previous video about her history before working with kingpin to where i kind of speculated to her working with the weapon x program because she was holding the same captain america cup or a very similar captain america cup with one being a funko pop and the other one being just the shield but now i really feel like she had had this transition between the time she had worked for weapon x and just before she had been hired by the kingpin which could have been possibly for her hiding her identity and not wanting to be associated with weapon x or perhaps even her involvement with like weapon 30 but even now it's like all of this just points right back to her but even still i feel like that's another video for another time but with her more or less figuring out what zemnu has been doing and her realizing that it has taken its effect on her but also realizing with doc samson remembering the old tv shows that zemnu had made which once again did not actually exist this then brings the both of them to the realization that one not everyone is as susceptible to the influence as others may be but with this happening hulks are definitely not an exception which immediately causes them to go check on banner with him punching back into the mirror and expressing that the hulk was being a distraction and on top of that a distraction that he just got rid of but here's the thing like even with your manipulated banner blocking out the savage hulk like savage hulk at this point in time he's really just trying to express the same thing that he was trying to tell to dr mcgowan in the first place when she had pulled him away from zemnu but the problem is just that the savage hulk he's not the best communicator which is why at the time the devil hulk had stepped in but now with the savage hulk still trying to get this message through and trying to smash it through to bruce banner a different hulk then steps forward telling him that he understands what Zemnu is doing and that resolving this is not something that the Savage Hulk can just smash his way through to. And this is where we find out that he's been approached by Green Scar Hulk, who is towering over Savage Hulk. But it's funny because he tells Savage Hulk like, Zemnu isn't stronger than we are. But just to be clear, I'm the strongest one there is. And this is insane because like ever since Absolute Carnage, we had seen the discussion between the different Hulks when they were deciding whether or not they would let the Venom symbiote in. And at that time, we knew that there were more Hulks in there. And we were kind of wondering like, one of the other ones going to chime in. And it's like, now we're finally getting that. And I'm just gonna go ahead and say it. Like, as far as in comparison, like, Zemnu is no match for Savage Hulk. And if Dario Agar could have taken out Savage Hulk by now, he would have. And I'm telling you, man, like, if you take Dario Agar and Zemnu and place them against Green Scar Hulk, you pretty much got a matchup that's looking like two popsicles versus a flamethrower. Because neither one of those guys was built for this force of nature. And I gotta tell you guys, I'm just excited to see Green Scar back. And I just hope that he doesn't end these guys too quickly because I truly want this to take its time and I want Green Scar Hulk to stick around for a while. Because could you imagine like with the Hulk who has taken over Shadow Base, like using those new resources and like refashioning his armor, his weapons, and not even because he needs them, but just like his new toys and accessories to display with this newer version of this Hulk. Like, oh man, like this could be insane. Alright, so jumping right back in, we're still dealing with Banner whose mind has been manipulated by Zemnu, who once again has given Banner these false memories and caused Banner to believe just this history of him being the villain. And I'd say even a better description of that is like he caused Banner to believe that he wants to be the villain or that being the bad guy is truly his motive, which on the surface isn't too far from what him and the Devil Hulk have already been working on. But even with that and kind of leaning into that mindset, there's a brief moment where Banner just kind of thinks like what if he lashed out and acted on this new agenda or these new goals and let's just say that that outcome wasn't pretty in the slightest but even at this point like we've seen before dr mcgowan doc samson and rick jones they've more or less come to the realization that zemnu has been messing with banner's head and because of this very cautiously they try to wheel him back in but as time progresses, it seems like even more of his memories are being twisted, like the death of his father, for example. And here, with his memories manipulated, he says that he did it intentionally. But as we know, originally that wasn't the case. But we know the real story because it's been revisited a number of times. But definitively, as we know, Brian killed Bruce's mother, which is why he wasn't allowed at the funeral. And later, when Bruce was there mourning his mother, Brian came and picked a fight with Bruce. Brian slipped, and he busted his head on his late wife's tombstone. And really, when you think about it, it's a low blow from Zemnu to take a memory like that and twist it. But because of what's going on with Banner, the real answer, though discovered by Dr. McGowan, it can't be solved by her. But rather, this answer has to come from within. Which brings us back to the return of Green Scar Hulk, who we had seen recently 
recently come back to help Savage Hulk who is being suppressed by Banner. But from here where Green Scar Hulk takes Savage Hulk into the mindscape of Banner. Of which Green Scar is trying to get Savage to remember but of course also he wants him to recognize that a few things have also changed around here. But I also gotta say that the mindscape of Banner which is also referred to as the inner world being like Banner's inner world where all the Hulk stay. I'm like I really like that concept and I'll get to why in just a moment. But when they get here you can see like there's a monument of Betty showing that she's revered and almost like a sphinx. And you even got like anxiety manifested with Brian Banner just floating around with all the other villains that the Hulk has ever fought. And it's like look in the sky it's a bird it's a plane no that's my anxiety oh my goodness. <laughs> just floating around like a Goodyear blimp. But it's around this time where Green Scar explains to Savage Hulk like where he's been all this time. Because really and truly we haven't seen this guy in years. But he explains to Green Scar Hulk that he has been working on Banner from the inside. Cleaning this place up and getting it in order. Which is pretty crazy because it really makes it sound like he could have came out at any time that he wanted to. But even with him deciding to stay in here that just leans into the whole ideal of this being the inner world. And who better to reshape the inner world than Green Scar Hulk the breaker of worlds. And speaking of which it's here when they climb to one of the higher pinnacles within the inner worlds to where we see that Green Scar Hulk has taken Devil Hulk out of the leading position. And it's here where he has Devil Hulk chained up again to where this time he says he's not going to let him get back out. But there's also a bit of this factor to where Green Scar Hulk seems to be a bit disgusted at Devil Hulk saying that he's been doing nothing but causing trouble this whole time and ordering everyone else around which we'd more so seen with Savage Hulk because Devil Hulk at times would just take control while Savage Hulk is already hulked out. But it's also here for a moment where Savage Hulk he tells Green Scar to take it easy on Devil Hulk because like we've heard him say before like we're all hulks almost as if he means to really say that we're all the same. But of course with the way that Savage Hulk speaks it doesn't really come out that clear. So Green Scar is like I don't know what you're talking about but don't touch that chain. <laughs> But of course for whatever reason Savage Hulk tries to move the chain and likely to try to help Devil Hulk because once again at this time Savage Hulk sees Devil Hulk kind of as a friend. But not only that he feels like all the Hulks to work together and not be against each other. But when he moves this chain Banner very much catches a chain reaction which on the outside to everyone else who doesn't really know what's going on in his mind it really looks just super crazy. But it's also here where Green Scar lets Savage Hulk know that within the inner world things work a little different and I'm gonna say right now I don't care what world you in you don't lift nothing with that form like that's a recipe for scoliosis but Green Scar lets him know like one in here it's not all about strength and two just as a reminder you're not the strongest Hulk there is but even still like with the strength that Savage Hulk does have Green Scar urges him to help somebody who actually needs it which is something I gotta say like I like seeing Green Scar in this role and I mean I would love to see him come out and just tear things apart which is something we may get later on like I believe if Banner is truly threatened then Green Scar will come to the forefront and do what he needs to do. But at least for now with him working on Banner from the inside it really gives much credit back to that part of him which is why he's the strongest Hulk. Which isn't necessarily because of what happened in World War Hulk but because of what happened before. Because amongst the different Hulks this guy he's the best leader. But while the time he's taking Savage Hulk to where he's needed they then pass Joe Fixit who's like locked in this bubble which was actually Zemnu's doing with locking Joe Fixit away rather quickly and easier because he was one of the weaker Hulks. But it's here where Green Scar Hulk takes Savage Hulk where he's needed and with doing so he takes him to childhood of Banner Hulk which is not what he's named specifically but that's what I'm calling him and y'all can come for me in the comments if you want. But my main reason for doing so is mainly because back in Hulk issue 377 to where once again we entered the mind of Bruce Banner we had seen this representation of his childhood within his mind before which at the time in his mind hulked out so for that reason I put him in the class of hulks. But Green Scar points out the Savage Hulk like this is what you smell in here that's just not right because Zemnu has went for Banner's childhood and started from there giving him the fake childhood that Banner always wanted which isn't the truth at all because really like it or not Savage Hulk is the truer representation of Banner's childhood and not this happy little kid watching cartoons every morning and having every toy that he wanted. 
and I think if I remember correctly, like in Hulk issue 377, the kid hulked out into Savage Hulk, which actually makes what Green Scar is saying make more sense. But with Savage Hulk getting a better understanding of this, it's here where he knows what he has to do. Because when he sees this childhood, he just remembers that Banner, he was a child that grew up with pain. And much like we've heard Savage Hulk say recently a lot, that Hulk hurts, Hulk always hurts, and it was from Banner's childhood where that truly began. But when Savage Hulk breaks through this television and he looks through like this deep hole that's behind it, he sees his way out. And when he does, Green Scar tells him to go through there and get Zemnu, and Savage Hulk is like, I'm gonna get him for Hulk. And man, when Savage Hulk digs through, it is the most uncomfortable looking transformation that you could imagine. But even still, it makes sense with it being a visualization of him breaking through after being in a repressed former state. And though it appears this way, because I don't want nobody to get confused, like this is still Banner's body. But this transformation was more like a shedding of skin. And we've seen it before, but for the life of me, I can't think of when right now. But when Savage Hulk gets out, he lets them know straight up. Like, first of all, Zemnu got people thinking he the Hulk and I'm not the Hulk. And anytime I've said Hulk, people think I'm talking nonsense. And when he's saying this, pointing to everybody here at Shadow Base, he's like, I need to make sure y'all understand what I'm saying. And in a terrifying way, more or less, he's like, do I need to repeat myself? And from there, everybody's pretty much like, okay, sure thing, boss. But not long after that, and also with getting the Hulk a pair of drugs, Draws, the Hulk then explained that Roxxon sent big monsters as a big show for Zemnu. So with that, Zemnu is clearly working with Roxxon, and for that reason, we finna just pull up and bring the house down. And when they get inside, there's like a horde of cybernetic zombies who are transformed by Zemnu that they have to fight their way through to even try to make it upstairs. But I'm not even gonna front like they worried about that because Hulk. And not just Savage Hulk here, but it's a team of Hulks. And so busting down these cyborg zombies ain't nothing. But while Hulk and everyone else is downstairs, Dario Agar sees this on the security footage and he didn't even know about the whole cyborg transformation situation. So not only is he freaking out because Zemnu does not have the Hulk under control, but also he been doing some weird stuff and not telling Dario about it. So Dario hits panic mode, he calls for security, and no answer. And it's pretty much here where Zemnu's like, look at me, look at me. I am the captain now. And it's right there where Zemnu contorts and he puts Dario Agar inside of the cyborg juice machine 3000. And when I tell you that Dario is terrified because Zemnu told him like, I'm gonna give you a first person's perspective on how sausage is made. And Dario is calling out to any guy that he can think of. But rather than just tooling around here all day, Hulk tears out the elevator and makes his way up because he's ready to get to Zemnu to get to Dario Agar. He's ready to end this. And when he does this, only Rick comes with him so that Harpy and Doc can stay back and fight off the cyborg zombie looking people, which in itself is still a messed up situation because those people worked for Roxxon. But when the Hulk made his way up to the top floor, open up a door there, guess what we saw? None other than the chewed up and spit out version of the Minotaur. And the Minotaur, man, I'm not sure if he's not done transforming, but it ain't looking good. Like, what are those beads? <laughs> but immediately after when Zenu sneaks up on the Hulk, like, like, shouldn't you be subduing this planet? <laughs> like, I don't know why. Like, in my mind, he just sounds weird like that. But with sneaking up on Savage Hulk, Zenu then grabs his head, and he then makes his attempt to manipulate the mind directly because he knows at this point that he cannot control the Hulk's body. And even to do that, Zemnu has to draw the energy from the souls of all the people all over that he's manipulated already. And when Zemnu does this, Rick Jones feeds Hulk more gamma energy just to buy him time. And of course, Zemnu's like, oh me, oh my, it is no use. What are you doing? <laughs> but what Zemnu doesn't understand, because in a way, he is winning against Savage Hulk. And Rick even admits that. But then he tells Zemnu to look a little bit deeper. And when Zemnu looks into the eyes of the Hulk, he sees Green Scar Hulk. And when he takes the wheel, literally spikes grow through the arms of the Hulk and out his back, and he hits Zemnu with the one hitter brutality. And Zemnu's done. Like, there's no fight here. <laughs> like, oh me, oh my, some of that. And when Green Scar Hulk does this, he tells Zemnu, Welcome to Planet Hulk. Which really should tell you something, because even though he's been spending all this time working on the mind of Banner and working on the inside of Banner, which at this point has clearly been his choice, but even with doing so, he still considers this his planet. And like, he doesn't necessarily have to sit up a throne nowhere, because he knows, and he knows that everybody else knows what he's capable of if need be. 
And I'd even go as far to say like because of the work that he's been doing internally on Banner that that has also caused a change in him. Because much like Savage Hulk said, Hulk is Hulk. So if you do any good for one of the Hulks, you're doing good for all of them. But also with that reasoning, like look at the spikes that came out through the Hulk's arms when Green Scar Hulk came out this time. Because they're very much like the spikes which are in his armor, which may still even come out anytime that Green Scar comes out from here forward. Which with all things considered could make him a whole different type of beast. But even with that, like it, it also brings me to mind like the Sentry, who's really one of the few people who could even contest Green Scar. And with the changes that we've seen with him recently, and I'd say most recently through Annihilation Scourge, but I think it would be quite interesting to see these two go back at it again. Like now with their newer versions of themselves, just so we can see how that would pan out. But getting back to Savage Hulk, to where he comes back, he sees the spikes retracting. But also when this happens, it appears that the world just goes back to normal. And for Savage Hulk, who didn't really know what just happened, for him, he just like blacked out. And when he came back, everything was done. And when Rick tells him like, why don't you go downstairs, check on Betty and Doc, and Hulk leaves to go do that. And while Rick is here, he has a moment with Dario Agger. And it's pretty strange because the way that Rick is talking, it's almost as if it's not even Rick speaking. But when he's here and he has this moment with Dario Agger, he pretty much tells him like, I'm gonna allow you to live. Because even still, he believes that Dario could be useful but in addition he also lets Dario know that he's no longer in the powerful position that he used to be because some are meant to follow and some are meant to lead and come to find out it is the leader speaking through Rick Jones he's in hell he got the green door in his hand he done pulled a skinwalker on Brian Banner like this is insane Alright, so at this point, we more or less hop into the journal of the leader to where when he talks about his first journal entry, at this point, he claims it's 15 years ago, which I guess is the timestamp as far as Marvel Legacy to where in that case, it makes sense. But for us as the reader, this is actually tells to astonish issue 63 when we had got the original origin of the leader to where before his incident, he wasn't like a super genius. He worked at a chemical waste plant and at the time, one of the containers broke, creating this huge explosion and he was covered in radioactive chemicals. But as we start to go through his journal entries, what we find out is that Al Ewing is taking this same instance and he's showing us that this is when the leader actually first died. And it was from this moment that he went from the man formerly known as Sam Stearns and crossed over through the green door. But even with doing this and returning back, he didn't remember what had happened on the other side, let alone the green door itself. And this is something that Al Ewing has established early on that is not uncommon. And with doing that, it's really Al Ewing's way of making this work with the pre-existing history, which yet again at this point is 15 years ago because back in Tales to Astonish issue 63 which came out in 1965 but of course it would be weird if he was like oh 55 years ago <clears throat> but at that time after the leader's incident like right after he still looked normal much like what we'd seen in the Immortal Hulk but after it had seemed that he had miraculously survived this incident everything that he had read from that moment he would just remember and with doing so he would just like binge learn book after book but it was not long after this that he would later see his physical transformation which at this point brings us around to journal entry point 22, to where at this time he had turned away from his identity of Samuel Stern and cutting all his ties and connections to where for the most part he really just expresses is his brother, Phil, who he would describe as the actual genius who he had known before all this happened. And it's kind of crazy the way that he describes communicating with other people and, and not just regular people, but even other people considered to be geniuses because he had reached such a high level of intellect that for him trying to have these conversations, to him it felt like barking back at a dog, which is nuts, like how you that smart? But with him continuing on and collecting knowledge, this then takes us to journal entry number 35 to where he had made his attempt to steal research from Bruce Banner, which then led him to discover the Hulk. And he expresses that it was here when he first realized that someone else was just like him and it was from then that he was determined to study the Hulk and make him either a tool or an ally but with seeing this the leader figured that if he could study the Hulk not only could he learn more from him but he could also use him as an ally to just take whatever knowledge he needed by brute force. But this then takes us to journal entry 587, which at this point in time is referencing Tales to Astonish issue 73, which at the time took us into the series The Ultimate Machine. And it was at this point that the leader tried to take all the knowledge of the Watcher, which literally overloaded his brain and killed him. Which for the leader, this was his second death. And back in Tales to Astonish, like, I'm sorry, but it, it looked funny because he literally fell face first looking like, bruh. And with that, the way the Hulk was looking at him, like, he's, he's dead. Man, I love some Tales to Astonish. But it's at this point that we see what had happened after. 
because with dying he had seen the one below all but for the longest time like these moments between death and life these were moments that he just could not recall but in the grand scope between the times he had died and the times he had came back like while he was alive of course he would have his former notes and at that point he could backtrack any previous knowledge and for the leader any time that he had came back he had really just told himself like of course I came back because I'm the greatest mind and you know I just figured it out but even for him like something that outlandish it just didn't fit right and over time he had to know that variable in between but on top of this like through the years there's been moments where the leader has either lost his intelligence where it began to fade or even times where he's done it on purpose or more so as a physical change of his appearance for it to be something that played into his plans but even for those times in between he's admitted like in his samuel stern's form that he believes that the leader is just too smart to actually be smart about it and even more so to the sense to where like he's too informed or too knowledgeable to actually use that knowledge and do something that's actually brilliant and when he says this it really reminds me of that Einstein quote to where like imagination is more important than knowledge because for the leader who's definitely in your top 10 smartest people in the Marvel Universe but one of the things that has often restricted him and has caused him to fail time and time again it's not necessarily him not having the know-how but rather it's him not applying this knowledge in a new imaginative way and so at this point this now takes us to volume 2 of his journal entries to where volume 2 entry number 1 it's here where the leader's intelligence is restored which at this point in time now references your incredible hulk issue 343 because after being restored his brain was like crazy huge or, or bigger than it was before but it was around this time that he had brought in rock and redeemer to steal a gamma bomb from the u.s government so that he could use it on middletown arizona and at the time initially this was something that the hulk was able to stop but later on it was then manually set off by the leader but though at the time the leader did do this in hopes of destroying the hulk but also with doing this he had the intentions of creating new specimens because with this area which he had contained which had like 5,000 people but with creating this gamma explosion here he knew that out of that 5,000 he would get at least two specimens and back at the time when he manually set off the blast there was like a total of five survivors of which two of them caught his attention because one was an encyclopedia salesman who had ended up becoming highly intelligent like the leader but then the other father jason mccall he had the ability to bring souls back from the afterlife which for the leader this blew his mind completely but when this happened this moment was short-lived because both him and the leader were destroyed by the hulk and after that the leader he did return through the encyclopedia salesman but it's here going into volume three of his journal where we start to get more of his memories of his encounter or at least one of his encounters with the one below all but after coming back through the body of the encyclopedia salesman bert the leader used him to construct a new body which could travel to the afterlife but in this case remember the things the leader had seen but even after doing Doing so he had described the things that he had seen as things that it would be likely that only banner would understand but looking back at this he remembers being terrified which was a feeling that he usually didn't have as the leader which was a bit of ignorance as bliss with originally not remembering these moments but in one of these instances he was chased by the one below all to where in sheer terror he ran and he called out for bruce who had actually heard him in this moment through the green door but for whatever reason when bruce responded he was like hey this this ain't a good time but the leader's like man don't hang up i'm butt naked and hey but also for the leader this was a defining moment for him because with banner rejecting him this fueled his hate for banner even more which prior to this point his hatred for banner was even more fervent after the hulk had killed the leader sending him here before the leader can learn the secrets of the soul man father jason mccall but it's here where the leader decided that he could figure this out himself and when he stopped running and he turned around the one below all told him once again that you are my child you bear my mark and it was in that moment where the leader was like okay like i can work with this and so now from here we then go into that time period to where General Ross had became the Red Hulk which of course was the handiwork of the leader and MODOK but this also takes us into volume 3 of the leader's journal because along with the leader's different collaborations with MODOK he discovered that gamma radiation and cosmic radiation had their tertiary attributes and even when General Ross had drained the leader of his power even back in his Samuel Stern form the leader continued his studies and even with doing so admitting that his Samuel Stern version of himself is getting smarter but even from here through his next few entries in volume 3 of his journal he mentions that he's collected information from his time with the thunderbolts or even after that when he merged his intellect with an artificial intelligence which he had taken from banner but on top of that he also mentions that he can't help but wonder like in the case of she hulk who was killed by thanos like how much is she aware of the one below all because in her case it's quite possible that she also has similar memories of meeting him much like the leader and much like banner and after this it then takes us to the leader who goes into the fourth volume of his journal and with doing so in a way making it clear that this is taking place after Hulk Vereen's 
and mainly doing so with mentioning that he had to break up with Dr. Alba, mainly because of the research that he was catching on to, it was just way more important. But also with doing this, we see the creature which he had taken from the broken future, of which he had brought back from the next cosmos, where Hulk was pretty much God. But at this point, he more or less mentions that this broken future is more like a clean canvas of which he can use and create his own reality. And with him mentioning this, we also realize that the leader has figured out how to walk through the green door anytime that he wishes. Which is pretty crazy because it almost makes it seem like the green door is giving him access not only to the one below all in a way back from death, but almost as if it's a way to travel through the different iterations of the cosmos. Which is likely something he had put together after learning the relation between gamma radiation and its tertiary similarities to cosmic radiation. But after this, we then jump to a couple months back where we see Brian Banner, who like at this time has been left in the place below all by Bruce just before Bruce's most recent return. And much like before, Brian Banner's been trying to come back, but with doing so he keeps failing. But even with his failed attempts, he's then met by the leader who tells Brian Banner that he knows that he's been failing. And in fact, while Brian has been failing, the leader's been taking notes. But it's here where the leader comes to get Brian Banner out of the place below all, but with doing so offering Brian Banner a way out because at this point, the leader has accumulated enough information on how to become a god, which is insane. Alright, so picking up at this point after our talks about the leader, who recently has made some very impressive strides to say the least, and as far as not only the new things that he's learned about gamma radiation, but it's where he's taken that with everything that we've seen throughout Immortal Hulk, but also what we've seen him do with the accumulation of all that knowledge, which at this point has him on the cusp of godhood, especially with him applying all that knowledge and science to the new discovery of the green door. But aside from that, we then jump over to Bruce Banner, who at this point throughout Immortal Hulk, we've explored so many many layers of Bruce Banner. And not just him, but the many Hulks who live inside. And for a little bit, I want to go over the Hulks that not only we've seen throughout the course of Immortal Hulk, but also how these changes will affect what's to come. Because at this point, we've got to see a bit deeper, not only into Bruce, but also what has manifested these different personalities, which essentially is what all the Hulks are different personalities made sentient. But what this does for us is it takes us into understanding that for one, you have Bruce Banner, who for the most part is emotionally distant, he's timid, and he's a retreater by nature. But aside from that, you also have Joe Fixit, who at this point in time no longer shows up as your Grey Hulk, who unlike Banner is more of your extrovert, he's considered to be more quote unquote ruthless, but Joe Fixit has now become that character with a growing conscience. Which as a reminder, that's one of the main reasons why Joe Fixit is now coming out in the appearance of Banner. Because with every Hulk in relation to Banner, the more that Banner becomes like them, personality wise, and vice versa, it changes something about that Hulk. And in the case of Joe Fixit, this now causes him to manifest best looking like Banner, which is mostly the result in the change of his personality, with him growing a conscience. But now in the case of the Hulks in your hulking form, you then have the case of your Savage Hulk. And throughout the course and history of the Incredible Hulk, Savage Hulk is the one we've seen the most, and he comes off as your more childlike Hulk, and mainly because his communication is very rudimentary, but also because his temper is easily swayed to the environment that's around him. So if you're nice to Hulk, Hulk is nice to you. But if you hurt Hulk, or won't leave Hulk alone, Hulk will smash. And that is pretty much Savage Hulk in a nutshell. But after this, next up we have Devil Hulk. And in the case of Devil Hulk, there's definitely been a lot of confusion between people mistaking this Hulk for Brian Banner, Bruce's father. <laughs> so I, I wanna try and take a few seconds to clear it up real quick. Because for one, even though Brian Banner was recognized as the Devil Hulk first, but inside of Bruce, there's also a Devil Hulk persona who's manifested within Bruce as a surrogate father figure. And this is why the Devil Hulk always takes it personal when somebody hurts Bruce and Devil Hulk also feels the immense need to protect Bruce and it's mainly because he's the manifestation within Bruce of the father that Bruce wished he had. And this is also why the Devil Hulk is so violent because as a child growing up Bruce was always abused by his father and subconsciously like deep within Bruce he always wished that someone would use that rage and that passion to protect him rather than hurt him. And it's literally that abusive nature which has been inverted and turned against the world or whoever may try to harm Bruce that has become the Devil Hulk. And that's also what makes the Devil Hulk so dangerous because he's pretty much like a version of Brian Banner if he actually loved his son. Which really makes him that life-threatening you might just die fighting this Hulk. 
But then after that, you have Green Scar Hulk, who's the most intelligent of the Hulks that I mentioned thus far. And in his case, mainly because all of the time that was spent on Sakaar as a fighter, as a protector, as a lover, as a leader, those are the things that manifested this new identity, or those of which that were new at the time during Planet Hulk. But then this version of the Hulk grew even more throughout the course of World War Hulk after losing the ones he loved so dearly and through the process making the world pay for it, even though it really wasn't their fault. But in a lot of ways, he's very similar to the Devil Hulk. But rather than him being just a Hulk that wants to protect Banner, this is a Hulk that wants to protect Banner and others, which figuratively is a much more powerful motivation, but also in a literal sense, it's the reason why he's stronger than all the other Hulks which I mentioned thus far. And that very much attributes to the logic that as people, we'll care more for others and do more for others, especially that who we love, than we would actually do for ourselves. And also in the case of Green Scar Hulk, at this point in time, he's like the king of Banner's consciousness. And we found out recently that he's the one within Banner who keeps all the other Hulks in check. And he keeps a level of order within Banner's consciousness, not just to protect Banner, but also from what he's learned, also to protect others from the chaos of these other Hulks. And so now where all this brings us now, throughout the course of the Immortal Hulk, we once again arrive in Banner's consciousness to where the Devil Hulk, he is on lockdown. And when we find him here, Banner's trying to free him, but the chains are too strong and Banner can't get him out. And it's very much likely that this is the result of Green Scar Hulk locking the Devil Hulk away. But even still with seeing this, Banner is still a bit conflicted, mainly because recently he started to understand who the Devil Hulk really is. Which to me is one of the best parts about the Immortal Hulk, with Banner's relationship growing between the different Hulks. And it even goes a step deeper when he's met with the arrival of Savage Hulk. Because when Savage Hulk gets here and he refers to him as Stupid Banner, and Banner more or less responds like, is that necessary? Do you really gotta call me that big guy? But as we know, like Savage Hulk, he just wants to be called Hulk. And for every time that Banner doesn't call him Hulk, he'll just call him Stupid Banner. Because once again, he's the childlike Hulk and he'll treat you how he's treated. And even the argument could be made that he's Petty Hulk. <laughs> like Hulk got time today, like Hulk got time every day. But what's really important is that it's also here throughout this conversation to where Savage Hulk admits that he thought that this was something that Zemnu did. Like perhaps this was an illusion of the mind and Zemnu did this to get Devil Hulk out of the way. But as it turns out, that's not the case. And it's also here where Savage Hulk explains to Banner that this is Banner's mind and these chains are practically his doing regardless of who physically put these chains here. And Savage Hulk knows firsthand because for the longest time, he's experienced the majority of Banner trying to get rid of the Hulk, whether it was seeking a cure or getting Hawkeye to do his dirty work. Like one way or another, Banner has provided these chains and it even goes back to before Green Scar Hulk locked up the Devil Hulk, which was something that we were also shown earlier on in the Immortal Hulk series. But along with that, it's here that we see Banner once again try to remove the chains because at the core of the Devil Hulk, Banner believes that there's more potential there. And with Banner after admitting to Savage Hulk that he's constantly retreated to a solution of either trying to get rid of the Hulks or lock them away, but now after talking to Savage Hulk, they both then come to the same page that there is another way and a better solution. But also while they're having this discussion, Joe Fixit is currently at the wheel so to speak, and in the real world he is the Hulk that is on the surface, which is also a product of Savage Hulk defeating Zemnu, and with doing that now Joe Fixit is no longer locked in Banner's mind. But also with much of what we talked about with Banner and Savage Hulk working on releasing the Devil Hulk, this then gives Joe Fixit these reoccurring migraines, which he then explains to Doc Samson roughly a bit of what's been going on in there. But along with this, Joe Fixit, he continues to laud much of the things that Devil Hulk has done. But it seems like even still, like even in spite of that, Savage Hulk is the one who gets to be out in the lead or at least come out the most. And Samson tells Joe that, well, you gotta look at one thing, like he is the people's favorite Hulk, and at least in the moment, because after all, he did stop Zemnu, and for that reason, people are seeing the Hulk in a different light, even after Banner's announcement of the Hulk destroying the world which at this point in the eyes of the public is now being perceived more as the Hulk just destroying Roxxon. Because really to the general public, there's not really this perspective of Banner in these multiple Hulks, but really there's just Banner and the Hulk. And because of that, after the Hulk saved everyone from Zemnu's hypnotism, they now believe that everything the Devil Hulk was saying, it was more so geared towards taking down Roxxon and destroying those who are evil rather than just destroying the world entirely. And partially that was the plan of the Devil Hulk, but by no means was he willing to just stop there. And with him being locked away, it seems like taking down Roxxon was his direct objective, and only objective, because after Savage Hulk defeated Zemnu, Roxxon's stocks plummeted, which then caused them to file for bankruptcy. And with the Hulk saving the day, the people then loved the Hulk again. And once again, mainly because to the general public, the Hulk is just the Hulk, regardless of whichever one surfaces. And because the Hulk is now seen as a hero, the mayor invites him out so that himself and the people can celebrate their champion. 
But before we even get to that, the conversation between Joe Fixit and Doc Sampson is then interrupted by Betty, who demands to speak to Banner. And when she asks this, Joe doesn't get in the way, he lets her talk to Banner. But the reason that she wanted to speak to Banner was to tell him that she's leaving Shadow Base. She feels like she's locked in a cage here and she can't stay in his cage any longer. But because Betty is in her harpy form, Banner asks her to change back so he can talk to Betty. But she refuses to do so, which then causes Banner to walk away, but then she flips out, she's like, I am Betty, more or less telling Bruce that in this form, my word is as good as any. But this leads Bruce to tell her, like, I want you to change back, I want to speak to the woman that I love. And it's here where Harpy says, no you don't, and she leaves. Which now gives us this disconnect between Bruce and his wife, to where in his case, he may be dealing with multiple personalities, but for her, who's to say that her situation is the same? But after this, we then jump over to the public appearance, which is set up by the mayor, which has the Savage Hulk doing some rebuilding in the community, but also meeting with the press to show the public that he's not here to harm people. And a lot of people have showed up here, including Jackie McGowan, who's definitely on the Hulk's side after all they've been through together. But even still, she's a bit confused because most of her interactions have been with Devil Hulk, more so than Savage Hulk. And for that reason, the whole idea of so many media outlets doing this puff piece for the Hulk, for her, is like a very surreal moment. But when one of the reporters decides to be a jerk and he brings up the topic of destruction that the Hulk has caused in the past, it quickly rubs Hulk the wrong way. And when the Hulk responds, he snaps this huge wooden beam with the clench of his fist. And when he does it, needless to say, people get nervous. But rather quickly, like right after, the Hulk calms down. And when he does, it's like a moment of relief for everybody there and the people watching at home. Because right after, Savage Hulk kind of cracks a joke, saying that he just gonna build half a house. And granted, like, while all of this is going down, like, Rick Jones, he was sent out there from Shadow Base just to keep an eye on Savage Hulk. Because really, with him breaking this beam, he does feel bad about it. But when Rick goes to comfort Savage Hulk and tell him that it's okay, like, when he makes contact with the Hulk, the gamma energy begins to surge through the Hulk's body, and immediately the Hulk knows that something's not right. And as Savage Hulk describes it, something is building and building inside of him that is absolutely out of his control. And when this happens, Rick Jones tries to get everyone out of the way because this energy doesn't seem to de-escalate but before you know it the Hulk just explodes with gamma energy which on one hand kind of leaves us at a cliffhanger but even with doing so I'd make the argument that this was done by the leader because much like we had seen before where he had created gamma explosions to try to reproduce the results of the Hulk he had later found that this would not only cause many casualties but statistically with this happening a small number of people within an explosion like this they would then become transformed into a form of a type of Hulk, or if not, someone with a strange power connected to the green door, which would in turn teach the leader more about gamma radiation. And also, I gotta say, like in this case, I believe that Jackie McGee is gonna be that one person who comes back with some sort of power. Because if you guys remember, for the longest time, she's had this intrigue with the Hulk, if you will. Because even though many years ago he had destroyed her home, which then caused her father to work himself to death in order to provide for her, but underneath all of that, she has admitted that when she had first seen the Hulk, in in that moment, she wanted to have that strength and that power. And I wouldn't be surprised if she's one of the few who just got it. All right, so jumping back in, we pick up from the aftermath of what had taken place in issue 35. Because when the mayor had invited the Hulk out to Georgeville, Iowa to do some rebuilding and show the nicer side of the Hulk, which was a great idea until the pessimistic reporter decided to come through and poke the bear. But this then led to Rick Jones calming the Hulk down. But at the time when we had seen that Rick Jones had made contact with the Hulk, we quickly noticed that something had transferred to the Hulk, which then escalated and led to this super huge gamma explosion. And it was done at the time with a lot of mystery around who caused this but we of course had our suspicions given the leader's track record with not only experimenting with the hulk but also learning that he create new hulks via gamma explosions like back in incredible hulk issue 343 but with us seeing it happen, we already knew that there were a number of casualties. But just after the explosion, when we see Jackie McGee still standing there after expecting the worst, it's here where we find out that she was shielded by Rick Jones. And the overload from the gamma explosion just contorted his body in a horrific fashion. Almost as if he had been bitten by a radioactive roach and giraffe at the same time. But if you guys remember like some of the comments from like our last talk on the Immortal Hulk, like I remember a lot of you guys feeling the same way that I did. Like, man, this is so messed up. Because I feel like a lot of us just connected with how bad the Hulk felt about this. And it's kind of messed up because when Gamma Flight arrives, and I don't know why for some reason I want to call them Alpha Gamma, and it's probably just their connection with Puck, Sword, and Carol Danvers. <laughs> but these guys are Gamma Flight, not Alpha Gamma. That, that name is taken. 
But the thing is when Gamma Flight arrives here and they don't assess the current state of the situation, like they immediately just go on the offense and they attack the Hulk no questions asked. And Jackie McGee at least tries to talk sense into them because they fail to acknowledge that the Hulk isn't even trying to resist. And really if he was, they definitely know. But it's here with Jackie trying to help the Hulk and talk these guys down, where Titania then gets physical with Jackie, pushing her further away, which then gets the attention of the Hulk, who doesn't like when his friends get hurt. And it's kind of funny because when Absorber Man is like, oh, you're not going to break this Hulk, which is a bold statement from somebody barring a portion of the Hulk's powers in order to hold the Hulk. But when he says this and the Hulk literally breaks that hole, like immediately, Carl Krill got a brutal reality check that let him know that this was a mismatch. And it kind of made me think of like, if you ever been like playing basketball or playing anything with someone and you're kind of just letting them do their thing, but then something happens where either they get too cocky or whatever, and you just got to switch it on one time. Well, that was this. And the Hulk switched it on like the green light and it was go time. But we also come to find out like as a result of the Hulk being tampered with, which caused the explosion. In addition to this, the Hulk's anger along with the radiation has been spilling out, which is also taking its effect on Gamma Flight, amplifying their initial reactions and causing them to go that much harder. And right here, like, I really got to give a lot of credit to Joe Bennett, who not only is an amazing artist, but also with the way that he used the wreckage in the background to create the lettering to spell out Sal Buscema, who had illustrated the Incredible Hulk throughout the 70s, because words within the wreckage of a Hulk comic, like, it just makes it feel like a Hulk comic in a very classic way. But in the case of Gamma Flight, with them failing to subdue the Hulk, which was to be expected, but it's here where Krill hears that Titania, that she's not doing too well herself. And because of that, when he thinks of a way that he can help, it's here where he then absorbs the gamma radiation, which there is an abundance of in this area, and he immediately turns into the gamma cloud monster from the Ang Lee Incredible Hulk movie. And I'm sure a lot of you guys forgot about that, <laughs> and probably intentionally. You're welcome. But it's also at this time back at Shadow Base where Dr. McGowan and Doc Samson, they've been trying to figure out ways to help. And initially they wanted to just teleport the Hulk out of there, but with the excessive gamma radiation, it caused a problem because his location just blended with the rest of the area. But also at Shadow Base, when Dr. McGowan sends Doc Samson to get a thumb drive from the main lab, which has more translocation information, which will help get Rick and the Hulk back. But when he goes to get this information, Delbert Fry, who's been at Shadow Base for the longest, and since the Hulk took over, they've been trying to help him, but for the most part, he's been in this suspended state. But when Doc walks in, Dell's hand reaches out and just melts the head of one of the scientists, which is super odd because with all the time that Dell has been in there, and even in the rare moments that we've seen him speak, but prior to this point, he hadn't been showing signs of hostility. And then all of a sudden, this happened. But when it does, we quickly find out what was the cause, because immediately after, we then go into this loop of Dell's memories. And just for a bit of history, Dell's father, Dr. Fry, he was an expert in gamma radiation who found solutions to cure many people from illnesses, but his brilliance later turned into an obsession at the passing of his wife, Dell's mother. And in the case of Dell, back in college, he was a star quarterback, and his father would inject him with this gamma serum that he made in order to make his son stronger and less prone to injury. But back at the time when we seen his father do this in Immortal Hulk issue 2, the results were gruesome and fatal, with Dell's eyes bleeding with gamma-saturated blood, but also him seeing the green door to which he said he sees someone looking back at him. And at the time, that was it just before he died. And prior to this point, it really came off as if it was the one below all. But this time, when we go back into that memory, it's the leader who's looking back through the door, who also then comes through the door as the younger Dale is dying and trying to tell his father what's happening. And it's kind of crazy because on one hand, the leader is entering his mind in order to take over and use Dale's body. But then there's also the thought of Dale, like back when he died, him looking at the green door and actually seeing present day leader. And it's pretty insane just pondering that idea with the preview that we've seen going into the next multiverse. But at this point with the leader taking Dale's body and revealing himself to Doc Samson, because at first Doc really wasn't sure who it was. And then the leader just peeled his muffin cap back and Doc was then like, oh, okay. I I see it. But then just after doing this, the leader then drags Doc Samson to the below place. And when he does this, it's almost like the reverse of what we've seen with She-Hulk in Immortal She-Hulk issue 1 when he expelled Jennifer from the below place and back into her body during Empire. But as soon as the leader brings Doc here, and the leader then opens four green doors. And when Doc sees this, he immediately freaks out. And he lets the leader know, like, the forces that you are playing with, they're not the type that you measure with science. Like, it's beyond controlling and just bending to your own will. And even with Doc saying this, like we know that the one below all is at least watching and it's not like the leader is just doing all of these things undetected. And when the leader tells Doc his plans for the four doors, he only tells him what he's doing with three of them. Like one's for Rick Jones, one's for Dale Fry, one's for Doc, and the last one is a secret. 
but is also here with the leader then explains what he plans to do with the red door. And at this point, we know what the red door does from Immortal She-Hulk. Like the green door will get you out, but the red door will prohibit you from leaving. And even while the leader's having this conversation with Doc Samson, like simultaneously back in Georgeville, Iowa, we also see his words being uttered through Rick Jones. So at this time, the leader is juggling Rick Jones and Dale Fry while keeping Doc Samson on standby, but also with an extra green door up his sleeve. But back in Georgeville, Iowa, while the Hulk is going up against Carl Krill, who at this point has absorbed the gamma radiation along with some of the Hulk's anger, which the anger part really doesn't do anything for absorbing man, beside from just absorbing anger, because it's not like the anger is going to make him stronger too. He just has a lot of gamma radiation on his side right now. But while they're having their bout, Puck from Gamma Flight, he's trying to get a clear shot. And he's carefully waiting for the right opportunity because it's not like you can let one off, miss, and the Hulk see what you're trying to do. But back over at Shadow Base, while the leader is using Del Fry's body, and very much in a puppet master type of fashion, with him using Del Fry's body and Rick Jones at the same time. And even like for a quick minute, like when the leader passes by the body of Doc Samson, he debated on using Doc's body to get access to Shadow Base and the equipment, and really just thinking of all the toys that he could make, but then he's like, no, I'ma stick to the plan, everything's about to fall into place, with Hulk fighting Carl Krill, Puck lining up for the shot, and Dr. McGowan trying to get Rick and the Hulk back at the same time. And with doing this, the leader's like looking over the shoulder of Dr. McGowan and just counting down. Because when Dr. McGowan brings Rick back, the leader is still watching for his window of opportunity. And with Rick being teleported back to Shadow Base, like looking over Dr. McGowan's shoulder from across the room, though creepy, it's his best seat in the house at the time. But it's also here where Puck lines up for his kill shot on the Hulk and he takes it, lobotomizing the Hulk, effectively killing him and allowing the leader to lock him behind the red door, which then gives the leader a small window to use that last green door, that fourth door, and take the Hulk's body. And when he does, oh my goodness, we've got a green scar leader Hulk, which is all kinds of bad and I can't wait to see where it goes from here. And I'm hoping in some way that it brings another Hulk that we haven't seen from Banner's personality disorder into this series. All right, so prior to this point, we had seen that the leader had a plan to kill the Hulk and send him to the below place so that he could lock him behind the red door. And this is why he had set the Hulk up so the hard part would be done by Puck and the others because killing the Hulk is not easy, so you definitely want to delegate that task if possible, which is exactly what the leader did. But also with the leader seeing this plan through, there's a couple things that did and didn't work out. Because for one, the shot that Puck had took, it didn't effectively kill the Hulk, leaving his living body still in a state of recovery, but also within this moment of near death, it gave the leader the opportunity to use that mysterious additional green door, which he had intended to use to take control of Banner's body. And because of that hiccup, this only brought the leader into Banner's mind. And so from here is where we go into a bit of a flashback into Banner's childhood, but I want to go a little bit further back and talk about Brian Banner for a minute. Because before Bruce was born, Brian and his two sisters, they were abused by their father. And for a long time, Brian had believed that his father had this monster gene that he would someday eventually pass down to his children. And initially, he believed that his solution to this was just to not have children. But then after meeting Bruce's mother, Rebecca, his paranoia of passing down the monster gene, it then increased. Because before Brian had got Rebecca pregnant, he had went through a gamma incident at his job when he had overloaded the machine in the process of trying to create clean gamma energy, which then exposed him to gamma radiation. And after this, Brian had went through tests at his job and he checked out and everything had said he was fine, but he had always believed that he was different. And then when Bruce was born, he had then feared that he passed down both the monster gene, but then also his gamma infused genetics. And Brian Banner had noticed that this had affected Bruce's mind more than anything else at a younger age. Because even from the time that he was a toddler, Bruce would put together these intricate puzzles, which proved that his mind was more complex than it should have been for a child his age. But rather than raising Bruce with love and figuring out these things with his son, protecting his son, and nurturing Bruce's curiosity to learn, Brian was instead fearful and very abusive. But as a result of these gifts that for the most part lay dormant within younger Bruce, you also then have the addition of his multiple personality disorder, which he wouldn't be diagnosed with till way later on. But this in combination with his unique genes, it caused him to create different identities, some which reflected from himself and some which were projected from others. And for Bruce early on, this is where the Devil Hulk was formed. Because in Bruce's mind, with the combination of reading things like Paradise Lost, which pulled much of its context with Eve's discussion with the serpent, to where at the time the serpent told Eve, like, go ahead, eat from the tree of knowledge, 
which was something that Bruce connected to being that he wanted to learn so bad at a younger age, but for him, the more he would learn, the more he'd be reprimanded and abused by his father. And it was because of that early on that Bruce had perceived this serpent figure to seem more like the father figure that Bruce believes that he should have had, who initially was this figure who wanted him to embrace knowledge, which is where the first seed was planted. But then over the course of time, this figure would then begin to develop within Bruce's mind as a part of him inside begging to get out and defend Bruce from Brian. And this is really the reason why Bruce himself had locked away the Devil Hulk. And it's mainly because for the Devil Hulk, like there was no line, there was no limit, like there was nothing it wouldn't do to protect Bruce. And for a majority of Bruce's life up until recently, that scared Bruce. And because of this, he would constantly push the Devil Hulk back in his mind. But this identity suppression also led to much of the reasoning of why the Savage Hulk had came first. Because for Bruce, rather than giving in to the request of the Devil Hulk, he would instead just smash things with pure rage, which was still a rage that was a byproduct of his father's abuse, but this one he would let out more often and freely. But also, just as a reminder, none of these hulks would manifest physically until Bruce was exposed to the gamma explosion, which then released the hulk which was least suppressed at the time, which from that pure rage was your savage hulk. But jumping forward to present day, we see that the Devil Hulk, he still holds that father figure within Bruce's mind, like of the ideal father and protector of not just Bruce, but also all the other different Hulk identities that sit within Bruce's mind, the inner world. And at this point, the leader has the Devil Hulk locked away, but even with doing this, Devil Hulk still sees and he's watching both Savage Hulk and Banner hurting, but just out of his reach which as we know from the Devil Hulk, that is something that he takes personal. And even up to this point throughout Immortal Hulk, he's mentioned a number of times the fact of him taking it personal anytime that Banner's hurt or even anytime the Hulk's been attacked. But it's also here where we see the leader dragging Savage Hulk through the inner world to where for one, he's surprised that that shot from Puck didn't kill him. But then also he hears Savage Hulk crying for his daddy. And initially the leader doesn't think much of it. He just laughs it off. He tells him daddy's right here and he pops him on top of the head. But also with doing this, he then drags Savage Hulk over to where he has Banner and Joe Fixit restrained as well. And this is another one of those things, cause like, if you guys remember, throughout the course of Immortal Hulk, the different Hulks have been going through different changes, which all have been stemming from Banner's relationship with that particular Hulk. And at this point, Joe Fixit, who's been stuck for a while in like this Banner-like form, he's asking Banner to change him back, but it's not like Banner exactly has it figured out like that. And even though it's his mind, it's not like he can just snap his finger and change Joe Fixit back into his gray hulking form. But then it's also where the leader reveals himself here to Banner and Joe Fixit while also filling them in about using the green door to get into Banner's mind. But with doing this, he's spreading himself too thin because he's also bragging to Doc Samson, controlling Rick Jones and Dale Fry. But while he's doing this and using the body of Rick Jones to communicate with Dr. McGowan to where at this point he's soliciting her help in order to have all the resources of Shadow Base at his disposal. But while he's doing this, Doc Samson realizes that the leader is too distracted. So he then grabs like the steel beam that's within this piece of concrete and he goes upside the leader's head with it and like i'm not really sure why there's like all this debris and items inside of the below place and neither is doc samson he just found something and made use of it but the thing is like when samson had did this dr mcgowan she also took the opportunity to take care of rick and when i say take care of rick i mean like teleport a portion of his body to a different location but also when this happened we found out that the leader he could feel all of this he could feel the hit from Samson, obviously, but also in addition to that, Rick being torn in half, which for him was a new discovery at this point. But then also with seeing this, Joe Fixit taunted the leader, which then provoked the leader to push his plans into the next phase, which in this case was sending Bruce back to the below place and locking him down there with the red door. And this is where the story starts to go Dragon Ball. Because as the leader's approaching the door, he then hears a boom from the other side of the inner world. And when he sees this, he immediately realizes that this is the Devil Hulk, who has broken out of his prison and leaped in to rescue Banner. And when the leader sees this, he's absolutely confused because prior to this point, he believed he was the strongest Hulk in Banner's mind. And it had also seemed at one point that Green Scar was as well. But the Devil Hulk gives the explanation that within Banner his mind that there's no other Hulk stronger than him. And aside from Banner locking away the Devil Hulk himself, out of fear of the Devil Hulk, he was only locked away recently because of the underhanded influence of Zemnu that had been toying with Bruce's mind. But aside from this, I'd also say like as far as the strength of the different Hulks and their hierarchy within the mind of Banner, 
it makes sense that the Devil Hulk would be the strongest. And not just because he was the first Hulk created in the mind of Banner, but also because the Devil Hulk was created within the deepest psychological pain of Banner who was raised in an abusive home. But also with that being the case, and I know with saying this, it's going to start a war off in the comment section, <laughs> but I don't care. But I also believe that the Devil Hulk should be the strongest Hulk that there is, whether in Banner's mind or outside. And if you think about it, the Devil Hulk has never really had his time to shine because we've never really seen the Devil Hulk in his purest form fully unleashed. And before anybody tries to use Chaos War as an example, it's really not, because with the Chaos King resurrecting Brian Banner, infusing him with the Devil Hulk and Guilt Hulk, it really didn't give us a demonstration of the Devil Hulk in his purest form. But then when you come to your case of your Green Scar Hulk or Heart of the Monster, for the most part, these are like your top two examples of where Banner either agreed with the Hulk or didn't hold the Hulk back, because he had given justification to that Hulk's rage. Like in World War Hulk, when he had believed that he had lost his entire family in this new light that he was building on Sakaar, he was just as mad as the Hulk, which unlocked the strength to levels that hadn't been seen before. And then in the case of Heart of the Monster, which was another instance where Banner just let the Hulk go, this Hulk in this moment then displays strengths greater than Green Scar. But then in the case of Devil Hulk, who has barely seen the light of day like prior to Avengers No Surrender, he has always been held back within Bruce's mind if not locked up completely by Bruce because he is terrified of what this Hulk in his purest form in raw strength is capable of. And the scary thing is like from Avengers No Surrender throughout the entirety of Immortal Hulk, Bruce and the Devil Hulk have been growing closer and closer. And so now this puts us in the place now with no Zemnu in the way and Bruce not holding the Devil Hulk back, giving us the opportunity to see some of what the Devil Hulk is really made of. Although at this point within the mind of Banner, but once again the strength of the Hulks always depends on the relationship with Banner and the pain associated with their creation. Unfortunately Unfortunately enough, the leader gets to test that out, while feeling everything even in the leader's hulking form. But so now aside from this, cause we're kinda left with this cliffhanger, but I do really hope like in the next issue that we see the return of Goblin, Guardian, and Glow. And we've talked about them a little bit before throughout this playlist and how back when the Hulk was on the Defenders team, Nightmare had used the Hulk to attack Doctor Strange, so Doctor Strange then sent the Hulk to the Crossroads Dimension, and it was there in the Crossroads Dimension where Glow, Goblin, and Guardian like physically manifested to the Hulk. And it was back then we first got the explanation of how Hulks were created within Bruce his mind because Banner had also created these three to help the Savage Hulk at the time to put his thoughts together and wheel him back with reason. But over the years we really hadn't seen much of them since, so fingers crossed that they really make a return within the Immortal Hulk. Alright, so jumping back in we start off with a flashback with the leader back when he visited Brian Banner. And prior to this point we have known that he's been to the below place and mentioned his interest in Brian Banner and the fact that he was studying him. But up until now we had never seen like that full conversation or how it played out and we had only seen the initial interaction with the leader offering his leadership. <laughs> but now there's so much more. Because now in this flashback, when we get the full scope of this conversation, we see that the leader directly approached Brian and it initially has Brian on the how did you get here and why would you want to be here kind of thing. But as it turns out, the leader, he admires the knowledge that Brian Banner has, but he doesn't believe that Brian's goals are set in the right direction, which is where the leadership thing kind of comes in. But also with the leader being able to make his way to the below place at this point, he also acknowledges that Brian is able to do things at this point in time, which the leader hasn't figured out yet which more specifically are things like influencing other hulks from the below place. But also what's interesting is like, aside from Brian Banner not having the same goals as the leader, like within this conversation, the leader also admits that Brian had only gotten so far because he also didn't have the amount of resources that the leader has. Because at the end of the day, if Brian did, he wouldn't be stuck in the below place. But it's also here where Brian, he doesn't take credit for his ability to influence other hulks because he lets the leader know that that was the one below all. And the one below all, he needs a host or a mind or a soul to wear like a mask and mainly because to himself alone, the one below all is just an entity of desires. And with him working through Brian Banner for all these years, the one below all, he's just been limited to the desires that line up with Brian Banner. But even still, somebody has to hold this position, which essentially is why Brian Banner has been stuck here for so long, which is another place of conflict because Brian doesn't wanna be here. But then it's also here where the leader tells Brian that he wants to take his place, which for Brian sounds too good to be true because for him, he's like, okay, that's perfect. Because with hearing this, he believes like, okay, this is my ticket out of here. But what Brian didn't realize is that the leader, his plan of leading wasn't as pleasurable as Brian would have expected. 
because what the leader meant by leading, air quotes, he had actually meant consuming Brian Banner and in that way absorbing all of his knowledge at once while also using his connection to the one below all with the benefits that come along but no obligations. And with doing this, the leader makes this deal with the one below all to carry out the desires that the one below all has because the leader tells him that he essentially wants the same thing. And with seeing this now, like it really explains why the one below all had allowed the leader to continue to make his way in and out of the below place without coming after him or seeing him as some type of threat. And it also explained the extra skin laying around that was definitely not sponsored by D-Brand. But in addition to this, now that we know that Brian Banner was consumed by the leader, we now know that this was the extra trick up his sleeve, aside from creating these green doors that the leader had been hiding all this time, and not just for his own reasons, but also fulfilling his deal with the one below all. Because it's here where the leader tells him, like he knows the one, like his deepest desire is destruction, he wants to be the last remaining presence in the multiverse, and he wants to completely destroy everything until nothing is left but him. And the leader lets him know that like, he's seen this firsthand but not only that he also wants the one below all to achieve this as well and i gotta say like with hearing this on one hand you could take the leader at his word and perhaps he is being completely honest with the one below all but at the same time i feel like the leader is just siding with who he knows is gonna win or at least how he's seen the far future playing out and really he's just making this deal until he could figure out a way through science to usurp the position of godhood in the next reality <laughs> man the villains have been aiming high this year goodness but going back to the latter end of this flashback after the leader had absorbed brian banner immediately he had came to an awareness of everything that brian had known about bruce but also this made the leader aware that the one below all he wanted bruce the most because his connection was strongest and this is where the plan essentially is stemmed from with the leader creating his red door and finding a way to lock banner in the below place for good but then fast forward to where things are now in the inner world which is within Bruce's mind, Devil Hulk is destroying the leader and Joe Fix it, he's loving every bit of it because for him it's like front row at the fight. But then it's also here where we start to see like the complexity of Bruce Banner work against him in a sense because although Bruce sees this and he recognizes that this is the Devil Hulk at full capacity holding nothing back with the fullest rage of the Devil Hulk from his childhood but on the other hand with Savage Hulk and even though Joe Fix it is like kill this dude, Savage Hulk's like no I don't want you to kill him and it's here with the leader reveals the portion of him that is Brian Banner but the leader tries to do this in like a sneaky way saying that it was his father all along but because we know the leader's in full control of Brian Banner plus he told the one below all like he was literally gonna get into Banner's mindscape and break down his support system so it's like we know what the leader's doing here but with him playing the role of Brian's father it one distracts the devil Hulk who's trying to figure this out but then it also strikes a nerve with Bruce with the leader giving this speech from Brian Banner saying how Brian is always a part of Bruce which really hit a nerve when he told Bruce like the way he had treated Betty recently that it was very Brian Banner of him and when he says that it triggers Bruce and it lures him right in allowing the leader to then grab a hold of Bruce and at this point Devil Hulk he's like okay I'm gonna just end this dude like we killed Brian Banner before let's do it again but the leader mentions though he was concerned about Devil Hulk he's not worried about him anymore because he's constantly on a leash within the mindscape of Banner and usually this is done by Banner himself because the Devil Hulk his love for Banner it burns like the fires of hell and because of that he'll do anything for Banner which is what makes him so powerful and so dangerous and it's here with the Savage Hulk he holds the Devil Hulk back begging him not to kill Brian Banner who truly is a part of the leader at this moment but with Savage Hulk like from his core with it being rage and frustration like he never wanted the intentional death of his father but it's in this moment where the leader takes the opportunity of the Devil Hulk being restrained once again and he rips the Devil Hulk's head off spinal cord attached then he pulls his heart out and tears it four different ways and man like when this happened like I got mixed feelings about it because on one hand I just want the Devil Hulk unleashed completely untethered and unleashed but even still up until now we've only got that for like a brief moment so now this can only mean one of a few things which could be one devil hulk is dead for good which i doubt because it's the mind of banner and it's only permanent if banner makes it permanent but then two because this sends the devil hulk to the below place it's just like a way to make the devil hulk separate from banner outside of banner's mind but number three which i feel like is most unlikely but i would still love to see We'll talk about that in just a minute. But after the leader kills the Devil Hulk, he then takes the Banner persona through the green door to the below place. And when this happened and like Bruce is like yelling for Joe, like don't let him do this. So it's kind of like now he wants Joe to 
fix it. <laughs> but at this point, Joe, he don't even know where to start. And even now, like Joe can't get over the fact that Savage Hulk helped the leader do this, albeit unintentional. But nonetheless, Savage Hulk isn't the least bit strategic and they paid for that in this moment. But after this, we then take a step on the outside of Banner's mind and we see where his physical body is which at this moment is at the Alpha Flight Space Station where his body's been physically imprisoned because of the incident in Georgeville, Iowa. But even still on the inside, it's a sad situation because Joe, he's screaming at Savage Hulk like look what you did because Devil Hulk's dead and Banner's in the below place and Savage Hulk is super sad because he knows at the end of the day that he did play his role in this. But then it's here where we jump over to Banner in the below place where half of his body is kind of tied to the Devil Hulk and surrounded by like 60 different green doors and it's here where we see the leader has head into the next stage of his plan using Banner who he had brought here and the body of the Devil Hulk that had arrived here after his time of death. And here's where I want to insert number three as far as the realm of speculation and possibilities. Because for me, like the third thought that comes to mind is the possible appearance of another Hulk. Because between Bruce, Joe Fixit, and Savage Hulk, there's a, a lot of sadness and guilt going around. So hopefully this will lead us to another scenario where we get the appearance of the Guilt Hulk once again, who we had first seen in Hulk issue 377 when Doc Samson was trying to cure Banner's multiple personality disorder. And within Al Ewing's series Immortal Hulk, we've seen Doc Samson kind of try this again. And because of that, I think it would be pretty cool to see Doc find a way to help Bruce by bringing this Hulk back to help him out. And for number three, part two, of course, this next one's gotta be Club. And in this case, of course, there's a bit of an asterisk because the way that this Hulk had came about in the Axis event with Savage Hulk hulking out through sadness. But if there was ever a time to truly make this a thing, like Al Ewing has everything in place to make it proper. And aside from that, like I just wouldn't mind seeing Claw come back. Like he's another Hulk we just don't get much of, or really any of for that matter. So with that, I just think it would be nice for him to take an official seat within the dimensions of the different Hulks within Bruce's mindscape. Alright, so jumping back in and mainly picking up from our previous talk on the Immortal Hulk King and Black tie-in, to where at the time I also included a brief discussion about the main beats that we had seen within Immortal Hulk issue 40 and 41, to where at the time we saw Joe fix it, escape the Alpha Flight space station and making his way to Coney Island with the Savage Hulk in the body of Banner. And at the time this then took us through his encounter with Ben Grimm, which first started with a fight but then led to a conversation of both of their experiences with Resurrection, but then ultimately Ultimately, this led us into the King of Black tie-in, which had no dialogue, but even yet and still, it was an amazing issue, especially if you read it after Immortal Hulk issue 41, after that conversation where Ben Grimm tells Joe Fixit, like, hey, take care of the Savage Hulk. But from here, jumping back in and following the events from the Alpha Flight space station after the escape of Joe Fixit, it was here at the time when him and Savage Hulk were captive and we came across Henry Peter Gyrich as the acting commander of the Alpha Flight Interstellar Defensive and Diplomacy Initiative, which is also over Gamma Flight, meaning that they have to do what he says too. But with seeing him here, some of you guys may recognize Henry Gyrich from X-Men the Animated Series or even some of the later Avengers or Fantastic Four cartoons. But if not, just know that he originally worked for the US National Security Council, and from there he was sent to be head of operations for Project Wide Awake, which was the government's response for beings becoming too powerful and potentially overthrowing the government. And Henry Peter Gyrich is notorious for taking his job to the extreme, because when his focus was mainly mutants, he wanted to pick apart everything about them, down to each mutant DNA matrix and what gives them their specific powers. And Gyrich, like, he's been doing this for a while, and along the way, he's brushed the feathers of the Avengers, the the Fantastic Four as well as the Thunderbolts because he believes the world needs strict rules in order to survive and not just be overthrown by whoever. But if you don't fall in line with those rules, then Gyrich has no problem in taking you out of this world, one way or the other. But it's also here where we find out what had happened with Doc Samson who had managed to get away from the leader in the below place because not long after he had made his way to the land of the living but with doing so he had came back in the body of Walter Langowski which at the time was being held in suspended animation within the Alpha Flight space station which had then gave us this Doc Sasquatch situation but with him coming back and arriving here at the space station he was able to inform Gamma Flight and Jackie McGee about what he had seen in the below place about the leader's involvement and the leader's ability to control Gamma Mutates. But even before Leonard Sanson got here in Walter's body, Jackie had been trying to tell the others that the incident and the explosion, that it wasn't Bruce. And initially she had believed that it was Rick, but when Leonard came back, he let them all know that it was the leader all along. 
But then after the escape of Joe Fixit, Gyrich then holds a meeting with Gamma Flight, pretty much asking them how did they let Banner escape and he wasn't even a Hulk. But with calling this meeting Gyrich, he's very much using a foot on their neck type of tactic. And with doing so, he even sent a text reinstating warrants out for Absorbing Man, while also threatening your Doc Samson Sasquatch amalgamation with throwing him into the same cell that the Hulk was in earlier. But even with doing this, like he did ask Doc Samson, like, where is your actual body at? And when this happened, like Puck, he was like, well, you know, that is a good question. But Doc Samson lets them know, like we'd seen before, that his body is still at Shadow Base Site G. But he lies and he tells Gyrich he doesn't know where it is. And Leonard tells him that he didn't ask because he was trying to build trust with Bruce. And Gyrich, he really just doesn't buy the narrative. But with hearing this, like Gyrich, he then, of course, goes off, telling Doc Samson that he can lock him up and torture the answers out of him. But then Doc starts drawing on the glass and immediately everybody in the room gets nervous because without saying a word doc lets them know like hey everybody in this room could be just like joe and we all can be a whole bunch of asteroids but with doing this the thing that he does tell Gyrich is that he's experienced death and from his perspective that's the easy part and from there Gyrich, who had initially gave his troops the order to shoot and they didn't because they know better but from there gamma flight they just walk out on Gyrich, and he doesn't make the effort to stop them because he already has a backup team in mind to bring in in their place but after this going over to dr charlene mcgowan we then pick up with her two days after the leader's simultaneous attack back when the leader had opened the three doors taking over the body of rick jones and dale fry simultaneously just before he took doc samson to the below place but it's here where we pick up with charlene that we find out that she's confirmed that the other scientists have made it out and i mean everybody except for Irwin, r.i.p Irwin but also that she's made her way to one of her unofficial shadow base safe houses so that she can work out of this location in the event of any unexpected emergencies, much like the one that had happened two days ago. But then it's not long after where we find out what Dr. McGowan is working on, when we then go over to Jackie McGee, not long after being demoted at the Arizona Herald, which then led her just to quit altogether. But it's here where we see her go back to her apartment where she's met by the arrival of Dr. McGowan, who Jackie nearly pepper sprayed on site. But with finding her in her home, it's here that we find out that Dr. McGowan has been looking for other gamma mutates in order to help out, which she's been searching for with her gamma reader, which initially Dr. McGowan had used only to make sure that her own readings were safe. But with using it now to track down others, it's here where we find out that Jackie McGee is a gamma mutate since the incident that occurred in Georgeville. But in Jackie's case, she doesn't hulk out, but instead she's able to see gamma ghosts and gamma signatures that otherwise just wouldn't be visible to the naked eye and initially it freaks jackie out because she sees a lot but at the same time you can tell there's a bit of disappointment there because throughout this series leading up to this point jackie has expressed that she has wanted to have a piece of the power and the privilege that the hulk has but with it being delivered in this way it's not exactly what she had imagined but then again like in a twisted and kind of weird way like it might be and I say that mainly in reference to like Civil War 2 after we had got the death of Bruce Banner because back at the time Matthew Murdock he had then stepped in serving as the attorney executor of Bruce's will and back when this happened Bruce's will was delivered through like a hologram recording but with doing so Bruce's message for Doctor Strange was that even though he doesn't think he had mentioned it before he did want Doctor Strange to know that the Hulk could see ghosts or at least what the Hulk had believed to be ghosts and with Bruce knowing this he had recorded all the data that he could within a book and he left that information with Doctor Strange after the time of his death and it's something that may come back who knows but after this then going down to the blow place to where the leader notices that something is missing within the feedback loop that runs through Bruce Banner and from what the leader understands Bruce's alternate identities they're up in the land of the living which means that there should be a gamma feedback loop that cycles through increasing gamma energy in the below place but for whatever reason that's not working and for the leader like whatever the answer is he believes that he should have it since Brian Banner made it work and the leader consumed and became Brian Banner and it's here where Brian shows up to the leader and he tells him like he's wearing their souls like just a mask on stage but what the leader doesn't understand is that with him wanting to take Brian's place what happened to Brian Banner has to happen to him the leader because with what the leader had did to Brian the one below all had did this to Brian first and with the leader snatching Brian's spot the leader then had to undergo this process himself and it's here where the leader realizes that the missing link wasn't between Banner and the living world it wasn't between Banner and his alternate identities but the missing connection was between him and the one below all 
But after this, we then jump over to Doc Samson, or Doc Sasquatch, whatever you want to call him. But it's here where he takes Puck and Shaman to Los Diablos, New Mexico, which is the site of Bruce's original Gamma incident, but then also the location of Shadow Base Site G. And they've come here to see if they can find Doc Samson's actual body. And of course, this is all information that he clearly lied to Gyrich about, as far as him not knowing where Shadow Base was. But also with bringing Shaman back into the mix, Shaman makes it clear that he's only here to help his old friend, Walter Langowski, the original Sasquatch. But then from the ground which starts rumbling towards them and out from it pops your reawakened Del Fry who also has a bit of Rick Jones growing out the side. And initially when they see this like for Doc Samson who's now inside the body of Sasquatch but for him he thinks back to the last moment that he had seen Del Fry which was also here at Shadow Base when the leader had used Del to kill him. So immediately when he sees this monstrosity, he just attacks because he believes that this is the leader and he's come back again to finish the job. And when Doc Samson lashes out, Puck and Shaman, they notice that Dell and Rick, like they're not fighting back. And Shaman lets Puck know like part of Doc Samson lashing out here, it's not necessarily him, but it's that rage from Sasquatch that he hasn't quite grown accustomed to yet. And when Shaman suggests that they make a distraction in order to wheel Doc Samson back in, we then get the arrival of Dr. McGowan and Jackie McGee. And the two of them have come directly here because Dr. McGowan had got a spike reading in gamma radiation. And for that reason, her and Jackie dropped what they were doing and they came here to check it out. And with them showing up here, like their arrival worked as that distraction, which Shaman had mentioned, to calm down Doc Samson. And when things calm down, immediately Doc Samson notices that Del Fry didn't fight back. And just as Dr. McGowan gets ready to blast this thing, Jackie then tells them that what they're looking at is not the leader. And it's here when she mentions this, when Shaman takes a look through her eyes and he then sees that it's Rick Jones along with another young man that he doesn't recognize, who we know from before is Del Fry. But it's here with seeing this that he explains that the two of them, they're in conflict with one another within this one body. Because sharing a body, let alone with this physiology, it's something that neither one of them are used to. But Shaman also expresses that he's a little familiar with similar situations which are more commonly expressed within the conversation of parasciences, which leans into the similar topic of astral projections or entities being formed from psychic turbulence and visitors from other planes. But even now, like a lot of the knowledge of these things are just in theory to most. And Shaman tells Jackie like at one point, his grandfather tried to teach him all about it, but Shaman pushed many of those teachings away. So he never learned like the delicate intricacies of situations like this. And because of that, at this time, all he can really do is attempt to put Rick and Dell within a better alignment in order to give them some comfort because trying to separate the two from this state is just way too risky. But while Shaman Puck and Jackie are up top with Dell and Rick, Doc Samson and Dr. McGowan, they've went down into Shadow Base looking for Doc Samson's original body. But when they get down there, the body's gone. And as it turns out, like a couple miles away, the body is down the street, hitchhiking through the desert. But then it's here that we find that Walter Langowski had also came back. But with doing so, since his body was taken by Doc Sampson, Walter had then came back in Sampson's body. And with doing this, he introduces himself as Walter Sampson, while also kind of giving off the vibe that he doesn't want to go back to his old body. But after this, we then jump back over to New York, where we have Joe Fixit and Savage Hulk within the body of Bruce Banner, which once again gives us a number of Easter eggs throughout New York City, like left and right. But at this time, while Joe is pretty much just scamming his way through town and laying low, and he also thinks about how much Bruce would disapprove of him stealing some rich guy's credit card, who didn't notice because he was too busy on the phone, yelling about how much he only cares about his tenants who can pay rent. So Joe Fixit stole his wallet, maxed out all his credit cards on Jewel, and then pawned the jewelry and just kept the cash. And with doing this, Joe kind of thinks to himself like, man, like what would the Avengers say? <laughs> like what would Spider-Man say? And with thinking this over, he then comes to the conclusion that this is one of the main reasons that him and Bruce are not the same person. Because even when Bruce wanted to quote unquote end the world, he sat down and made an announcement because he needed everyone's approval. While Joe on the other hand, he doesn't. But even still, there's a catch to that, which we'll talk about more in a little bit. But also like while Joe is going on about his way, you also have Guy Rich in the Alpha Flight space station, who's preparing his new team to come after the Hulk the next time he shows up. But then it's here with Joe where we get a bit of the blurred lines between the idea of him not being Bruce Banner because he's not the hero and he doesn't need the people like Bruce does in his opinion because it's here when he's walking down the street and a couple officers yell out hey Hulk guy and initially Joe thinks they 
recognize his face and they're talking to him, but then he quickly realizes that this isn't the case when the officers push Joe to the side to chase down a kid who's likely a member of the Hulk's supportive team, the Team Brigade. And it's interesting that these officers would run past the face of Bruce Banner, who's well known for being an Avenger and being the Hulk, and you can't say like with shades you just don't know who this guy is. But with their logic, they figured that this possible teen supporter was more of a threat than the Hulk himself. And because of that, they run right past Joe Fixit. They chase this kid down for questioning. They start roughing him up. And initially, Joe is like, look, I'm not going to get involved. I ain't the good guy. And he looks at his reflection with Savage Hulk. And he pauses for a minute like, are we? And with doing this, he asks Savage Hulk, like, what do you think? And it's here where they both agree that they need to step in and teach these guys a lesson. And when this happens and they hulk out, Joe just lets Savage Hulk have at it. And when this happens, like he doesn't harm the officers. He picks up their car, slams it on the ground, tears it in half, and he tells them to leave his friend alone. And with seeing this, like these officers are terrified because in the case of these two cops, like attacking an unarmed kid, that they have no problem with. But then for them on the flip side, when it comes to assessing the actual threat, suddenly it's just like they're in uncharted waters. But right after these cops flee the scene the hulk is then blindsided by the ufos who we've talked about recently in some of the maestro videos where i talked about the ufos who had tried to recreate the incident with exposure to cosmic energy that it gave the fantastic four their powers but also at the time banner had tried to bring them back before the overexposure of cosmic rays altered their genetic structure and ever since they have hated banner because essentially they believe because of him they were pretty much undercooked but they made their way here finding the Hulk because they are the B team who Guy Rich had put in place after Gamma Flight had walked away. And when Joe Fixit let Savage Hulk take over to help the kid, this is what gave up their location, which is how Guy Rich knew exactly where to send these guys. But with them popping up here and attacking the Hulk, like the fight pushes all the way from New York to New Jersey, which isn't too far driving, but fighting, like come on. But when this happens, like they take their turns to where with one of them gets hit by the Hulk, the other one then gets their chance to step in. And with doing this, the last one up was the member of the team by the name of X-Ray. And for X-Ray, James Darnell, who's the brother of Vapor and Darnell, with his abilities, he's been transformed into pure energy. And since the cosmic incident, he's been able to produce different forms of radiation, but also manipulate radiation as well. And in this moment where he finally gets his turn to attack the Hulk, he then bombards him with cosmic rays, which are like anti gamma radiation and with doing this he saturates the hulk down to a cellular level hoping to take him down for good and when he does this he effectively sends joe fix it and savage hulk to the below place to where when they get there they immediately find the leader who at this point has completed his circuit with both brian banner and the one below all And when they get here, like initially Joe tells Savage Hulk, like, don't worry, we're good. We can just go back through the green door. But the leader then locks the door by turning it red, like we'd seen before in Immortal She-Hulk. And with trapping them here, the leader then lets them know that because his circuit is now complete, he's going to induct the two of them like he did Banner turning them into hollow servants who would just feed his power. And it turns into this all out brawl of them just trying to stay untethered from the leader. And while this is happening and Joe's eyes start glowing red. And when this happens, like I want you to keep a couple things in mind here. Because for one, throughout the course of Al Ewing's Immortal Hulk, since Joe Fix's return, he was one of the first of Banner's disassociative identities to undergo a drastic change, which like we talked about before, it associates with his relationship with Banner. But in his case, when he returned, like instead of turning into the Grey Hulk when Banner needed a fixer in Shadow Base Site B and B is in Bravo. But when this happened, Joe Fixit then came to the surface of Banner's body under that artificial sunlight and he found a way to switch the emitters to Gamma in order to bring back the Hulk. And when this happened and Joe took over from Bruce, it's not like Bruce made this happen with intention, but instead Bruce needed a fixer and the fixer, he came to the forefront. But from the time that this happened, Joe noticed something because he realized what were supposed to be the rules of like the Hulk not being able to come out at night and things like Joe only surfacing in his great form. But along the way with Joe keeping these things in mind and figuring things out, he also realized that these rules that they lend for a number of possibilities and even loopholes if used in a clever way. Because it's here where we see Joe's eyes glowing red, it's because back in the land of the living, X-Ray is still shooting cosmic rays on top of Banner's body. And with this happening, Joe admits that he's been holding out. 
because with X-Ray charging every cell of Banner's body with cosmic energy, Joe then uses that energy to Hulk out into a cosmic powered anti-gamma Red Hulk. And when this happens, like Joe fix it, he doesn't freeze time and like stop and look in the camera and start explaining the nuances of how he pulled this off. And I'm sure we'll get a fuller explanation in issue 46. But if I had to guess, Joe fix it had just figured out with himself and Savage Hulk being untethered from the leader that he could more or less pull off the leader's same trick by drawing from the cosmic energy that X-Ray had saturated his body with down to the cell and use that power to fight off the gamma energy which the leader had on his side. And even with doing so, it's not like he had enough to break out Banner and take down the leader, but he was powerful enough to punch the red door in order to get himself and Savage Hulk back to the land of the living. But even with seeing this, like Savage Hulk looked at him and was like, what, you the red Hulk now? <laughs> But Joe just looks at him, smirks, and says something like that. Because even though they're the same color, this is a whole different situation we got going on here. And we'll definitely talk about the return of Thunderbolt Ross later on. But this is different. Though, Thunderbolt Ross has absorbed cosmic energy before. But this is something different. But with this happening, Joe fix it, he just punches the red door, bringing himself and Savage Hulk back to the land of the living, which is nuts. Cause for one, the leader kinda had a trick up his sleeve using cosmic energy to create the red door and block gamma mutates from coming back. But even still, Joe fix it figured out a way around it. Much like we had seen when he escaped Shadow Base Site B, to where at the time he said it's not all about being smarter than the other guy, but instead finding an opportunity of when that other guy does something dumb, leaving you a window of opportunity and when they come back he tells the ufos like they had their turns each and every one of them and now it's the hulk's turn and they're just stuck with the pikachu face like every last one of them and it's hilarious all right so jumping back in and continuing to where at this time joe fix it has just returned from the below place with savage hulk back into banner's body but with the twist of cosmic energy surging through his veins but also with the gains that we haven't seen in months so thanks to joe the hulk has a hulking stature again and he's ready to take his turn on the ufos and in the case of the ufos like they were only still here with the body of banner because they were still waiting another 15 minutes for gyrich to send his people and come collect but before we go into Joe's rematch we first jump over to Shadow Base Site G because at this time where we have Doc Samson Sasquatch, Jackie McGee, Puck, Shaman, and Dr. McGowan and they're standing over where Doc Samson's body was last seen and initially Puck makes the assumption that the leader has come back and taken his body and with hearing this Leonard's like no it was Walter Langowski the original Sasquatch who's come back and taken his body and just ran off with it and Jackie asks him like how could he be sure and Doc Samson responds like it's just a hunch like he doesn't know for a fact like he's seen it, but it almost seems as if he can feel a connection to Walter with them both returning from the below place and swapping bodies. But also with them seeing this, like Shaman mentions with them being in this quasi magical territory that important hints and hunches will come to them. And with saying this, he reaches for his radio and Dr. McGowan's kind of like, what is that? And he's like, it's, it's a radio. But also when he pulls out the radio, like Puck asks him again, like if he's gonna stick around. But like Shaman had mentioned before, he's only here to help his former teammate, Walter Lingal. And aside from that, he has his teaching position and his medical practices to get back to. So for those reasons, he may be in and out because he has other responsibilities and obligations. But when he turns on the radio, he hears it cut in and out with news breaks about a battle in Manhattan with law enforcers, but then also a statement from Guyrich saying that the Hulk had been secured by the UFOs. But with them hearing like bits and pieces of these breaking news announcements, they initially hear about the Hulk's encounter with police in New York, but with hearing this in the radio cutting in and out, they miss the details of the Hulk being quote unquote secured in New Jersey, which is where the fight moved to. But with the radio breaking in and out, they believe all of this has happened in New York. And so with hearing this, like with believing that this is the current state that Bruce is in, Dr. McGowan tells them that the Hulk is going to need help. And Shaman lets them know like he can't get involved, he has to get back. And Puck's kind of like, that's cool because he's done plenty with helping Rick and Dale Fry, who are still merged but shaman was at least able to ease their pain but also it's here where rick jones chimes in and even with him trying to speak here like it's hard for him to think separate thoughts from dale fry while they're still in this merged state but when rick chimes in he tells them like we have to help bruce he's my friend he saved me so i save him always and he's kind of begging these guys to help him and go with him to new york to help bruce so puck is then like let's take a vote and it's unanimous with the exception of shaman who's like i got better things to do <laughs> But then also the case of Jackie who's hesitant and likely because of her new powers but she agrees to go because it's where the story is and it's also where they'll find answers. But then from here jumping over to New Jersey 
where at this time Joe Fixit is getting his turn and he's like alright who first and when he says this Ironclad is the first to run up because before when Gyrich had sent them in to fight the Hulk and Ironclad had only seen like this scrawny Hulk who they had beat down and taken out like Ironclad was disappointed and he feels like now like with facing the Hulk where he's closer to his usual hulking size like this will be the fight that he expected to begin with but when he steps up and throws the first punch like Joe just breaks his hand effortlessly and when this happens Joe's like you know what I've always wondered like are you metal all the way through or are you just a hard shell with some squishy organs inside and when Joe grabs his head and gets to figuring it out the rest of the team is just like oh my god and when this happens like x-ray he's like first of all like vector you do something because x-ray had already hit him with his cosmic rays and that's what got them here so because of that he just goes behind vector like dude get in there man and with vector being pushed into the fight like he he tries to like say it with confidence like he, he's kind of like i got this so he knocks back joe just to get him off of ironclad who at this point is throwing up who knows what after having his head squeezed like an orange to where his brains probably pour it in his stomach but i'm no doctor don't listen to me but with Vector knocking Joe back and telling Vapor to turn into some type of anesthetic to put him to sleep or to go over and help Ironclad and she's just like you know what bump all that and she turns into sulfuric acid gas going into the Hulk's nostrils but he then just inhales the rest of her willingly like he just takes this huge hit and he holds it and Vector points out that is the atmosphere of Venus that he has just inhaled and he's kind of like just give it time it, it'll it'll sink in it'll do something but then joe goes over and he exhales vapor in the form of sulfuric acid gas in the face of vector and when this happens vapor she tries to switch to alkali to neutralize the burn like as quick as possible but in response vector hits joe super hard sending him all the way back to new york telling the hulk to leave them alone which for one reminds me of like the classic hulk request to be left alone and joe kind of plays on it like hey well vector all he really had to do was ask but then again like back in the day whenever your savage hulk had asked to be left alone nobody left him alone so it almost feels like joe is getting a bit of payback here for the big guy but just after this we then hear from henry gyrich who's up in the alpha flight space station and he's getting the update from vapor on what just happened and he's kind of like okay let me get this straight so you guys had him and you just threw him away and vapor she's like well not exactly like that vector blasted him and he went flying away like back towards the manhattan area and so now gyrich is flipping out like what you sent him towards a populated area like he was weakened how did you let this happen and x-ray just cuts him off like well something bulked him up again i'm don't ask me what <laughs> because with the hulk being juiced up on cosmic rays x-ray is like he's really not trying to admit his involvement in that part but what i really like here is like with gyrich trying to chew them out like vapor she makes a very valid point because with gyrich going on about i hired you guys you do what i say and i expect you guys to deliver and vapor is just kind of like look we did our job and had your containment crew been here any sooner then vector wouldn't be blind and ironclad wouldn't have been maimed and she tells gyrus like if anyone's to blame it's him for moving too slow and in response gyrus is kind of like whatever we'll spin it in our benefit in front of the media but then also he has to take it to the next step swallow his pride and call the avengers who prior to this point we talked about before he's given them a hard time because in the past when he was assigned by the government to watch over the avengers and report like irregular activities he would also restrict them from traveling to certain areas and at one point he even deemed them a threat to national security but now given the situation situation and circumstances he's got to call them for help but after this going back to manhattan where we have wings food and drinks which at this point in time is like your len wing easter egg which is another thing i love about this series like the easter eggs are everywhere but when we get here like joe's at the bar and he's asking for a drink and mainly in celebration for destroying the ufos but when he gets here like the bartender and everyone else like they are terrified of him and i don't blame him because regular hulk is scary as is but now with the red eyes and the red glowing veins like i just imagine that doesn't help him look more welcoming but initially joe just kind of plays off of it and he makes a joke like off of the tv show cheers when the bartender's like you're the hulk and joe's like well i guess this is a place where everybody does know your name but with joe coming here and chasing everybody off like he acknowledges that he forgot what that felt like but then he also admits that here like it doesn't feel as good as it used to but after downing an entire pitcher of beer joe tosses it and he asks for something stronger like some whiskey perhaps so he can then think of his next move and then thor comes in like pour me some mead and in the way that the legends do it served in the skulls of my enemies and he just smashes joe in the face with Mjolnir with little to no warning little warning but little to no warning 
but with Thor arriving here like he is very much holding on to the last encounter from Immortal Hulk issue 7. When back at the time Brian Banner had Bruce's body and he hit Thor one time making him tap out. But even though at the time it was Brian Banner in Bruce's body, for one neither then or now is Thor aware of that and to him the Hulk is just the Hulk. But also since then up till now Thor has also gotten his own upgrade with becoming the new king of Asgard. And Thor tells him like before you surprised me and I'll admit I was humbled. <laughs> knocking a tooth out will do that but also he calls him out because he tells him like the hulk has declared the world is his enemy and because of that thor will either beat him into submission or he can just accept thor's mercy and just bow and so now like just as a reminder like declaring the world as their enemy like that was devil hulk and bruce banner like joe fix it had nothing to do with that and in response joe doesn't just clear it all up for him or even try to explain himself and he tells thor like look i'm the hulk and the hulk don't bow to nobody not skinny hulk not me when I'm stuck as Banner, not when all hope is lost, and not even when he was dead. And he punches Thor out into the streets and he tells him like, if you think I'm gonna start bowing now, you got something else coming, cause that's not gonna happen. And after this, when Joe steps outside, all the Avengers are there. But then also it's here where we find out that Thor, he was just supposed to go inside and talk to the Hulk. But when Joe sees everybody out here like ready for round two, he asks them like if they're gonna pull the same thing that they did in Iowa and just blow up Manhattan. And when saying this like T'Challa lets him know like look man we can't just let everything you've been doing like just go unchecked. And even with your strength restored it's seven against one. But also with this happening like I also want to insert here. Like recently with the Hulk getting knocked in and out of New York that with this happening this had recently gotten the attention of Betty Ross who we had last seen around the time of absolute carnage back when she had killed Bruce in order to make him Hulk out and after that when he came back hulked out she then flew him over to her father's body but after that she had just taken off and I'm pretty sure this is the last time that we had seen her aside from like the whole mix up with Zemnu when she initially left but now with her back in Manhattan she senses Gamma and this is what leads her back to the Hulk who at this point in time is Joe Fixit and Savage Hulk but when T'Challa tells him that it's seven against one <laughs> which really didn't make a difference last time so I don't know what point that's supposed to make but with T'Challa saying it's seven against one it's here in front of the Avengers where Betty shows up and she tells them no it's seven against two but even with this happening as we know there's more on the way with everyone coming from shadow base on their way to New York with the belief that the Hulk needs help all right so jumping in like where we left off like for starters after Joe Fixit and Savage Hulk left the below place, returning to the land of the living in Banner's body, and with doing this like Joe Fixit is at the wheel. So to celebrate their escape, he goes to the bar and boom, he's then confronted by Thor who was supposed to just talk to him, but instead he went in swinging and he told the Hulk that I'm going to break you like the beast that you are. On top of Thor saying that he's going to get a drink himself out of the Hulk's broken skull. And it's a bit extreme even for Thor just to open up like that, but with the fight escalating in between the two of them and Joe fix it knocking Thor outside the Avengers were then out there waiting for round two of the Hulk versus Avengers fight that went down in Iowa which didn't go so well for the Avengers and this time it was about to be seven against one but Betty showed up and right after she got there it was just a throwdown in Manhattan and it went crazy like from zero to a hundred just like that which is also a bit suspicious but also like as soon as this happened you had like on every channel Hulk warnings like we interrupt this program type warnings but with seeing that it kind of makes sense at this point and I'm not sure if it's like set up like a tornado to where you have like your Hulk watch and your Hulk warning but it should be some type of precaution that people just know to take when the Hulk is fighting anyone whether he be right or wrong but with the Avengers going from zero to a hundred on the Hulk like they're really going all out and you got Blade who jumped on the Hulk's back putting two swords in his shoulder but the Hulk just snatched him out and he asked him like hey can you turn into a bat and of course Blade was like no and the Hulk just threw this guy out of sight and like with Blade flying like I just imagine him because Blade doesn't scream like he more or less does a growl so I'd imagine Blade just being like Ugh. But just across the starlit sky. <laughs> but after Blade gets tossed, Cap tells Tony to go get him. But Tony doesn't want to go get Blade because he knows that the Hulk did that to separate them. But Tony goes anyway and when he does, he knows that Blade would also agree with him on this one. 
But then on the flip side, you got T'Challa, and in his opinion, it's not about the numbers because he believes in the power of a single disciplined warrior. And he sets his Kamoyo energy daggers to maximum strength. And it seems to be extreme like everyone else on the Avengers, but in the case of T'Challa, there's a little bit more going on here. But with T'Challa making the statement about a single disciplined warrior, Joe reminds T'Challa that that didn't necessarily work last time. And T'Challa tells him like he was trying to talk last time, but with how that played out, like he learned his lesson. But throughout all of this going on, and it's literally chaos, She-Hulk, Jennifer Walters, she's narrating throughout this entire issue. And what I like about that is the fact that this is her first time meeting back up with Bruce and Betty since she had died and went to the below place like we'd seen in the Immortal She-Hulk one shot to where we saw her come back after her recent death in the Empire event, which wasn't her only death, but much like we'd seen with Bruce and everyone else, except for Brian, and we gotta talk about him, by the way. And I don't mean by the end of this video, I mean like he needs his own video, like it's that serious. But like I was saying with Jennifer, just like many of the other Hulks, she only remembers her time in the below place from her recent resurrection. And I got a link to the video down in the description to where at the time I called the video All Hulks Could Die. But <laughs> fast forward to now, Joe literally fixed it. But with Jennifer being here now and remembering the blow place and remembering when she was there, she saw the leader and he threatened her with a permanent death. Like this made her aware of the leader pulling strings from the blow place while also using it against Bruce and everyone else. But even here, while she's narrating through this whole thing, she talks about how in the past she's been subject to Bruce's influence and how she's tried not to make his mistakes. But at this time here, she feels like something is very different because with all of this going on, she notices that almost everyone else is being subject subject to this influence except for herself like she's disconnected or dissociated and like with all this chaos breaking out like she doesn't know who to help on either side and then next you have gamma flight who shows up and when they do puck he tells carol like they're here to take over the situation but even with him saying this like carol danvers she is up to date and she knows that at this point gamma flight no longer has jurisdiction over the hulk since they had parted ways with Gyrus just before the UFOs had stepped in. But when Carol calls them out, like Dr. McGowan's like, oh, okay, well, so much for that. And she blasts Carol Danvers with a translocation device, sending Carol back to Dr. McGowan's old base in Arizona. And doing this really just to get Carol out of the way, because if not, she definitely would have stopped Gamma Flight. But then after this, back to the Hulk and Thor. Because with the Avengers having this rage amplification, you got Thor over here who's talking that talk. But in the middle of all this, like, Thor tells the Hulk, I know what you are, the hidden blight behind the world tree. You are the darkness of Midgard made flesh. And it almost makes it seem like Thor knows a bit more about the Hulk than the other Avengers do, which would make for some pretty interesting future Hulk stories just saying. But after saying this amongst many other things and also still clearly influenced by this rage that Jennifer was talking about, Thor then literally smashes the Hulk's fist into smithereens. And I've never felt like I've used the word smithereens like as appropriate as right now because that fist is gone. But then with doing this, the Hulk or Joe fix it, he gets clever once again. And as his arm is healing, he punches at Thor's head, allowing it to heal like right over his face, suffocating Thor like it's just K Chaotic. And in order to get Thor out, T'Challa then cuts the Hulk's arm off. And with this happening, from here, Jennifer, she notices, in the case of T'Challa specifically, that she's seen him angry before, and this isn't that. But rather, in his case, unlike everyone else, he's being very calculated, and he's trying to neutralize the Hulk in order to stop the immediate threat, and then later deal with the real threat. Because throughout all this chaos, there are hints and clues to like what's really going on here. Like for example, when Captain America sees Rick Jones in this crazy looking state for the first time and Steve told Rick like, I'm sorry this happened, like who did this? To where the Hulk is like, you kidding? Like who is it always? Like in most cases when there's Hulk shenanigans going on, the leader has something to do with it. And this was one of the things that Jennifer had eventually picked up with T'Challa moving so calculated and it's because he wanted to stop the Hulk to end the immediate danger first so that after that, the next solution would be the leader. And at this point when T'Challa jumps back in after helping Thor, he yells something over the Hulk screaming, but we don't see what it is like Jennifer couldn't quite make it out. And with seeing this, Betty steps forward and Jennifer thinks that Betty's about to help out, but Betty stops and she looks at Jennifer, which then lets Jennifer know like at this point now she's got to choose between her team and her family and she chooses family. And with making this decision, she hits everyone with a thunderclap, creating enough space for Dr. McGowan to get them out of there just as Iron Man and Blade get back. And just like Tony said earlier, like going to get Blade wasn't the right move and Blade totally agreed. 
but with them leaving like at the last second jennifer rushed over to gamma flight and the hulk and she told them like where bruce goes hulk goes which in this case wasn't too far away but really just far enough like from manhattan to brooklyn and i'm pretty sure blade got thrown further than that earlier but with them getting here which is just far away for them to get rested up and figure out where to go next but then here's the thing with jennifer because like i mentioned she had been narrating this thing the whole time but her narration through all of this has really just been through her thoughts because once again her words she's having a harder time trying to get them out so when titania asks her like why did she help them and even though jennifer really can't get the words out but in her mind jennifer explains that her words are too small and the leader is too big just explaining again how his influence from the below place hasn't only been pushing most of the avengers to rage but also holding jennifer back and at this point there's really nothing the avengers can do about the leader not with the power that he's amassed now in the below place because through betty's thoughts she explains that the avengers like they're just not equipped for this because even with all the chaos that went on on this day the avengers their solution was surviving the chaos but jennifer says that surviving it's not enough and in order to beat this you have to love the chaos like a hulk which is like our hint more or less towards the solution to stopping the leader because this is something that only banner and the other hulks can truly resolve but even with seeing this it also has me thinking of the chaos case of Walter Lingowski who's still out there running around in Doc Samson's body because at this point there's no telling where he went or what he's up to but I guess we'll know pretty soon all right so with getting into Immortal Hulk issue zero from the most part this issue pulls from Incredible Hulk issue 312 from 1985 and flashback Incredible Hulk issue minus one from 1997 and on the surface, issue zero feels like an anthology type issue where you more or less have reprints of either story. But I would argue that there is so much more within this because in the same way that Incredible Hulk issue 312 had did a retelling of the Hulk's origin and not so much in the way of changing it, but rather just adding more detail. So where then a little over 10 years later with flashback Incredible Hulk issue minus one, Peter David at the time was like, you know what? There's more history here on top of what we had seen in Incredible Hulk issue 312. And with going into Immortal Hulk issue zero, you've got to look at it with that same lens while also considering the events we had seen taking place throughout Immortal Hulk. Hulk. and so buckle up for this one because we going for a ride but jumping into immortal hulk issue zero like when we start out we see brian banner in the cemetery searching for rebecca bruce's mother and brian's wife who he had killed and with seeing this like this part of the story and a huge emphasis on the word story but like this part of the story it picks up after a moment from incredible hulk issue 312 which i'll talk about a bit more in a little bit but for the time being just kind of keep that in mind because while brian's here at rebecca's grave and he's trying to dig her back out and he's yelling to her like stop faking it you're not dead and it's here where he instead digs up the glow ornament that bruce had had from a child that we saw bruce leave here in incredible hulk issue 312 and so with seeing this, this is where Immortal Hulk issue zero goes back to Incredible Hulk issue 312, which for the most part, I won't go too deep into just so we can stay on the topic for this video. But throughout the course of this Immortal Hulk playlist, I have referenced the mess out of this issue. So I'm pretty sure you guys that have been watching for a while, like you're pretty familiar with it. But just as a brief reminder, Incredible Hulk issue 312, back at the time, it took us through a very in-depth story of Bruce Banner going back to his birth and showing us Brian Banner's paranoia of his son inheriting a monster gene both from Brian's father and the radiation that he had passed down through his own genes and his wife dying in child labor but what I want to focus on again for this issue is the structure of Guardian Glow and Goblin because after Bruce's Gamma incident which caused him to physically manifest into the Hulk to where then later in the issue we head over to the crossroads and it's here where we're introduced to Guardian Glow and Goblin and with these three you have Guardian who's like your archer that represents his instinct for self-preservation which definitely failed Bruce when he went out there to save Rick Jones at the test bomb site but then you have Glow that represents Bruce's ability to reason and Goblin that represents his rage and so now like the creation of these three it truly started with bruce being born with gamma radiation within his dna and we could go further than that and talk about eternals and deviants and how mutants are truly made in marvel comics but i really want to streamline the point for this video because it's going to get wild in a little bit but in the case of bruce banner who was born with gamma radiation in his dna which was passed down from his father brian and his overexposure to gamma radiation this caused bruce to be very intelligent as a child to where even through the anger and the abuse of his father he had created 
glow guardian and goblin in the likeness of the representations from the ornament that his mother hung over his crib to the toy that his mother gave him that he had sought to be like a protector to where even at times the two of them would work together as far as the doll and the ornament with the ornament shining bright and the doll standing guard but always from a child Bruce has tied their physical appearance into these different roles from the experiences which he had from a child and it was the same case with Goblin who Bruce had seen through the rage of his babysitter and also through the rage of his father who had feared Bruce's crazy intelligence from a young age but then also years later just before the gamma explosion Bruce would notice this rage again in General Ross when he intentionally broke Bruce's guardian ragdoll because Thunderbolt Ross thought the history between Bruce and his parents made him too soft to build the bomb that he wanted, which was really messed up. But also within this story, within Incredible Hulk issue 312, we go back to the meeting between Bruce and his father Brian at Rebecca's grave when Brian found Bruce here on the anniversary of his mother's death which for the record like this moment is before the Gamma incident so at this time Bruce is not able to physically hulk out yet but with us going back to this day like this is a huge takeaway from us getting Incredible Hulk issue 312 within Immortal Hulk issue 0 because when Brian found Bruce here the two of them hadn't seen each other in about 15 years and at this time Bruce had heard that his father had gotten out Bruce had heard about it but he hadn't seen his father all these years up until this day. But then when Brian saw Bruce here, he attacked Bruce telling him always knew you're a monster, I know that you're a mutant and he told Bruce that he was going to spread the word and like tell the world about his son's radiation spawned intelligence that Brian believed that Bruce was going to use to end all humanity. And from here when Brian begins to leave, Bruce tells him that he's not a mutant because if he was his powers would have developed in his adolescence but in the case of Bruce he's always been smart and because of that he sees everything that is father is saying is nonsense but as we know the radiation did make Bruce smarter and he was born with this gift so in a very Franklin Richards type of way Bruce has always been a mutant but with closing off our talk about the Incredible Hulk issue 312 it was here at the end of this encounter between Bruce and his father to where Bruce left the glow ornament at his mother's grave because his father always dimmed his mother's light and Bruce's reasoning was to make his mother forget his father by making his mother proud of him which is what later led Bruce to strive in his accomplishments and eventually build the Gamma Bomb. But then it's here where we jump to Immortal Hulk issue 0 to where we again see Brian's reasoning and it's here where he comes back to Rebecca's grave in the continuation of this story to where it's here where he finds the glow ornament which is a representation of Bruce's reasoning and Brian crushes it because within Brian's reasoning little Bruce was always the monster he was a cancer inside of his mother and to Brian Bruce pushed away Rebecca from him and within Brian's reasoning he truly believes that Bruce did all of this intentionally and that Bruce knew what he was doing every step of the way which has always been Brian's reasoning, but it hits a little different in this issue and we're, we're gonna get to that. Because it's here while Brian is digging up Rebecca's grave to where he is then approached by a stranger. And when Brian sees him, he's like, God, and in response, the stranger's like, let's not pretend I'm him. Quite the reverse. But when the stranger gets here and he's telling Brian, like, not to make a mess of this grave and have a little more respect, and it's here where Brian tries to explain himself to the stranger and tell him that he was cleaning off some trash, and when he says trash, referring to the glow ornament, off of his wife's grave. But when Brian turns back around and looks at the grave, he sees a different type of trash sitting there instead. But then it's here where the stranger mentions that there was another guy who used to have this job, and this other guy had a story. And with the stranger saying, this the other guy that he's referring to is none other than Stan the Man Lee who back in flashback the Incredible Hulk issue minus one which was released in 1997 Peter David delivered the story which at the time gave us the details of how Brian Banner died and so what's interesting like with a stranger telling this story which within that issue started out with the Hulk who appeared in a cemetery to where back at that time Stan Lee was the stranger and with the way that Peter David presented this back at the time Stan Lee was waiting in the cemetery for the Hulk who had thought that himself meeting this stranger here was just a dream but at the time Stan was like nope this is a story and it's a true one all about you and with the Hulk thinking that Stan was going to sit here and tell him this story Stan was more or less like nope I got help and it was here we had like these theater actors play out a series of memories which Banner couldn't remember but for us the reader this was all new information filling in the pre-existing story and within this telling of the story which at this point is flashback incredible hulk issue minus one bruce knew that his father was getting released and he had been cleared from 15 years of medication and therapy to where bruce had got a call from his father saying that brian had been cleared by his doctors who believed at this point brian was capable of functioning in society but back in flashback incredible hulk issue minus one peter david had explained by way of stan lee the storyteller that the reason why the hulk didn't 
didn't remember any of this, that it was because the part of him that is Bruce Banner, that part of him suppressed these memories. But even with that being the case, all of this is true. And because of this, when the original storyteller, Stan Lee, he asked the Hulk, like, tell me how did your father Brian Banner die? And when the Hulk tries to answer, like, he doesn't have the full explanation, like, fully lined out. Because on one hand, he's like, well, I remember it was the anniversary of my mother's death, and there was something like some muggers, or I think he fell. And back then, Stan was like, no, every time you've made peace with Brian, he haunts you again. And it's here where Stan asked him, like, don't you wonder why? And it's here where we see in this retelling of the story, after Brian had called Bruce letting him know that he was being released, Brian had then after went to live with Bruce to where even this time Brian was still acting a bit crazy. And in this story, while Bruce has already started talking to Thunderbolt Ross about building his bomb, Thunderbolt Ross then drops by a week later, late at night to follow up with Bruce. And with doing so, Brian had a knife ready because he didn't know who was at the door. And this time around in this story, when General Ross leaves, he still gives similar remarks to Bruce about his father, who in Incredible Hulk issue 312, back then General Ross considered Brian Banner to be a hero, but in flashback issue minus one, General Ross only considered Brian Banner to be a murderer. But in either case, General Ross saw Bruce the same way, saying that the history of his father, or in this case the presence of his father, made Bruce spineless and much like a child, to where in the opinion of General Ross, Bruce needed to grow up and be a man. And when this happened and Thunderbolt Ross had left, an argument had then sparked between Bruce and Brian, with Bruce noticing that his father was acting a bit abnormal still. And because of that, Bruce was suggesting that his father voluntarily check himself back into the asylum so that Brian can work out whatever these things are that are eating at him, which then led Brian to snap, telling Bruce that the only reason he got better in the asylum was because he was away from Bruce. And it's from here where Bruce walks off just to get away from his father, Brian, who now has reverted back to the reasoning of his son being a monster and everything being Bruce's fault. And when Bruce leaves, he goes to his mother's grave because this, once again, is the anniversary of her death. But in this case, in the retelling of the story, when Brian finds Bruce here and he attacks Bruce much like we'd seen before, but this time when Brian attacks Bruce, he's doing it with the intention of killing him. And with doing this expressing that killing his son Bruce, it's being done for the sake of mankind. But then it was here in this moment, within Peter Davis' flashback issue, the rage and the anger boiled over in Bruce and he kicked Brian Banner over to Rebecca's headstone to where Brian Banner then landed on it in the worst way, killing him. And it's here where we jump back into Immortal Hulk issue 0 with this new stranger. He tells Brian about this story that he had heard a long time ago, which he had heard once upon a time from the original stranger. But it's here where he tells Brian, like, yeah, well, you know, from there somebody died and somebody was buried. But you know, we're all guilty of forgetting the details sometimes aren't we Dr. Banner? And it's here where Brian Banner sees that he's been dead this entire time. And when Brian sees this and he's like, I'm dead, the monster killed me, the new stranger's like, yep, and he sent you to hell. And when you try to fight back and get a little justice from your lowly position, he sent you lower still. And it's with hearing this that Brian asks this new stranger, like, who are you? And it's here where the stranger reveals himself to be Samuel Stearns, the leader. And it's here where the leader tells Brian Banner to take his hand, but with doing this, he tells Brian, oh no, wait, you already did, remember? And this is what takes us into this crazy time loop, which, like, a loop has no beginning really, but I'ma say it started in Immortal Hulk issue 39. And an argument could be made that it started before this, but let's, let's just start here. Because when the leader approached Brian Banner and he told him that he was intrigued about how Brian could influence others from the below place and possess Gamma Mutates, while also nudging other people around, which we saw later again with the Avengers. And to Brian's understanding, or his reasoning, the only conclusion that he had come to at this point was that he was being used by something else beyond his comprehension, which he had believed to just be the one below all. But then whoever this influence was, it wore him like a mask on a stage, which also was a point that sounds very familiar, but we're, we're gonna stay the course here. But with Brian mentioning this mask on a stage concept, he also understood that it couldn't just be the one below all, because the one below all is only desires and terrible desires at that but aside from these desires it doesn't have a mind of its own and with hearing this this is where the leader then told brian to take his hand so that the leader can then tap into this unique connection between brian and the one below all so that the leader could be the guide or the literal leader to the desires of the one below all but then also access what the leader had discovered after studying the green door that not only allowed you to enter and exit the below place but also like we had seen in immortal Hulk issue 25, it could also reach through time and even beyond time into different iterations of the cosmos.
cosmos. So with the leader asking Brian Banner to take his hand, he was acting on information that he had gathered from studying the green door and looking through it to where eventually he had taken the signs that he had gathered to harness the green door and pull in a tiding fly from 10 billion years into the future. But with doing this, the leader gained a lot of knowledge because this fly was just rich with information that showed the leader what was to come like way beyond all life in the universe. And when the leader did this, he also expressed like this was a discovery and a finding that Brian Banner could never do, and at least not without guidance. But more importantly, Brian Banner was never able to achieve this level of insight because he never had the tools at his disposal that the leaders had. So with the leader discovering these things and using the green door along with his occult science to either look through the green door, travel through the green door, or even reach through it, and it's here we then pursued Brian to take his unique connection to the one below all. But even with doing this, there was still an issue, and that issue we saw in Immortal Hulk issue 42 to where after Brian took the leader's hand and the leader devoured Brian, that there was something still missing within the circuit, which the leader then found out when Brian, air quotes, appeared to the leader and told him that the missing link was between himself and the one below all. And for the leader, after hearing that from Brian, with air quotes, the leader had then made that link and the cycle was complete. And with the cycle complete, the leader, he effectively is able to utilize not only the green door, but then also many of the abilities of the one below all, at least as far as he can comprehend. But then also because of this, when the leader closed the loop in issue 42, this had then started a butterfly effect to where when he took Brian's hand in issue 39, he was then also able to take Brian from his time of death years ago, making the below place his home home and keeping him from leaving there ever since. And with doing this, the younger version of the leader who was outside the loop and didn't understand, he would eventually find Brian here in the below place because the future version of the leader who had finally understood how to close the loop, he had trapped Brian here from the beginning only so that years later, after the leader had discovered what the below place was and figured out how to use the green door, that he would eventually find Brian Banner in the below place because that was the leader's intention all along. But also with Brian Banner taking the leader's hand, there's also this idea of the leader being a willing full intention throughout Brian's life, either from his father through to him or even from the moment that he was exposed to gamma radiation. And if it goes that deep, like if that's the case, then an argument could be made that it's been the leader nudging Brian all this time, amplifying his paranoia, which is what pushed Brian to do everything that we've seen him do up to this day. And my mind is officially blown. But then also like with Immortal Hulk issue zero closing, it's here where we then see Bruce's earlier visit to the blow place where he recognizes his father, who was actually being influenced by the leader this entire time all the way from bruce's earliest memories of the below place all right so we're getting into immortal hulk issue 48 it initially starts off with this montage of memories between bruce and betty and even with doing this going back and forth between like your hulk version of banner and your regular betty or even your hulked out betty and your hulked out banner which i feel like is something we've been going back to quite a bit like even with us going back and talking about immortal hulk issue zero which specifically went back to the incredible hulk issue 312 which also highlighted and revisited the moment where bruce and betty had just met but with us taking this trip back down memory lane, like it brings us to this point now to where you have Betty expressing her feelings to Joe Fixit, who's at the will of Banner's body currently. And with how this is done, like Joe picks up what she's doing pretty quick. And with seeing this, he's very quick to tell her like that he is not Bruce, which once again is one of those things that I beg to argue. And so does Betty in this moment. But clearly she has different motivations than me because I'm not trying to smash Hulk. But it's in this moment where she tells Joe or she more or less repeats her vows like in sickness and in health, which by the way, it includes multiple personality disorder. So even with Bruce's different personalities, like they all fall under that umbrella. But as far as Joe and like the way he feels about it like that's kind of the point because for everything that betty's expressing or feeling like those things are for bruce like the bruce banner bruce and in the case of her feeling anything for joe he feels like he's way further on down the line as far as bruce's go but on top of that like in this moment and even with betty changing from harpy back to regular betty she believes that bruce is still in there like in his body and he just doesn't want to come out but as we know like that's not exactly what's going on with bruce right now but while they're talking here, Betty goes even further to express how, like, even with Bruce dodging her, she also expresses, like, after she was killed and she came back, like, in her full red harpy form, 
that Bruce, he didn't like what he saw, while on the flip side, Joe, he always did. And it's here where Betty points out that that was the difference. And when she says this, like, Joe knows that he's not exactly a saint. And before he really goes into it, Betty tries to stop him, and she tells him, like, don't be Hulk, like, don't smash this up, as far as this moment and what we have. And right then, Joe's just kind of like, damn because he kind of knows that he already did. And it's here where Joe goes world breaker on the whole moment. And he tells Betty everything about how Bruce is not in him, but instead Bruce is still in the below place, being held captive by the leader. And even though the first time when it happened after the Devil Hulk died, Joe was too weak to do anything. But then when Joe went back and he was miraculously more powerful than ever, and in that moment, which was kind of like a second chance, Joe didn't even try, but instead he just saved himself. And when he tells her, all of this she goes off and she asks him like you left bruce in hell because of course that's all she heard like my man's pouring his heart out here like you you ain't catch none of the rest of that <laughs> but then over in the next room you got jennifer walters she hulk and jackie mcgee who can both hear betty and joe arguing in the next room clearly but even with that being the case, Jennifer figures that this is a better alternative than going with Gamma Flight, which is kind of where things kind of split up when the whole Gamma Flight team had walked away from Henry Gyrich and they decided to do their own thing, which is pretty much use their talents and resources to find different ways to help Gamma mutates. And in a nutshell, that's pretty much like the synopsis for the new Gamma Flight series. But of course, Jennifer and Jackie, they didn't go in that direction because I'm sure that Jennifer, she's going to go back with the Avengers at some point. And in the case of Jackie, she's still figuring out her new abilities with her recently becoming a Gamma Mutate and having the ability to see Gamma energy in its raw form. Which also kind of gives us this funny moment with Jackie looking at Jennifer like she has something on her face when really she's more so looking at the She-Hulk energy because she can see Gamma ghosts. But Jennifer also expresses that she feels like the Hulk is the real her anyway. But also while the two of them are out here talking, they more so lean into the conversation of like what's the next move for Jackie? Which is kind of the same as what it's been since the Herald had downsized to where for her instead of just getting demoted she had walked away. But since then, she's been following the plan of finding the story, which is something she gets into a bit deeper here, to where she mentions how she had lost so much, and because of that, she's hoping to gain something instead of just losing all the time. But then also, Jennifer tells Jackie, like, with asking her what's her plan, Jennifer then tells her, like, you know, when people make plans, God laughs, or so the saying goes. But when Gamma people make plans, God smashes. And when she flips in and says this, like, it kind of throws Jackie, because she's like, okay, like, so your advice is life sucks, wear a radiation suit. But with this coming from Jennifer, it's not so much advice, but rather it's just her expressing what she's come to learn with her being a hope for so long and going through so many changes and even some new discoveries. But from her perspective to kind of summarize it all, like in her life, Jennifer thought she had things under control, but the Hulk side of her like that side just knew better because the unexpected is bound to come around in some shape or form. But then while they're talking and Jennifer hands Jackie her phone because Jackie's phone wasn't charging, so she just needed it to write down some notes. And I guess kind of just email herself. But then also before Jennifer hands her phone to Jackie, she sends an encrypted message to Ben Grimm and with doing so really just giving him an update on the Hulk while letting him know that things are chill right now and she's figuring out like what's the next move but if she needs backup she'll reach out but then also when we see ben receive this message and we look like just over his shoulder he got the whole squad ready for something to pop off because at this point the avengers and the fantastic four they're working on their next move too but after this then going back to joe and betty and it's here where Joe lets Betty know that he just wanted to be honest with her. And like he could have lied and said like when he went to the below place, he just didn't remember what happened. But then again, as we know, the more often that they visit, then the clearer those memories are. And at this point, he's tired of lying and he just wanted to let her know that when this happened, he just reacted. Him and Savage Hulk got out, Banner was left behind, and what's done is done. But then when he tells her that he's sorry, there's nothing he can do, Betty tells him like, no, like you, you're not sorry. You don't know how to be sorry. But instead, he's just wearing sorry like it's a man ask to hide the true him who truly only really cares about himself and betty lets him know like this is one of those things about joe that she can usually overlook because joe's the one that makes her happy but this time and in this moment like that's not enough because this also is who joe is he's the selfish side of banner and he's the side of banner who hides just like when joe was hiding in las vegas and it's also here where betty feels like joe is more like bruce than ever because just before Joe had dropped this bomb on her, she was just talking about how Bruce was hiding from her. And when Joe hears this from Betty, he tells her that he's done. Like, he's just done with hiding. 
And at first when he says this, Betty's kind of like, wait, what? You trying to bust a move now? Like the block is still hot. We need to chill. And Joe was just like, no, first of all, I'm, I'm done with hiding from you. And initially Betty doesn't know like what he's talking about because there's nothing really that he can hide that she hasn't seen already. But it's here like when he gets more specific about what he means and he tells her how like when he was a kid and his dad used to beat the mess out of him and afterwards like his dad would just go to sleep and Bruce's mother just wasn't there. But at night he would stay up watching these black and white movies and in these movies he would always see the quote unquote grown up as a guy who could take the beating or someone who could just move along and handle the pain. But really and truly that was just a kid's idea of what a man is. Because also if somebody would rub him the wrong way, Joe would just beat them half to death and maybe enjoy it in the process. But for him that was also a child's way of thinking of what a man is supposed to be. But then it's here where Joe tells Betty that he just doesn't want to be like that anymore. And when Betty like she hears him out but she's also like okay where's this going. And it's here where Joe tells her straight up I love you. And he lets her know like he doesn't want to not say it anymore. Like he's sick of not saying it. And from there he even goes deeper into like the system of all the hulks and how they're all messed up like they're dumb they're angry and they don't know how to fix it and within all of them they have the like the why hulk hurt so much quote unquote thing going on but nobody knows the reason why or the answer to that question and it's here where joe tells betty like he wants to learn like he wants to be better and with saying this betty kind of hits him with the like well do you but with her saying that, she's once again referring to the things that Joe had done and not necessarily Bruce. But Joe takes it on the chin because he knows Betty's not going to hold back when she needs to say something. But then it's here when Joe starts talking about how since he's been able to come out in the day, like since we got the whole sunshine, Joe fix it. And since then, he's been thinking more about people and just more things in general. And he tells her that that feels good. But then also just because that feels good and he's having these good thoughts and having these good perspectives on different things like that then makes him wonder like if he's a good person now. And with saying this he turns around and asks Betty like if she thinks that he's a good person but then by the time he turns around Betty's gone. And like when this happens he goes in the next room and he tells She-Hulk and Jackie like Betty took off. And when this happens they barely react because Betty been taking off like this whole series. So really that's nothing new. But then also when Joe walks in the room and Jackie asks him like what's the move? What's the plan? And it's here where he tells her like ever since Shadow Base fell. Like ever since then he's been hiding and letting the world come after him and just reacting to everything that's been going on. And he tells Jackie right here like that ain't him no more. And it's here where he tells her that no one is a good person and that nobody is anything but what they've done and what they've got done. And with saying that, it's time to get things done. And it's here where he tells them it's time to go find Bruce, ready or not. And man, let me tell you, like when this happens, like this is deep, man. Like the entire process of Joe maturing and even making the choice to change. Like to me, that that alone is more powerful than any like physical power buff that you could give any character any day. Alright, so when we jump back in, we pick up off the heels of Joe Fixit, really just coming to this place to where he's grown tired of being the person he's always been. Which prior to this point, it's had its good and it's bad, but much like the usual case of self-reflection, what Joe notices for the most part is the bad. Because with Joe Fixit being the figure it out persona of Bruce Banner, for the longest time, Joe, he's only used that as being a muscle for hire and handling business for others, whether in Vegas or Majapur, or just outright for himself, if nothing else. But with doing so, he's exercised some very harsh or even grimy forms of execution. But after his recent talk with Betty, where he first tells her that he left Banner in the below place, but then he opens up and expresses that for some time now, he also feels like he's becoming a better person because of his growing optimism and his more positive perspective on different people and things. But she doesn't buy it because at the end of the day, you're not who you feel like you are or who you think you are, but instead it's what you do that defines your identity, not your feelings, or for that matter, even just the things you say but when this happened and betty had just left like it's here where we're shown how deeply this hit joe because in issue 48 when he told jennifer and jackie that he was going to get bruce like from then he hasn't uttered another word since and with that happening throughout the course of issue 49, it's from here where the narration of Jackie McGee, it takes over. And with the way that Al Ewing sets this up, man, it really feels like a slow motion montage with issue 49 that just ushers us into that final issue with us following Joe Fixit, but from the perspective of Jackie, who's watching all of this take place from a very epic firsthand perspective. But with her leaving with Joe and Jennifer, and in the case of Joe who hasn't said a word yet, it's here where we find Jackie thinking about the Fantastic Four 
Four. And with her thinking of the Fantastic Four, she more or less draws this comparison to their origin and the Hulk's origin to where in the case of the Fantastic Four, she very much describes it as a fairy tale. With the four of them jumping on a rocket into the unknown and when they came back changed, they were avatars of scientific progress, an example of courage against the odds, and a family unit who at its core, they were a reflection of how America would like to see itself. But as different as their journey was heading above, the Hulk's journey draws a stark contrast heading below. Because this scientist wasn't seeking exploration, he built a bomb. And this scientist, unlike your fairy tale scientist, quote unquote, this scientist was someone who would not only later keep secrets from his wife, but he's also someone who, prior to the Gamma incident, who had killed his own father. And it's like when you hear it just one to one and stripped down without all the details, your second scientist very much fits the description of a monster. But then it's here where we see Joe, Jackie, and Jennifer making their way over to the Fantastic Four, to whom at this time their building is going under some reconstruction, which has more or less been the situation for quite some time. And more recently, we've also gotten the update within the King and Black tie-in. But with the three of them heading here, this was a suggestion that was made by Jennifer, since like we'd seen, she'd been in contact with Ben Grimm, letting him know the updates on the immortal hulk to where at this point she filled in ben about joe wanting to save bruce from another dimension and in response ben told jennifer that he may have a way to help and after hearing ben's response jennifer told joe he just nodded and from there the three of them just made their way but with them heading here and making their way inside like for one this is one of our first looks at the newly constructed interior that jackie describes as built back better than new and she kind of just goes on to say like that's kind of what superheroes do like when their headquarters is destroyed or just completely smashed by the bad guys they just build back a better one but with seeing this and hearing this i can't help but think that this building is also a metaphor for what we're seeing with the hulk collectively with his identities being broken down and built back up again so to speak like i really sense that underlining vibe here could be a thing could not who knows because also in a way you can make a similar case for the story or the journey of jackie as well but also as to make their way in jackie she describes the new design almost like the new building as a church and the three of them are making their way in to pray for the aid that they're in hope to receive from the people of this sanctuary if you will and I'm paraphrasing of course, but the comparison is super deep because also when Jackie just describes the expressions of Jennifer coming back here, she says that Jennifer is kind of hard to read, like she can't tell if she's relieved or sad, but if I had to make a guess, Jennifer, she feels like a backslider right now. <laughs> like she ain't been to church in weeks and she wants to go back, but she knows she left on some bad terms. And with the way that Jackie describes Joe, he's like that person that walks into a church and everybody looks at him and judges him like he's not supposed to be here. And it's a really accurate comparison because when Joe gets here, the Avengers is staring him down and they're very much judging him off of his past. While at the same time, these are your superheroes. But also I want to point out like with this happening, we're still seeing very much the same effect of the anger flowing out of Joe and it influencing the heroes. So it's not like they're completely just feeling this rage or this urge to combat him completely of themselves. But the funny thing is like when Joe walks in, he still says nothing. But when he walks in, he just looks at him and smirks. And as soon as he does that, everybody in the room just goes off. One speaking over the other. And of course, Steve Rogers trying to calm them down. But as Jackie would describe it, with everyone trying to make their point at the same time and Thor trying to make a speech. But with all this chaos, nobody's words are coming through clear or even being heard over the other person. But as a result of Joe just smiling through the whole thing, this soon after then escalated into an all out brawl again. And it happened so quick that Jackie, she doesn't even know who threw the first punch. All she knows that Jennifer jumped in front of her to protect her, while at the same time, Jennifer is trying to tell everyone here to calm down because they're putting Jackie in danger. But once again, no one's being heard in this fight or this brawl, it just continues. And from Jackie's perspective, she thinks of the Hulk's fight as something that never really ended. And like, sure, it may have its downtimes, but in a lot of ways, it's something that's always continued. And maybe that'll change and maybe it won't. But as his story has gone so far, it's always been there. Even going back to before the Gamma Bomb on the night of the anniversary of Bruce's mother's death when Bruce murdered his father, which is also a story that was brilliantly revisited in Mortal Hulk issue zero to where it recapped Brian Banner getting Bruce to lie about his mother's death in court. But eventually, the the truth came out and Brian was arrested only to then plead insanity to where instead of going to prison he was treated and then released into Bruce's care almost like Brian had gotten away with murder 
But then on the flip side, after Brian's death at Rebecca's grave, you then have the case to where all the evidence clearly pointed at Bruce with the additional footprints in the mud matching Bruce's shoe size, as well as a plastic star that was found at the scene, which could also be found in a number of Bruce's baby pictures. But all of this evidence was overlooked by the Dayton police who knew both Rebecca and her brother-in-law, Sheriff Morris Walters which then practically allowed Bruce to get away with murder. But Jackie goes on to describe that sometimes it works out like this and sometimes it just doesn't work out at all because sometimes factors will step in and the fight will play into Bruce's favor and other times the fight is just completely unfair. But in either case, these are the fights that the Hulk, that he's been enduring his whole life. And with thinking of this and fast forwarding to now to where Jackie sees all the Avengers blasting and hammering the Hulk with everything they got to where all you can hear is flesh tearing and bones breaking but then also reforming as quickly as they're coming apart but it's here when Jackie describes that even with all this happening that he never fell because there's something in him that just wouldn't let him give in and she even goes on to say like even if they did successfully tear him apart that he still wouldn't quit because there's a part of him that just knows like if he did quit like if he did lie down in defeat he would never get up again and when Jackie sees that part of him not only does she recognize it from how she's come to know him recently but also she identifies with it in a way because she can also see glimmers of herself within that idea and she also believes that this is a similar case with the Avengers that they look at him and see their self as well but instead they're seeing the part that they don't like but then all of a sudden like in the middle of this calamity an invisible force field then forms around Joe and all the yelling and the blasting and the hammering they eventually simmer down as the doors open behind Jennifer and Jackie and it's the Fantastic Four and I gotta say I just love the way that this is being delivered by Al Ewing and Joe Bennett because the idea of superheroes working together as a team and that team functioning as a family regardless of whatever they faced that started with the Fantastic Four and ever since the early 60s they've led by example of what heroes as an individual or as a team should be even in the darkest hour and even with saying that I do want to put out there that they're not perfect because these guys have had some unperfect moments which we've talked about on this channel and I'm not going to go too deep into them here so we don't digress too far from the topic because I'm also sure that somebody's in the comments just ready to air out a lot of those moments <laughs> like I can see it now someone in the comments gonna be like I am him I am digression and after that they just type a paragraph starting with Sue Storm and after that probably read but that's fine with me guys go for it I'm here for all that but also I like how this is done here because when Jackie sees the Fantastic Four she admits that she'd never seen them in person and with her truly meeting them here for the first time she describes how Reed's body makes these alien noises whenever he stretches and how Johnny's face was unrecognizable like it was just hidden in the flames but with the way that they come out here and with the way that they respond to the Hulk it's almost like that mirror effect had gotten to them too but in their case they reached out to him with compassion and Jackie even expresses like even out of the four of them Ben appeared to be the most human with the way that he reached out his hand to the Hulk asking him like did they hurt you pal which then caused this sad expression on the Hulk's face but still he said nothing and he didn't take Ben's hand but then he just quietly walked off with Ben and the rest of the team as they made their way through the building and eventually to the Forever Gate. And so now with the Forever Gate, it was initially built by Reed's daughter, Valeria Richards, who had constructed it using technology from the Kree Omniwave Projector and the Griever at the end of all things, as well as the Kokoan Gateways. And when she figured out how to power it by flying it through the heart of the Zero Force, it then reconfigured to channel its own energy, becoming a dimensional doorway to every point in space and time. And when they get here, Reed, he's trying to explain everything to them about how it works and how it's potential potentially gonna help but as he explains it he struggles to put it in layman's terms and when this happens Ben just shakes his head and he's like look it's simple the gate is gonna scan the Hulk in every cell in his body to where then it's gonna use what it found to find where he needs to go and with doing this it might not land him like directly in front of the leader like right at his doorstep but it'll at least land him in the leader's backyard to where in that case it may be a better scenario because that way he will have a drop on him giving Joe the element of surprise but with Ben saying this and breaking it down and just making it make sense, Joe was still quiet and all you can really hear in that room was just the machine's hum. But Jackie then goes on to explain with him staring into the gate and the gate staring back with it analyzing the data and searching through possibilities and with this happening images started to appear within the gate flowing through the crackling of red plasma. And within one of these images Jackie saw a version an almost like a fairy tale version of a happy Bruce with his loving wife, a gruff ex-military man and a carefree teenager and when this happens like she sees Joe looking at 
the possibility of what things could have been had the events in his life gone slightly different. And really like with seeing this, I need Al Ewing and Joe Bennett to go ahead and just get on the Immortal Hulk what if story where Bruce Banner starts the Fantastic Four because technically it's pretty much canon now. Because with the Forever Gate pulling this up as is analyzing the Hulk, that means that somewhere out there in some alternate timeline, this reality actually exists. And I'm just curious of how it went. But after a moment of Joe just staring through this gate in the room being in silence, but then suddenly from the gate there was this terrifying yawn that sounded like it was straight from hell. And immediately they knew this was something else, it was something like fear. And it was here where Ben reached out to Joe and he let him know that the Fantastic Four that they'll back him up when they could, but the gate as it is in this moment is just for him. And with seeing this Jackie, she acknowledges like this is like the defining moment with the red plasma boiling in front of them, with Bruce waiting on the other side, as well as the leader. And with Jackie like even coming here, like we know it's been much about her chasing the story, or at least that's how it began back in Arizona. But with where it's taken her since then till now, with it destroying her life and then becoming it, it had then just become a series of questions that she just couldn't walk away from. And it's because of that when Joe goes through the gate, Jackie just leaps in with him, making a split second decision that she very much describes almost in the same words of the fairy tale that she expressed earlier when she had mentioned the origin of the Fantastic Four, when she described them as the fairy tale of those who had broken the rules to journey into the unknown as she stepped through seeking the answers that she just couldn't live without. And when she steps through, she initially describes the feeling like she's riding on a rocket, but also she's well aware that this isn't a fairy tale that heads above, but instead they're clearly heading below. But also with it ending here and it looking like Savage Hulk and Joe Fixit are being separated again, it now has me extra curious about the future for Joe Fixit, Savage Hulk, Jackie McGee, and Bruce Banner, and if this experience will also bring some unique connection between the four. Alright, so initially how this starts off, we begin in Ohio in 1901, and with how this starts off, you have this reverend by the name of Robert, who's walking through this blizzard in order to meet with a brother by the name of Samuel. And with this happening, one of the things I want you to keep in mind, and like just kind of put a pin in for right now, is the whole idea of Robert being a man of God, and that's going to be important, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. But with Robert coming here through this blizzard, which he practically could have died in, and because of that, Samuel points this out, because in the case of Samuel, who's more of a man of science rather than faith, which is important, we'll get to it. But Samuel tells him like, how did you know like the good Lord just didn't plan for you to freeze on the way here? But for Robert, two things got him here. And the first thing is with him being a man of faith, he lets Samuel know that God didn't allow him to freeze out there or get frostbite because he's standing here before him. But secondly, Robert, he's also in a heated temper, which is something that he hints to Samuel, but Robert really doesn't go into it for the time being. But after this, when they head into Samuel's study, when they walk in, one of the first things that Robert notices is this weird looking skull over in the corner. But initially, Samuel tells him that it was a gift from a paleontologist who had dug it up in the Ottoman region and he tried to sell the idea that it was a new type of dinosaur. But that didn't work out because everyone just called it fake because the bones weren't fossilized. But right away, just with seeing this, we know that this is the skull of Tammuz, the Hulk from 9500 BCE that we'd seen in the Immortal Hulk, Time of Monsters. But what we end up seeing with these brothers is that Samuel had discovered gamma rays, which I believe in real life were actually discovered in the year 1900. So with this happening in 1901, it's crazy accurate. And that's kind of creepy. But with Samuel showing this to Robert, he tells him this is going to be great for like our great grandchildren and generations to come. And this is also something that Samuel specifically mentions because he knows that Robert's wife is soon going to have a child. But then after this, we then pick up from the conclusion of what we'd seen happen with Savage Hulk, Joe Fixit, and Jackie McGee who we had seen before in the Baxter building with the Fantastic Four to where at the time they'd used the Forever Gate in order for Joe Fixit to find the below place and save Banner. But much like we'd seen, Jackie McGee had jumped in at the last minute, which at the time then caused her to go along for the ride. But also as a result from this crazy ride, it had also ended up re-separating Savage Hulk and Joe Fixit. But while they're all down here and making their way to go save Banner, you then kind of also have this moment to where Jackie senses like a bit of deja vu, which is also important. But when Joe Fixit more or less tells her like, of course, like you've been here before prior to the Devil Hulk waking up Joe Fixit to do his thing. And really what this focuses on is like Jackie seeing part of this concept to where she's thinking back like did he know? As if somehow he knew that the Banner system needed one of the Hulks to be powered with something else besides gamma radiation. And to be more specific, the opposite of gamma radiation, which is cosmic rays, which not too long ago had made Joe Fixit the cosmic ray Hulk just in time when the Banner system needed him. And Joe tells her like he didn't think of that, but it makes a lot of sense. But with Jackie saying this, 
this Joe just tells her like no wonder you're a reporter but then also with her bringing this up there's then the speculation of if the devil Hulk was really seeing the details or if he really was connecting the dots and following them or was he just following a hunch because for the devil Hulk that's just something that he does but even still with this speculation there's still the lingering question of where this help actually came from and with them sharing these ideas they bring up the concept of Bruce being separate when both Joe Fixit and Savage Hulk were sharing Bruce's body and even though the leader executed that as far as taking Bruce away from them that was something that Brian Banner always wanted and with everything that they've seen the leader do so far that all of that came to a point to where it's hard to tell if the leader had gained more control of this place or if this place gained more control of him almost like what we'd seen with Brian Banner to where in his case we saw him make the rules but even with doing so he could not leave the below place and it's like every time they're about to put their finger on who or what it is there's still some random factor that pulls the rug out from underneath that idea or that theory but as they make their way back to the leader they find out that the whole setup is just built different and when they arrive at what now has become a fortress and they make their way to one of the doors Joe he tries to punch the door down but nothing really happens but also at this time back at the Baxter building you had the Fantastic Four and they're still in front of the Forever Gate and while they're here Reed explains that he can't really just build a door going to the below place because the coordinates are almost like an infinite distance in every direction and like we'd seen before the only way that Reed was really able to make this happen last time is because the Hulk was there and with the way that the Forever Gate is set up he looked into the gate the gate looked back into him and this is what allowed the Hulk to make his way to what seemed to be a moving target but even with this being the case we do get to see Walter Langowski who at this point is still in the body of Doc Samson making his way over to the Fantastic Four but then after seeing this it's here where we jump back over to the two brothers from 1901 and with us going back and forth we get to learn more about these guys because in the case of Samuel who discovered this gamma ray technology he mentions that he wants to name it the Stearns Ray after the family and it heavily teases that this Samuel Stearns is the great grandfather of the Samuel Stearns we know as the leader but while they're here and Samuel's about to give Reverend Robert a demonstration of these gamma rays and Samuel even tells him that they're a lot like x-rays like you could use it to see right through a man and when he says this Robert is then like oh really and he tells Samuel that his wife Beatrice sends her warmest regards but also along with saying this Reverend Robert tells Samuel that he knows that Samuel slept with his wife his own brother and with saying this Samuel tries to explain himself with saying how he was lonely because his wife Anne and his son Philip were in Oklahoma but Reverend Robert wasn't trying to hear that knocking him upside the head with his cane tossing them all around the lab to where eventually Reverend Robert then picks up the radium and he then stuffs it down the throat of Samuel Stearns effectively killing him showing no mercy at all and just stuffing radium down his brother's throat with the strong hand but then it's after this where we then go back over to the below place with Joe Fixit not being able to knock this door down and it's not so much a thing of strength but instead it's more of the idea of the right Hulk opening the door so Savage Hulk's like let me try and with hearing that Joe is just like yeah whatever go ahead but then while Savage Hulk is just punching away at this door in the background which is kind of hilarious but while he's doing this Joe fix it he's talking to Jackie and he's telling her about the last time that him and Savage Hulk were here and the leader was talking about he's gonna turn them into just mindless husks and how he's gonna use them to make himself stronger spread out rage and spread destruction so on and so forth but also with him saying this he then realizes like after that him and Savage Hulk had broken out of here there would be times where he was just standing in a room or even just walking out of a bar and he would still leak out rage somehow without physically being tied into this loop but then in the case of Savage Hulk punching at this door he then eventually sees the face of the leader which allows him to punch through but even with seeing this happening like keep in mind from what we had seen before in the case of the leader with him seeking more power and absorbing Brian Banner like when Savage Hulk punches his way in here and they see Brian Banner that both him and the leader they've become like two in the same and for anybody kind of just hopping in it's gonna sound confusing for a bit and it may still sound confusing at the end but I'll, I'll try to clear it up and I'm gonna save that whole thing for the end after we get like the crazy reveal and all that but as soon as they make their way inside the door behind them closes up and the entire interior of the structure it's set up like a labyrinth and the people they see here roaming throughout this labyrinth you see a number of people who the Hulk has known who have died and amongst them the first one that catches his eye is Jarella to whom at one point this was his wife and if you guys remember like way back when we were doing like Avengers Endgame theories when at the time I think we were just calling them Avengers 4 theories because we didn't know the title yet but I did a video on this back at the time mainly because aside from the Savage Hulk meeting jor at this time this was also a moment where he went into the microverse and he underwent a three-way brain bath as he would call it <laughs> which at the time under the sound of Shazam it gave us this merged version of the Savage Hulk who was able to speak and communicate with the intelligence of Bruce Banner 
But with her eventually dying and the Savage Hulk seeing her here, we quickly get one of those cases to where like it's clear that she's very important to the Savage Hulk. And when he sees her, he then tries to follow her up to the top in hopes that he can somehow save her or bring her back. But while he's going after her, it's then here where he's stopped by Samuel Stearns, who was actually the one from 1901, and he tries to warn Savage Hulk and stop him, but he just tears this dude to pieces and goes after Jarella. But then also while this is happening, you then have the case of Joe Fixit, to where for him, he sees Mike Berenghetti, who for Joe Fixit, Mike Berenghetti was the casino boss who had taken him under his wing, and he's actually the person who gave Joe Fixit the name Joe Fixit. And I think at one point in time, we may have talked about Mike Berenghetti, like maybe back when we talked about Magipur, and we got into a number of examples of Joe Fixit making his way over there and a bit of his background in Las Vegas. But the only thing you really gotta know or keep in mind for this is really just the idea of Mike being like a father figure for Joe. And he was like the first person that Joe Fixit had felt like actually cared. But also with Joe seeing Mike here, it kind of gives him a bit of a conflict because at one point Mike had sent Joe away and it was during that time that Mike was killed because Mike had a number of enemies and it's almost like they were waiting for Joe to leave in order to get their opportunity, which led to Mike's death in Las Vegas. But even with Joe saying this and also seeing Savage Hulk follow Jarella to the top of the labyrinth and against Joe's better judgment, he does the same and follows Mike. And as soon as Joe and Jackie make their way up there, they find Savage Hulk, who at this point is a tongue puppet, and he's strung up alongside with Banner. But also when they get here, like the one below all, he then just forms his head out of one of the eyes of the leader, which pretty much just looks like a gamma xenomorph with a goatee. And he tells Joe fix it like with them coming here they've completed the gamma circuit which before we had saw the leader trying to do and it's here with the one below all uses savage hulk like a puppet in order to attack and beat the mess out of joe but with jackie seeing this she can't like physically just jump in and help joe and joe lets her know like if she was able to hulk out she would have done it at this point but with this knowing that jackie does have the gamma ability only manifested through her eyes with her following the hulk for so long and her recently being exposed to her own version of the gamma incident but what ends up happening here is that she ends up getting her turn as far as meeting someone from her past and in her case is her father and when he approaches her the first thing that he tells her is to just look there's a plan and with him telling this to Jackie he's more so telling her that there's been a plan for her life and everything that's happened with her along the way that is for a reason because if you guys remember in her case it's a pretty crazy connection as well because back when she was a little girl the Hulk had destroyed her home which is eventually what killed her father after they lost everything and he had to work so hard for so long until eventually his heart gave out and when she thinks back to like her last moments with her father when he was alive and him telling her how proud he was of her with her getting her journalism scholarship and it's here where Jackie realizes that she had just lost herself within just being scared and just reacting and she realizes that she's an investigative reporter and her power is to look into things and when this happens she looks into the leader <laughs> like Krypton had his chance or like the Eternals trailer you know same energy but actually this time with Jackie like we see something that we haven't seen before because this time her look actually cuts through the head of the leader which then allows Savage Hulk to get free and as soon as Savage Hulk is free Joe Fixit is like hey just grab these stringy things let's see if we can pull his brains inside out but when they pull Samuel Stearns falls out the leader and when he does Joe Fixit tells Jackie like to just take a look at him just to make sure so they know that this isn't like a trick or anything and she looks through him but there's no gamma energy and all he is is just his physical body in human form without the gamma enhancements of being the leader but unfortunately his mind is just packed from everything that he had seen and learned from the one below all and it has him at this point begging and pleading like he doesn't want to know about the one below all he doesn't want to know that he's coming and he doesn't want to know that he's here and it's here where they find out when they broke in the shell of the leader and dragged out Samuel Stearns from the top of this fortress slash labyrinth this had then broken the gamma loop and right after they're confronted by the one below all and when this happens mind you samuel stearns is on the ground saying like i don't want to know nothing but savage hulk he's like no i want to know everything and this is where we really get into it here because right away when savage hulk just goes off and he tells the one below all i want to know why why am I broken inside? Why am I always in pain? Why am I always afraid? He wants to know why he always hurts his friends. Why do people in general always have to suffer for him? And why does he have to be Hulk? And when this happens, like, okay, so when the one below all answers Savage Hulk, initially it just looks like the same old thing. With him saying, I howl through many mouths, I break with many hands, they are themselves, but they are also me. And as it goes on, it's like the same kind of speech that the one below all he always gives, which also is a speech that got longer throughout the series. But when he says this, it actually makes more sense now than ever before. And I'm gonna come back and clear that up because right here in this moment, Joe Fixit just cuts him off because even with saying this, it's not like a direct answer to what Savage Hulk is asking. And it's here where Joe Fixit, 
smart brilliant joe fix it he tells the one below oh i don't want to know who because i already know exactly who you are and i know whose hulk you are and joe fix it puts his finger up and he's like show me your real face so i can look you in the eye and the one below all is just like very well and i'm gonna tell you right now like when i saw this yellow light i was just like boy ain't no way boy boy ain't no way because it's here with the one below all reveals himself to be the one above all and it's with seeing this that it's here where the mind origami just keeps taking steps further because with the one above all revealing himself joe is then just like okay now answer the question <laughs> like he's so cool here like me i'd have been like savage hulk <laughs> like wait a minute but then it's here where we start to get the explanation to where the one above all he tells them the answer to their why and with his way of answering things like kind of short and cryptic he just says because you are my child you are my creation you are necessary and he lets them know like to every weight there's also a counterweight where were you when i laid these foundations declare if you have understanding and though these words are really few <laughs> the full explanation is a mouthful but we finna go in because even while joe is ripping banner free at this moment what the one above all is telling them is that when he laid the foundations he created the one below all as like a destructive balance to his power and to go further this is what created the balance between your cosmic energy of creation and your gamma energy of destruction and what this means with the one below all is that everything that we saw the one below all do everything we saw him do which to be more specific this is also everything that we saw the leader do and the same for brian banner as well as everyone else connected to bruce throughout the course of time and this is why i really hope that you've read at this point or at least seen the video on immortal hulk issue zero because when we saw how the leader had figured out how to travel through time using the below place and how he had quantum leaped into different bodies throughout time in order to cause pain and to cause death and all kind of destruction throughout brian banner's life that on the surface though that was the leader but then taking it a step deeper than that this is exactly what the one below all meant every time he said they are themselves but they are also me i howl through many mouths i break with many hands i poison your mind and kill all love in you because the one below all was the puppet master of every tragedy and every action we'd seen leading up to this point <laughs> but it goes a couple steps deeper here <laughs> like this is nuts because even with going back to 1901 with the stearns brothers like after this revelation we then get a bit more context because after robert stearns had made it home within that freezing blizzard which he made it through because he's a man of god air quotes but even these events were influenced by the one below all whose destructive nature was truly the bidding of the one above all and as he would describe all of this is necessary for creation to have balance because they go hand in hand and with the one below all being the destroyer he was just understanding the assignment but when we go back to 1901 and we see robert stearns make his way back to his home he kicks out his pregnant wife because she had an affair with his brother and he denies her from keeping his last name stearns forcing her to go back to her maiden name which is banner man and robert says she belonged to the streets cold world literally but this is eventually what leads to her naming her child robert banner because she swears to robert stearns that this is his child but going from here, the child that she's carrying, Robert Banner, is going to be the grandfather of Bruce Banner and the direct father of Brian Banner. And to close off this section of the story, like with the flashbacks in 1901, Robert Stearns is like, the Lord has made me the strongest there is, and he just slams his green door in her face. So once again, everything we've seen from the beginning up until now, it's been done by the one below all, who really was just following the assignment of the one above all. But when we go back to Joe, Savage, Hulk, and Jackie, they still don't fully understand the interpretation of all this. And it's here where it then focuses on why the Hulk is who he is, with Joe telling the one above all, tell me why there's a Hulk. And it's here where the one above all answers that question, but he also asks them in return, like, no, I ask you, what is the Hulk? What have you become? Because as he explains to them what the Hulk is, he also leaves a bit of choice as well. And it's here with the one below all, where he explains the concept in like its most, the, the most simplest way way of saying it but it's here where he tells them with these hands i build and with others i break and with saying this he tells them how the breaking is needed in order for him to build anew which again is the reason for your weight and your counterweight but then after this he then goes for the question and he asks have you my strength have you an arm like mine would you build or would you break 
because with the Hulk being the creation of the one above all, he has designed the Hulk to be his counterweight, which means as infinite as the one above all can create, the Hulk can tap into the opposite and destroy. And with the one above all asking like what will you become, to where he tells them the left hand is for strength, and it's here where Savage Hulk takes a minute before he puts it together, but when he sees Samuel Stearns, he realizes that he has a choice to make whether he's going to leave this guy here or take him along with them, and Savage Hulk chooses to forgive Samuel Stearns, and with doing this he extends his right hand, and along with his choice, the one above all then tells him that the right hand is mercy. Which in itself, as far as the choice thing, it's kind of been like an ongoing underlining theme throughout this issue. And if you go back, you'll also notice it between Robert and Samuel, and also Robert and Beatrice Banner. But then from here, going back over to Joe Fixit, Savage Hulk, and Jackie, who at this point have Banner and Samuel Stearns, and it's here while they're walking and Jackie, she asks Joe about Savage Hulk's decision. And she's kind of like, well, why does Sam Stearns get forgiveness? And Joe's more or less like, hey, that's the green guy's decision. And he's like, me personally, I don't forgive that easy. And then he kind of stops himself and he thinks about Jackie like, man, like this whole system of Hulk's thing, like this is taking a lot from Jackie. And because of that, he knows that just saying sorry isn't enough because sorry is just a word and it's what you do that defines who you are, which is something we talked about in the previous video with Joe Fixit being heavy on the dues, which is a big part of him becoming a different person. And it's because of this that he tells Jackie that whatever she wants or needs from him, anytime, any place, any favor, forever, find Banner, say the word, and he'll come running. But then while they're down here just strolling along in the below place, the forever gate just opens and it's Ben Grimm along with Walter Langowski. And it's here we see that Reed Richards had used Walter Langowski to look into the forever gate in order to find everyone and bring them back home. And with everyone going back, Bruce, Joe, and Savage Hulk, they all merged back together, and Reed Richards lent the suit to Banner, which was made from unstable molecules, which Reed manipulated so the suit would fit Banner, but also changed to the color he wanted. But then we also have Jackie here, and in the case of Stearns, like as soon as Samuel Stearns got there, they put him in cuffs. And at least from what it appears to be right now, Samuel Stearns is a bit out of it. And with them seeing this, they kind of want to believe it because for Jackie, she doesn't remember some things either. But also with Stearns leaving there, like in just almost out of his mind on the way out, like it causes me to think like there's some truth in him acting the way that he is. Like there's a good chance that he's actually lost his mind a little bit. <laughs> Norman Osborn 2.0 coming up. But yeah, from here, as far as Banner, he's whole again, all Hulks included. So aside from Joe Fixit and Savage Hulk, Devil Hulk and the others, they're all still in the Banner system. And though we still don't know for sure, like with Joe Fixit going cosmic, like if that was part of the intentional bigger plan, like the bigger picture, or if it was just Devil Hulk making sure that they had a Cosmic Hulk on their side, but nonetheless, Banner now has a Cosmic Hulk, and there's no telling where that's gonna go in the future. But then in the case of Banner also, you have like this situation to where he doesn't remember what happened in the below place, but he feels complete, he feels confident, and he kinda has this hunch going forward that all the different Hulks within his system, that they've settled their differences, and also moving forward, Banner's going with a Joe Fixit idea as far as being a good person because of the things that he does and I'm excited to see what that is. Because with this conclusion, even though we've gotten a lot of answers, there's still quite a few things that are up in the air, and most of those were questions that were created in the finale. But nonetheless, man, like, I enjoyed this series. Like, I can't wait to get the Immortal Hulk in trade paperback and like, just put it in a glass case. Because this story was a journey. And so now real quick, I wanna give a special shout out to all the patrons. Thank you guys for all your support. And for anyone who's new here who wants more information on how to support the channel, I got a link below so you can go to patreon.com slash dope spill. But that'll do it for this one, guys. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below, and we'll do it again in the next one. All right, later.